hand seat right beside Rick Husband. William Willie McCool, Navy commander, born September of 1961, came from San Diego, uh, reported to NASA in 96. This was his uh, first flight. Uh, a man who uh, was familiar with uh, carrier landings, worked uh, out of Whidbey Island, and uh, flying the EA-6B Prowler, which you might be familiar with, also on the Space Shuttle Columbia. David Brown, captain of the United States Navy, out of uh, Arlington, Virginia, pilot himself, although he wasn't uh, sitting in the front seats of the controls of the shuttle. He's a mission specialist, 2,700 hours in high-performance military aircraft. His first flight as well. Kaplanachala, born in uh, Kamaro, India, uh, is uh, an astronaut with uh, some experience uh, in 1996, STS-87, U.S. microgravity payload, scientific mission. She operated the robotic arm on that particular mission. PhD, and um, for fun, she used to fly um, aerobatic uh, airplanes, tailwheel aerobatic airplanes. That was her passion in addition to space flight. There's the, the crew, and I was commenting about the suits that they're wearing there, those orange suits, those so-called pumpkin suits, launch and re-entry suits, they call them. Uh, those suits were not worn um, in the years immediately after the first few missions up to Challenger. Uh, the crew went up in, in essentially a, a flight suit, just a jumpsuit, not a pressure suit. They wore helmets, but they didn't have the, the pressure suit. One of the reforms that came out of the Challenger accident was that these suits would be worn by the crew members uh, as they rose to space and as they came back home. The idea being that if there was some sort of rapid decompression, loss of cabin atmosphere inside the flight deck and the mid deck, that the crew could survive. Um, but as we pointed out not too long ago, um, as, as we pointed out not too long ago, this is not a situation where the crew would even have the option of bailing out. That altitude, that speed, it's not a goal. Let's listen to James Hartsfield one more time. Houston. ...through space shuttle contingency procedures designed to secure all information, notes, and data pertinent to today's descent by the Space Shuttle Columbia. Communications were lost with the Space Shuttle Columbia at approximately 8 a.m. Central Time as Columbia was above North Central Texas at an altitude of 200,000 feet, traveling approximately 12,500 miles per hour. Search and rescue forces in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and in other portions along Columbia's planned route have been alerted to the Space Shuttle Program contingency. Any debris that may be All right, we're going to bring James Hartsfield down because it's a bit repetitive. If you've been watching, you know what he's going to say, which is don't touch any debris that you might see if you happen to be in that part of the world. Stay away from it. It could hurt you, could potentially kill you, and it's against the law to touch it, so don't do it. Uh, let's go now to uh, Jerusalem and Kelly Wallace. Uh, Kelly, um, Ilan Ramon, in many ways the pride of Israel. Miles, exactly, the pride of Israel, and so as you might imagine, tremendous sadness, shock, and emotion throughout the country right now. A colleague of mine was talking to a top representative at Israel's spy, uh, sp excuse me, space agency, and his quote is, we are in shock. We know that Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, we are told, was watching events unfold on television like most of us were. His spokesman saying the Prime Minister watching those events. No formal official reaction, though, coming from the Israeli government until there is a formal announcement from NASA and from the American government. But we can tell you that when Colonel Ilan Ramon took off on the space shuttle, there was tremendous excitement in Israel. It was front page news on the Israeli news papers on the Israeli television stations really a lot of joy as you know miles a lot of sadness in this country there has been tremendous violence over the past few months lots of concern about that there were the elections just a few days ago not a lot of excitement about that but this was looked at as tremendous joy and pride 
Colonel Ramon, we know, is married, has four children. His father, in fact, we understand, was watching some of the events on television at an Israeli television station a short time ago. We believe he has since left and headed to his home. Colonel Ramon has tremendous experience, more than 3,000 flight hours. Also, he took part in a mission back in 1981, a mission destroying the nuclear reactor in Iraq. He also took part in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So tremendous pride in Colonel Ramon. And right now, people are just still, Miles, holding out hope that this will turn out, but right now, tremendous sadness throughout Israel. Uh, it's hard to uh, imagine uh, the depth of sadness as we just sort of absorb all of this, Kelly, and, and it, um, it, it's difficult to even assess it uh, here, but there, I think, um, in a very profound way, a lot of hopes and dreams were flying with Ilan Ramon. Exactly. The representative from the space agency, again, talking to my colleague a short time ago, saying really everything is lost. All the work, all the experimentation, a lot of dreams, as you said. And again, the symbol, really, this being the first Israeli astronaut in space and also coming in the context of a very difficult time. This has been more than two years of violence in this country, the start of the second Palestinian intifada against Israel. The economy is dismal right right now. Lots of concern about the violence, the state of the situation, the future. And again, Miles, just looking at the media attention, looking at television and newspaper coverage of this, it was really looked at by many as one piece of really good news in a, in a sea of a lot of bad news over the mm. past few months, Miles. It's, it's, it's stunningly uh, tragic. Uh, uh, please, Kelly, stay close. Let us know what you hear from the government, what you, what you hear on the streets. Um, of course, we're all harking back to the last time this happened. 17 years ago this past week, we marked the anniversary of the space shuttle Challenger uh, and its explosion, a uh, little more than a minute after liftoff from the Kennedy Space Center. Seven member crew died there. We marked that anniversary this past week. Tom Mentier, CNN correspondent, was live on the air uh, at that moment, has covered numerous shuttle missions over the years. Tom, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts uh, go to the families of the seven astronauts uh, aboard Columbia, the family, the friends, the loved ones, uh, immediately first. Uh, as you're well aware, the most two dangerous times are ascent and descent. And uh, I asked them if we had the animation of uh, not only uh, the ascent but the descent uh, when, when, when at maximum pressure and maximum velocity the shuttle uh, turns red hot underneath as it, as it re-enters the atmosphere. And uh, what you're seeing now in these pictures, uh, the heat is just absolutely tremendous. Uh, and what, as you pointed out, the, the multiple targets, uh, by seeing uh, different pieces, uh, it, it is something we, of course, have, have seen before, but uh, not in the same dynamics that we saw this morning. But uh, very, very difficult to watch, uh, not once, but a second time for me. Yeah. Uh, take us back to that day and, and what that was like and, and what happened in the immediate aftermath. Well, in the investigation, uh, I was there for uh, the, the search for the debris, uh, which I'm sure there were, would have been larger pieces because they weren't as high up in the atmosphere as they were on this one. Uh, but uh, the investigation is going to center around this debris field that you talk about being across a very wide area of West Texas. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the pieces that they find uh, will not be very large. Uh, the initial descriptions that we've been hearing from West Texas are, are very small pieces of debris. Uh, but it's, uh, it's going to be a very slow, long investigation uh, that uh, takes a look at the airframe. As you mentioned, the, these airframes are certified for 100 missions. And, of course, Columbia, nowhere near that. Uh, yeah. uh, but, again, certification and what occurs in flight or after flight, as we found out with Challenger, are not necessarily what's written in the books. Well, it's worth pointing out to our viewers, and I know, Tom, you are well aware of this. Uh, Twenty plus years after Columbia first flew, the first shuttle to fly, this is still an experimental vehicle, an experimental program. This is not an airliner, is it? No, it's not. And uh, every, every time uh, these astronauts uh, strap themselves in for a mission, they realize the dangers that, that they are about to face. They train for it uh, for months, if not years, uh, before they fly, while they're flying, and while they're returning. They know what the dangers are that, that they're facing in this program. They do. They do understand it. Um, 
If uh, Tom, if you could stay close, we may want to uh, check in with you in just a moment. Um, I uh, think probably this might be a good time to hear from some of the crew members. We, of course, interviewed them before they left and um, got a sense of their excitement for their mission, uh, their, uh, their zest for their job. Uh, a lot of them would tell you it really wasn't a job. Uh, let's listen to Michael Anderson. Well, uh, unfortunately, this mission is so packed with, with scientific experiments and everything. As, as a matter of fact, when we return, we'll be the heaviest space shuttle ever to land. So there's not a lot of room to take anything uh, personal or special with you on this flight. So basically, I'm just going to take my notebook with my notes and uh, a couple extra pens and pencils. All right, Michael Anderson. Um, we spoke to all the crew before they left. And uh, as they always do, we, we asked them about the risks. Uh, we asked them about their philosophy on the risk, and to a person they say, um, it's all worth it. Uh, let's listen to Rick Husband, the commander. The shuttle is a great vehicle. It, it is so impressive every time I sit down and study the different systems to see how well thought out this vehicle is and how well it works every time we go and fly. The fleet actually is probably only reached about a quarter of its design life. So on our particular flight this will be the 28th flight of Columbia and each of the airframes was designed for a hundred flights. So there's still a lot of life left in the shuttle fleet and it is I would say a tribute to the people who work on the the shuttle in the inspections that they do and being able to find some very minor flaws like what we're talking about here because they do a fantastic job in, in doing the inspections and finding these things. And it's just like if you were, it's just kind of like normal upkeep and maintenance like you would have on your car except that this is a much larger system. And, and so it, it is a very impressive and certainly by myself very much appreciated that the people are so diligent and do such a great job in keeping track of all those things. Kind of hard to hear all those words right at this moment, uh, but those words are, are all still well true. Uh, what was not added is that this is stuff that is still on the edge of the envelope, that term that test pilots use, pushing the envelope, the edge of our capabilities as human beings is manifested in what you see right here in this, in this space shuttle, uh, even 20 plus years after it first flew. Uh, but I should point out something that was mentioned a while ago, and I didn't get a chance to mention it, that, that the concept that a space shuttle is old is a bit of a fallacy. Um, they are certified, as we said, for 100 flights. Columbia is on, on our 28th mission. Uh, every fourth or fifth mission, they go through a, a, an overhaul, which is really almost right down to the, the spars and aluminum, uh, where they truly make uh, the, the shuttle new. In, in the case of Columbia, it had, for example, a brand new glass cockpit installed as part of its last overhaul. So it is, uh, to call it old is, is a bit of a myth. These are the, the most pampered aircraft or spacecraft, whatever you want to call it, in the world. And they're treated as such. Um, and uh, to, when they say 100 missions on that airframe, that's conservative even on its own. Uh, so at 28 missions, Columbia was, in fact, sure, the, uh, the old gray lady having first flown in April we're looking at, also, you obviously can see here, this is Challenger, it's the only model I have handy, but uh, the, the old gray lady in the sense chronologically, but at 28 missions, Discovery still has a, a few others, has actually flown more missions. So it's not uh, accurate to draw an assumption here about that necessarily. Now let's listen one, uh, to one more member of the crew. Uh, and, and this is the, the, the member of the crew who received so much of the attention prior to liftoff because we were so concerned about security uh, given what's going on in the world and given the fact that he was a citizen of Israel, Ilan Ramon. Let's listen in. I really feel that uh, we shouldn't talk too much about it. You know that uh, NASA security people, and I know that NASA security people are doing their best for us. And since uh, September 11, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a kind of a world issue here. And uh, since then, all the shuttle uh, flights are taken care of by uh, NASA security. 
for the best of all of us. And I don't feel that uh, we are uh, any special uh, event for them. Well, the truth of the matter was, it was a special event. It was treated as such because of exactly who we loan Ramon is. Let's listen to James Hartsfield one more time. Houston, a public affairs officer with NASA. He's giving another update. Search and rescue teams in Dallas-Fort Worth and in portions of East Texas and other appropriate areas along Columbia's planned route have been alerted and are in contact with local law enforcement authorities in those areas. Any debris that is located in an area that may be related to the space shuttle's contingency should be avoided and may be hazardous as a result of toxic propellants used aboard the shuttle. The location of any possible debris should immediately be reported to local authorities who are in contact with NASA search teams. All right, let's, once again, that's, that is a uh, bit of a repeat, but uh, for those of you who've been listening, we are, we're sorry for the re repetition. We just don't know when he's going to add additional information, and so we're going to listen in and keep you posted as events uh, unfold here. Let's bring uh, everybody up to the date. We're approaching the top of the hour. It's 11 o'clock now, and the shuttle is approaching. We're approaching the point when uh, about two hours ago, almost exactly, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia should have been pretty much on final approach to uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida at the conclusion of a 16-day science mission. Instead, uh, communication was lost. Telemetry, which is the radio signals with all the data, all the stuff that fills those computer screens in mission control was lost. And uh, the shuttle did not turn up at its appointed time, 9.16 a.m. Eastern Time at the Kennedy Space Center. Space shuttles, when they begin their descent, their landing is, you can set your watch to it. And so when that happened, immediately alarm bells went up. Should tell you that NASA has lowered flags uh, near the countdown clock at Kennedy Space Center to half staff. NASA has lowered flags to half staff at the countdown clock. Seven person crew, and what you're seeing are pictures captured. Actually, you're seeing a live picture right now. Uh, of mission control in Houston, but uh, the picture that we've been showing you um, all morning long is uh, the final moments of the space shuttle Columbia as it broke up mid-flight, 200,000 feet, traveling 12,500 miles an hour. Our affiliate WFAA capturing this dramatic videotape which gives us a sense of what caused, uh, well, we don't know the cause, but we do know it was a breakup. The cause all right, let's listen. We have, uh, we have been trying to get our affiliates to capture the shuttle as it came across the continental United States this morning. KOAT out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, a little darker there, of course, when it came across, but I think you can see that dot there. Try to help you out and just tell you it's right in that spot right there in case you're having problems. Uh, not quite the, um, the shot uh, that we got, obviously, out of... Um, the uh, Dallas affiliate, but bear in mind, the breakup occurred over Texas. This is New Mexico, so these would have been, uh, this is exactly what you would expect to see uh, as a space shuttle would streak across the uh, night sky on its way to its uh, landing. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Um, all right, as we look at that shot, and um, we uh, will tell you that the president was at Camp David when it happened. He's on his way back, should be there about noontime, and that's where Suzanne Malveau is. Suzanne, what do you have for us? Well, earlier today I spoke with White House spokesman Scott McClellan, who said yes, the president was notified of the situation by his chief of staff, Andy Card. They made the decision that it would be better to monitor the situation here from the White House. As you mentioned, the president is on his way back to the White House. He'll be here shortly after noon. I uh, also spoke with a senior administration official who said that there was no indication that the shuttle had any type of threat that was uh, against it or that was in any type of range of uh, anti-aircraft, uh, anti-missile uh, range. And that uh, there was no indication that this was uh, any type of uh, terrorist situation. Of course, they're still getting lots of information, but uh, initial indications from senior administration officials saying that it does not point in that direction. I should also tell you as well that sources tell us that the president, uh, when he comes back, is expected to make a statement, some sort of briefing, uh, that he is also expected to call Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, as you had mentioned before, one of those on the shuttle, an Israeli citizen, that the president is all likelihood to call him later this afternoon and that we will hear from Mr. Bush when he returns. Miles. CNN, Suzanne Malvo, we'll obviously uh, the minute the president gets back and makes a statement, we'll be getting back to you, so stay close, please. Um, 
Let's go to uh, Elizabeth Cohen. Elizabeth Cohen in the newsroom here has had an opportunity to speak with um, members of uh, one of the uh, crew members' family. Uh, and we're just going to leave it at that right now. Elizabeth, uh, what can you tell us? Miles, I was speaking on the phone just a few moments ago with the brother of one of the astronauts. I'm not going to name the astronaut just to, to protect the privacy of this family. But he said that in the past two hours since the contact was lost, the families have been speaking with each other. The families of the different astronauts have been speaking with each other. They met each other at the launch. There were various activities for the family members. I am sure that they did not expect to get back in contact with one another quite in this way. This, this gentleman was saying that he expects to be summoned to a memorial service, perhaps in Houston, um, sponsored, uh, given by NASA. He expects to get that phone call soon. And um, again, the families turning to each other for support in this difficult time. Miles? Did they indicate there is a, uh, a fairly um, rigorous protocol, if you will, that NASA employs, where they have people assigned to each family member? Um, to assist them through all this. Did you get any sense that that was occurring and were they getting the support they need? The, the man who I was speaking to is a brother of one of the astronauts. He said he had had no contact from NASA. Now perhaps the, the astronaut's spouse had had contact or parents or somebody else. Perhaps this, this person hadn't, but others had. Um, he did indicate though that he expected and that the families expected that they would be summoned back in. Elizabeth Cohen, uh, thank you very much. Let us know if you um find anything else out uh, as we continue um, our coverage here. Thank you. Uh, let's take a look at a live picture which um, tells probably as much as this shot we've been showing you, Kennedy Space Center, that's in front of a place they call the Turn Basin, um, right beside the countdown clock. In the distance, launch pad 39A where the Space Shuttle Columbia launched uh, 16 days ago. It was a beautiful uh, afternoon launch, the flag at half-staff, in memory of the seven-person crew of Columbia. And um, that launch pad, uh, hard to say when that launch pad might be used again. Uh, very premature to even discuss anything along those lines, but there you see it, there you see the flag, and uh, that in many ways sums up uh, what we are talking about here. CNN's Andrea Koppel um, has been talking to um, Israeli officials, and, and we should point out that, um, in case you're just tuning in, that Ilan Ramon was a member of this crew, the first Israeli astronaut. Uh, Andrea, uh, what have you heard? Well, Miles, uh, I've spoken with the spokesman from the Israeli embassy here in Washington, and they, he tells me that they have dispatched a small team uh, down to uh, the Kennedy Space Center where Colonel Ramon's wife, uh, his four children, and we believe his parents, who were quite elderly, uh, were awaiting his arrival. Uh, the embassy itself uh, obviously had no comment. They're waiting uh, for uh, for the government in uh, in Jerusalem to take the lead there, uh, but having said that, you know, just looking at this picture, uh, Colonel Ramon was was so much more than than just a professional, and uh, as you pointed out, the first Israeli to go into space, but he really was somewhat of a, you know, a national hero, the quintessential hero, if you will, for Israel. This is a man that flew. Uh, the, uh, in Yom, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. He fought in the uh, 1982 war with Lebanon. He was also, believe it or not, uh, one of the pilots that bombed uh, the Iraqi nuclear reactor uh, back in 1981. Uh, he is a payload specialist who's been training for this mission since 1997. And in fact, his job on board the space shuttle was supposed to be uh, basically using cameras on board to look at how desert dust and other contaminants that you would find in the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, how that's affected by rainfall and uh, temperature. So this was a mission that uh, the entire Israeli public was, uh, was watching and uh, really had their, their heart in their hands. And uh, at this moment, you can imagine how many hearts across uh, Israel and uh, certainly in this country as well are breaking right now. Miles. Andrea Koppel, thank you very much. Uh,
certainly that is the case uh, everywhere right now as we pause to think about those family members. Let's take a look at a picture. We've been getting some email uh, images in from our viewers, and uh, this is the first picture we've seen from Nacogdoches County, uh, Texas. And I've been calling it Central Texas. I'm told by some people it's more accurate to call it East Texas, but it's safe to say that there's a big, wide swath of area that has been uh, seen. What you're about to see as I scroll down here, which is uh, a piece of debris on the ground there. If uh, we put it through the telestrator, I can highlight it for you. Um, hang on, I over, over scrolled there hopefully get it up for, uh, to the point where we've got it to, uh, in a place where you can see it. Um, there you see it right there on the pavement. It looks like it's right near an apartment building. Uh, what I want to reiterate is what NASA has been saying all morning long, which is don't touch it. Don't go near it. Call the authorities. Let them know it's there. Try to keep people from touching it if you can. Uh, it's apt to contain all kinds of hazardous things. Hydrazine is just on the top of my list right off, right off the bat, which is a very nasty substance which is used to fire the, the rockets on orbit and also powers the auxiliary power units. Uh, nitrogen tetroxide, which can burn you. That's an oxidizer which mixes, creates that, that, those thruster firings on orbit. Don't go near it. It can hurt you. It's also, uh, I should point out, against the law. Um, we've been Listening in to members of the crew, I'm hopeful that we have some more of those interviews ready to go. We, we talked to the crew. Okay, apparently we do not have them quite ready. We're going to try to. All right, we have some, a reporter from where? All right, we've got somebody at the Kennedy Space Center to um, check in with us. Grayson Carl. Grayson, I don't know, what's, you're with uh, Central Florida 13. That's right, Miles. Grayson, Central, what, yes. Tell us what's been going on there. With Central Florida News 13, I cover the Kennedy Space Center in this area. Um, it's a very, very surreal feeling out here. Uh, you know, we've done this uh, several times before. You stand up, you get ready for the landing. We all look down south, and we look, and we look, and, and nothing came. And we're used to hearing a, a pair of sonic booms that come in a few minutes before the landing as the, the shuttle drops back through the sound barrier. And we didn't hear that, and it kind of raised everyone's eyebrows. And then everyone started looking, and the countdown clock that counts down to the landing time started counting back up, which is what it does when after it passes the landing time, and it started hitting six and even seven minutes, and, uh, and none of us knew quite how to handle it. Um, the uh, family and the visitors and the guests that were all there, I'm not sure if the astronauts' families were out there, they typically are, uh, but all the guests, all the VIPs were ushered into NASA buses and escorted away from the shuttle landing strip. Uh, we were escorted away shortly after that. We've headed back to the press site here, which is by the Vehicle Assembly Building in the center of the Kennedy Space Center. and. Really, they're not telling us much more than, than what you guys, I'm sure, have been finding out there in Atlanta and all over. Um, they are scheduling some sort of press conference here for apparently 1130. We're going to try and find out more from them at, at that time. But really, this whole community is just uh, devastated. This whole area is tied to the Kennedy Space Center. We call this area the Space Coast. Uh, we grew up here. Uh, there's not a person here who doesn't know somebody who works at the Kennedy Space Center. I'm sure a lot of folks all over can identify with you know, an Air Force base or something else nearby where it's like that. And that's what it's like here with the Kennedy Space Center. And, um, and it's just, the, the silence here is eerie. Uh, you know, I look at the other reporters I work with every day, we don't know what to say to each other. Uh, it's a very bizarre feeling. Uh, there's been talk about, uh, about what caused this failure, and I guess the latest we've gotten is from, from Johnson Space Center. They said something about uh, losing a piece of insulation off the external tank into the heat shield. And, and Miles, as you know, that can, uh, the heat shield is a very unpredictable part of the shuttle, but we really don't know if that's what's caused it. We're waiting until 1130 to try and find out that information. But the, uh, the community here is really, I mean, just devastated. Uh, not only were their experiments on board Columbia. There's also some part of the ground-based experiments that were actually being done out of Florida Tech, uh, the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, which is just uh, 30 miles down the road. They were doing some of the ground-based things with the European Space Agency, doing the same experiments they were doing up in space down here on Earth at almost the same time. Um, so there are, there are connections to this mission all through uh, this area, the Central Florida area, people commute to uh, the Kennedy Space Center, which is over on the coast. They commute from as far away as Orlando or even further away, and uh, and so there are people in neighborhoods all across Central Florida that you know the, the fellow down the street or or, the, or the, their friend's mom works out here at the Kennedy Space Center, and, and they just don't know how to handle it. Uh, it's very eerily quiet out here. Uh, press officers have been driving back and forth in cars trying to gather information for us now, but uh, but Miles, really, we're just kind of in a state of, of absolute disbelief. We we know what's supposed to happen, and we knew things were wrong, and, uh, and just our worst fears have been confirmed.
Grayson, you know, we, I think uh, many of us got the sense, um, even those of us who uh, are close to the space program, that the landing was just not as uh, big a concern. And, um, you know, what we have to recall here is the tremendous heat which a shuttle encounters. And I wonder if in the control room they can get that shot of the launch uh, queued up. Because we can talk about what Grayson made um, just a tangential reference to, which was on ascent during the launch, uh, there was a piece of debris, which was noted by engineers, which fell off the external tank. Now, if we could roll that tape, uh, it's very difficult to make out here, and I'm not sure that I've identified the precise moment, but if you let it roll, uh, and this was something that was well known to engineers because the first thing they do after an, uh, a launch is pour over some camera views that you can hardly imagine. Close-ups, high-speed photography, which gives them a sense of all kinds of things. And they can find out a lot of things about what happened on Ascent and perhaps plan accordingly uh, for re-entry. Now, the concern is that as you look at the uh, shuttle's external tank there, it is covered with foam. The reason it's covered with foam is it contains liquid hydrogen. It's like minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit or something along those lines. The coldest substance on the planet. Ice foam has been noted to fall off. And at those speeds, at those speeds, uh, the ice or foam, which, um, which could fall off the, the external tank, which is this kind of uh, brownish color, at those speeds could damage some of these tiles. Uh, the, the shuttle is covered in these ceramic tiles which are very fragile, about 20,000 of them on the Columbia alone, along with blankets and carbon carbon and all kinds of things to protect what is an aluminum uh, frame as it comes in for re-entry. Aluminum would be soup if it wasn't protected by the thermal system. But it's a very fragile system and it remains the most labor-intensive aspect of keeping the shuttles aloft and keeping them flying. Now, Grayson, I the conversations I had with engineers there was we've looked at this debris falling off, we focused on where it landed, and we don't think it's a big deal. Did you hear the same things? Uh, that's the, the same thing I've heard. You know, these flight engineers do this for a living. They do it every day. They find problems, and they have to make that analysis on whether it's safe and, and, and what the conditions are, whether they need to make repairs, what can happen. But the All right, we just lost our signal, unfortunately, from Grayson. And uh, with that, we're, we're going to turn back to uh, Jerry Leninger. Uh, Jerry, are you at home? Jerry? Yes, I am. Okay, Jerry in northern Michigan at home, who uh, veteran of the shuttle, veteran of Mir. Uh, Jerry, have you, it's been a little while since we talked. I'm curious if anything else has come to mind for you uh, on what uh, might have happened here, what sorts, of, and, and I don't want to get way ahead of this, but I mean, let's, let's give the areas of interest that would be some of the prime suspects in this. I, I think you've been covering them well, Miles. I think, uh, you know, it's very dynamic, obviously, a lot of friction, a lot of pressure buildup when you're streaking through the atmosphere. Uh, friction is what slows you down. You're inside a big fireball, plasma collapsing around you, so its airframe is, is the first thing I would worry about, um, you know, metal fatigue, things of that nature. I think what you mentioned, uh, you know, if there's a defect in the uh, insulation, a tile, uh, at a critical point, um, you know, if it hits a, for example, a control mechanism and you lose control of the vehicle, uh, the top of the vehicle, for example, cannot withstand the type of heat that you take during reentry. So, uh, you know, all the things you're pointing toward uh, are things that you have to be concerned about. Yeah. I'll Let, tell you, it's a heck of a crew on board as you go through the people. and um, Let's talk about them a bit. Well, um, just, you know, skilled, dedicated, courageous people. Yeah. And uh, I guess the other thing, the people on the ground, you know, uh, besides not touching it for their own safety, uh, I'm sure everybody wants to, uh, in Texas and around the world, wants to make sure we figure out what causes it so it never happens again. So. Yeah. What, Jerry, um, y you've been inside the space program and know exactly what happens and how NASA prepares for these to, to aid and assist the families. What is happening right now to help these families out? There's usually a family escort and that's many times a, uh, an astronaut that goes along with the family, especially during the launch time. And at landing, uh, it sort of depends on the, uh, the family's request and how comfortable they feel. If it's maybe the guy's third or fourth flight, um, the family feels comfortable in, in knowing what to do. Uh, but on first flights, a lot of times they'll provide an escort to be with family. If they're going to be there at landing, I'm sure there's uh, people there to kind of 
tell them what happens during landing and to ease their concerns. And, and now, of course, they're there to try to comfort them. And uh, it's probably a, a challenge which, uh, uh, well, it's got to be an incredibly difficult time for them and for these families to try to sort through all of this. Jerry, this is something that um, astronauts certainly know about, but I wouldn't say they fear it. I don't think they fear it. You know, we have confidence. Uh, you heard Rick Husband, the commander, talking before he left. He's got confidence in the vehicle. Got confidence in all the great people that um, make that vehicle go to space. And, uh, you know, it's obviously a tragedy of uh, great, uh, you know, depth here. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people feeling very badly. I'm sure everybody in the world feels badly. What does this do? to uh, uh, the program, Jerry. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing, you, you flashed up there, there's a cosmonaut and two astronauts on board uh, space station. So you've got a space station up there orbiting that depends upon the shuttle. Uh, you have other means. You can use a Soyuz capsule, the Russian capsule, to get there. But, um, you know, I think exploration and discovery and, and going out there and pushing the envelope, and that's what the astronauts do every day of their lives up there in space. Um, Terry, you mentioned an important point. We have a, a crew up there, Don Pettit, Ken Bowersox, Russian cosmonaut, whose name is escaping me this moment, and I apologize for that. Um, Buderin, I believe. And it is, uh, they, at this point, are, are sort of not stranded. They have a Soyuz capsule there, which they can take to leave any time. Uh, and, and I guess we should point that out to our viewers. Are you there, Jerry? Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on, and uh, we'll think about that point a little bit later. United Space Alliance is the prime contractor for the space shuttle. It's a synthesis of a couple of big uh, aerospace companies, Boeing and uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, USA is the prime contractor, which does... Uh, the work in getting a space shuttle to orbit and bringing it back and turning it around. Um, a lot of people don't realize that most of the employees at NASA work for contractors and the NASA civilian force is actually a small part of it. The real work is done in many respects by the United Space Alliance. With us on the line now is Jeff Carr, spokesperson for USA. Uh, Jeff, are you in Florida? Uh, no, Miles. I'm in Houston near Mission Control. What can you tell us from your perspective? What have you seen? What have you heard? And do you have any sense of uh, where things are headed right now? Well, Miles, as frustrating as it may be to your viewers, we, we really don't know what happened. Um, you've done a great job so far, I think, of laying out the sequence of events. And I was listening to your interview with Jerry Leninger, and I thought he brought some very uh, uh, level perspective to it. But right now, we're working closely with NASA to go back and review all of the data, look for anything that might be a telltale sign of what occurred. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our first indication that anything was wrong with what looked like a picture-perfect reentry this morning came with that loss of communications. And uh, until we do determine what happened, our primary concern is with, uh, of course, the safety and well-being of the crew. And until, uh, until we know what happened, that's going to continue to be our primary concern. Jeff, um, once again, I, and I, 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 bear with me here because I don't want to get too far down the road of speculation, but I do want to address this issue because it's out there. This is the piece of debris which uh, fell off on ascent while it was rising to uh, orbit. Uh, what can you tell us about what we know about that? As, I, as I've been telling our viewers, um, the sense I got from talking to people at NASA is that they discounted uh, whether it, well, they basically said it wasn't a big deal. Well, I would take exception with their dis counting it, Miles, I think what happened is uh, a lot of very smart people took a, a, using good technology took a good look at the uh, image imagery that was available and, and analyzed that image and basically uh, determined that it was could we not get that, conclusive. Me, Jeff, let me, let me uh, interrupt you while, while you <clears throat> say that. I, let's get that image up if we could, that ascent image, the, the, the launch image where we see, I believe if you look closely, you can see some debris falling off. Go ahead, Jeff. What, did, what was the determination as they looked at it very closely there? Well, it basically, Miles, it was a non-determination. There wasn't any indication, any immediate indication, that there was uh, any damage uh, uh, of note. And I think it's really, at this point, much, much too early to begin speculating that there's any linkage between that event and uh, what has occurred this morning. We don't know what the cause is, and it, 
just wouldn't be productive to speculate at this point. No, that, and I don't want to do that, and I don't want you to ha have the sense that that's where I'm headed with this. It's just that this is something that people are aware of, and I wanted to at least get a sense from you as to where it stood and what the feeling was. I mean, the, the shuttle, um, in the course of its 113 mission history, has lost tiles before. That's true, but at this point, we don't even know that there were tiles lost or to what extent they were lost, Miles. And it, it's uh, this is one of many, many stones that's going to be uh, uh, overturned. We're going to be looking at every scrap of uh, information and evidence that could help us understand uh, what happened today. That, that activity is going to uh, be ongoing for days, uh, weeks, maybe months. I don't know. But right now, our primary concern is to determine uh, as best we can uh, what happened and to determine the uh, safety and well-being of the crew. And, Miles, before we go too much farther, uh, I, I really want to say that uh, those of us at United Space Alliance, uh, our hearts go out to the families of the crew members. Uh, their families are our families. We're a very close-knit community, and uh, we want them to know that they're in our thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Um and that's worth thinking for a moment about. Um, tell me this, Jeff. Um, can you walk me through reentry and give me just a sense of what the vehicle encounters from the moment it does that deorbit burn all the way down to landing at the Kennedy Space Center? Well, of course, Miles, the two most um, intense periods of, um, of time during a shuttle mission are the uh, launch and ascent and the entry and landing. Uh, the launch and ascent lasts eight and a half minutes. Uh, the process of reentry an hour. Uh, from the time the uh, uh, orbital maneuvering uh, system engines burn to deorbit the vehicle, um, there's a, a great deal of energy stored in the vehicle as a result of all the energy it's gained during ascent and, and that it, it uh, uh, possesses uh, during the orbit phase. That energy has got to be depleted and uh, the vehicle basically uh, breaks through the atmosphere by flying wide S-turns and sort of skipping against the atmosphere. Uh, it's a brute force operation uh, with a little finesse to manage the loads on the vehicle and the, and the temperatures on the vehicles. And uh, uh, you know, we've never had in the history of the program an issue uh, such as this during entry and landing, but uh, we all know that this is uh, one of the... Uh, one of the most dynamic phases of any mission. And the temperatures that a shuttle endures through all this, in excess of 2,000 degrees, correct? Fahrenheit. I believe that's right. And um, so clearly uh, the heat shield is something that is very important and, and has to be considered. Is there anything else you can tell us about? The term is telemetry. That's basically all those radio signals that uh, feed all those uh, computer screens in Houston. Is there anything in that telemetry that anybody has seen it showed any sorts of hiccups on any other systems that, that would give anybody any preliminary indications as to what might have been going wrong. Miles, I was not in the control center this morning, so I can't tell you absolutely that nothing was noticed, but at present uh, there's nothing that's leading us to any conclusions. Uh, there are two ways to determine uh, the status of the vehicle uh, during entry and landing, particularly over the continental United States. One of those is the telemetry that's sent from the vehicle to the ground, and the other is uh, ground-based C-band radar tracking information, and uh, unfortunately, uh, w we found ourselves in Houston without uh, any indications um, either way. Jeff Carr, United Space Alliance spokesperson, joining us from Houston. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we'd like to get back to you um, w whenever you feel it's uh, important. And Miles, uh, there is one important yes, note please. I might add. Go ahead. Uh, and I very much appreciate uh, your efforts to let folks in East Texas know that uh, any debris that they might encounter out there could be hazardous. There are toxic chemicals aboard the vehicle at that phase of reentry, and uh, as curious as they may be, uh, it's important to their safety uh, to report any debris that they might encounter to the local authorities and stay away from it. Words to the wise. Please, uh, if you're in earshot and you're in that part of the world, we implore you to listen to that because uh, that would just compound the tragedy that we're seeing unfold today. Jeff Carr, uh, we'll check in with you in just a bit. Uh, quick recap for you at the bottom of the hour. It's 11.30 uh, Eastern now, uh, two hours and 15 minutes ago. We should have seen the shuttle Columbia touch down gracefully for a landing at the 15,000 foot runway at the Kennedy Space Center. 
Instead, on its 28th flight, the 113th mission in shuttle history, the Space Shuttle Columbia, broke up mid-flight over Central and East Texas at an altitude of 200,000 miles plus, in excess, in excess of six times the speed of sound. The pictures that we've been showing you are, uh, dramatically tell the tale from our affiliate WFAA as it broke into numerous large pieces. Those are those bright points followed by distinct trails behind them, sort of like multiple comets or meteorites uh, traveling faster than a, speed of bullet, a speeding bullet at that point. The crew of seven was uh, finishing up a 16-day science mission, which went off pretty much without a hitch. And right now, search and rescue teams are fanning out all across Texas, searching for debris. And um, as a matter of fact, we have a piece of debris which one of our viewers sent to us from uh, one of the counties there. You'll see it right in the middle. If you see something like this, folks, please don't touch it. Please don't touch it. Just leave it there and try to keep others from touching it. Call the authorities. Uh, it's going to be a big debris field over a huge, huge area, multiple pieces, huge area. And um, in, in the interest of uh, your own personal safety, uh, you are uh, implored to, to leave it be. Um, we have with us uh, Suzanne Malveaux, who's at the White House. The president is en route back to the White House. We're expecting, by the way, a news conference from NASA, Kennedy Space Center. Um, and we hope to get that soon. But in the meantime, Suzanne, can you tell us, uh, you've had a chance to talk to some people inside the, uh, the White House who've had access to the Situation Room and what's going on. What can you tell us? Well, I can tell you a senior administration official assures us, and he says, I'm quoting here, there is no reason to believe, no indication that this is terrorism, uh, that they are fully investigating the matter, but a senior administration official reassuring the American people, saying there is no indication that this is terrorism. We did speak with Scott McClelland. He is a White House spokesman. Uh, he gave us a TikTok, the details of how this unfolded before the president, that he was notified by Chief of Staff Andy Card immediately after NASA lost contact with the shuttle. Also, Dr. Condi Rice was notified, as well as Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of State Colin Powell, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, as well as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Myers. We are told that the President did speak with uh, NASA's Director O'Keefe at 10.30 this morning, that they will continue to remain in contact, but they have had an initial conversation about what is taking place. The decision was made that it would be best that the President return here to the White House to continue to monitor situations. They say that they are still gathering information at this time. Uh, we have also learned as well as that Governor Ridge, who is now uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, that he has made a number of calls, that he has reached out uh, to calling the, uh, the governor of Texas, uh, Governor Perry, also calling uh, officials from Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Louisiana, uh, that all regarding possible falling debris, that he wanted to make sure uh, to touch base with all of them, to let them know of the dangerous situation, as you know, we've been hearing from NASA officials all morning on that. Uh, we have also been told that the White House has been in contact with Israeli officials, not the president, not on that level, but certainly U.S. officials in contact with Israeli officials regarding that uh, the one person who was on the shuttle, an Israeli citizen. All of this unfolding, the president, of course, taking this very seriously, very concerned about it. We are expecting him to arrive back at the White House shortly, uh, where, yes, he will be conferring with his chief of staff, Andy Carr, Dr. To Rice, among others, to monitor this situation, and uh, they are they're very concerned, and they say that yes, this is unfolding, uh, but everybody is fully aware of all of the information as it comes in. And again, a senior administration official emphasizing this morning, and I'm quoting here: there is no reason to believe that there is any indication that this is terrorism. Miles, Sus Suzanne Malvo, that's uh, worth underscoring. We got to remember um, the altitude and speed at which the shuttle was traveling at the time of the breakup: 200,000 feet six times the speed of sound. Um, it's pretty hard to conjure up a, a terrorist um, or any sort of way of reaching it if terrorism is um, your thought. But we do have to address that issue in this day and age, so we do. Uh, let's take a quick look at the map. And this is, uh, I've been calling it Central Texas. It's really East Central Texas. As you take a look at the map, this is the area of Palestine, Nagadoshis, St. Augustine. These are the areas where we've been hearing about debris. Now, as the shuttle came in across this way, uh, traveling fast, traveling high, that debris field is had to be just staggeringly huge. So um, 
and it's also uh, likely that there's an awful lot of small pieces. So uh, we're going to underscore that point one more time. If you see something, don't touch it. Um, Ed Lavendera is right near a piece of debris. He's in um, Corsicana, Texas, which isn't too far from Dallas. Ed, what are you seeing? Well, Miles, we are driving along Interstate 45, headed southbound uh, out of Dallas uh, toward the Palestine and Nac Nacogdoches area. And we have come across the, the first location where we've seen what appears to be some sort of uh, uh, piece of debris that has been smoldering for some time now in, in a wide open field, uh, brown dirt all, all over the place. Uh, and we, we see a group of people, we're about, the, the people in this, in this, uh, this uh, debris is about 300, 400 yards away from the interstate, so it's hard to really make out what exactly is going on over there, but uh, clearly people walking through this field, and this isn't a field that you would, that you would walk through by any means, uh, protecting that area. A lot of uh, interest uh, onlookers from the interstate stopping to see what was going on. And, Miles, you mentioned just how huge this area is. Uh, we've been listening to radio reports throughout the morning as we've been driving, and there are reports coming in from all over East Texas, from Marshall, which is very close to along, along Interstate 20 near the Louisiana border, all the way down south to Nacogdoches. We're talking several hundred miles in a huge swath of land through uh, East Texas that uh, these reports have been coming in through. So this is the first little piece of debris that we've been able to, uh, to see. And as we continue to drive toward Palestine, uh, we've had indications that there's, there are more reports and, and more uh, debris that has been found from Palestine into the Nacogdoches area as well. Miles? Ed, um, j just if you, can you describe the piece for me? Are you close enough to have a sense of that? No, it's, it's so hard to see. It's a, it, it, you, can, you can tell that it was a, a, a dark piece of debris, and unfortunately that's why I, described, I was describing the dirt. It's, it's very dark dirt uh, soil in, the, in this area. So all you could see was something stand kind of sitting on top of the soil there, uh, some piece of debris, and it's hard to describe what it might have been. And, but you, but it, it was distinguished because you could see the smoke coming from, from the debris as well. And you could also see a group of about six or seven people in, in the distance uh, almost uh, guarding the area. Ed Lavendera, who is on the road um, in the midst of that debris field, we, um, we conducted some extensive interviews with the seven-person crew of Columbia before they left, and uh, I'd like to, I'm hopeful that we can share some of that throughout the course of this, uh, and I believe we have some more of that ready. I don't know who we have ready in the queue and ready to go. Uh, maybe you can give me a sense of that in the control room. All right, Willie McCool. Willie McCool was the um, pilot, first-time flyer, United States Navy um, and um, a commander in the Navy, used to carrier landings and flying the EA-6B. Here's what he had to say before he left. For me, it doesn't really affect me. I'm just so focused on, on the mission and, and the training. And um, gosh, I've got a Navy background. I've been flying off carriers and doing light landings and dealt with pitching decks and bad weather. So you just kind of get immune in a sense to the environment around you and you deal with it. And I, uh, it's pretty much my attitude with regard to the 9-11 events. And uh, I guess I have more concern maybe for my family. I just want to, to do everything I can to put them at ease. And I know that NASA has, has done a wonderful job in uh, coping with the necessity for, for new security measures. And I think they've done a good job in doing that and have given comfort to me and my crewmates and in particular our families al along those lines. Tremendous concerns about security before this mission launched because of one occupant in particular. I mean, every shuttle mission since 9-11 has had added security, just like everything else we've encountered in our lives since 9-11. But in this mission in particular, uh, one occupant uh, put the, the security measures really over the top, unprecedented in the history of NASA shuttle missions, 113 of them since it began in April of 81. The reason one occupant, uh, citizen of Israel, the first Israel ever to fly in space, Colonel Elan Ramon, and uh, really, uh, I don't think people here in the United States are as aware that he was a true hero of the state of Israel. Let's go to Heidi Collins, who has more on that. Thanks, Miles. Going to try to help you out a little bit here. Um, we want to tell you about Elan Ramon. As Miles was just saying, he was the first Israeli astronaut, 48 years old, and just as tragically as for the rest of the astronauts uh, who had family, he was. Um, a family man, a father, a husband, and uh, four children. 
and uh, they've actually, the Israeli embassy has now sent a small team uh, to Florida to be with Ramon's wife and her children and also uh, his parents are there as well. As you can imagine, uh, the feelings that they must have along with the other families standing by at Kennedy Space Center awaiting the arrival and the landing of the shuttle Columbia. Uh, we are going to go now to Kelly Wallace, who is standing by in Israel, to tell us a little bit more about the background of Elan Ramon. Kelly? Well, Heidi, as you can imagine, tremendous sadness going through the entire country of Israel as these events are unfolding. We do have some reaction from Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, his office issuing a statement a short time ago. The statement saying, quote, the government of Israel and the people of Israel pray together with the whole world for the safety of the astronauts aboard the space shuttle Columbia. The, spa the statement going on to say the state of Israel and its citizens stand at this difficult hour with the families of the astronauts, Colonel Ramon's family, the American people, and the U.S. government. As you said, Heidi, a small team from the U.S. Embassy in Washington going to Florida because that is where Colonel Ramon's wife and his four children are. They were there, of course, awaiting the return of the space shuttle Columbia. We know that Colonel Ramon's father, though, here in Israel, in fact, he was watching or was at an Israeli television station. We understand he was there to watch the events unfold, to watch the return of the space shuttle, and then, of course, he watched the events on television. We believe Colonel Ramon's father has since left that station to return to his family. Now, Colonel Ramon really the pride of Israel, an Air Force colonel with more than 3,000 flight hours. He has a distinguished career. He served in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. He also was part of the mission back in 1981, a mission to bomb a nuclear reactor in Iraq. We have colleagues going around Israel talking to people here. As you can imagine, tremendous shock on the people from the people of Israel on this night. We're a very depressed country at the moment with uh, the, the impending war in Iraq, the, the intifada, the political problems that we have. I think this is going to hit Israelis quite hard because it's very personal. Yeah. The, 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 the wife has been interviewed. We know that the kids, you know, the kids are known in their classes and in schools. It's very personal. Uh, it's a very personal loss for everybody. We're very, I'm very upset. A very personal loss, Heidi, indeed, because, you know, when Colonel Ramon took off, on the space shuttle Columbia. It was front page news in every Israeli newspaper, live coverage on every Israeli television station. This, after all, the first Israeli astronaut in space, but also put this in context. This is a country experiencing a great deal of violence. More than two years now of the second intifada against Israel, more than 80 suicide bombings, tremendous violence, the economy really in a devastating situation right now. So lots of bad news. A lot of people looked at Colonel Ramon and his mission as some good news, really, in a sea of very difficult times. Back to you, Heidi. That's right, Kelly, and obviously Colonel Ramon, lots and lots of experience to finally get to this day, which is seen amongst the flying world uh, as quite an honor to become an astronaut. It takes very, very hard work and a lot of hours. He was an F-16 pilot, more than a thousand hours in that plane that we are familiar with, of course, in this country. He also took place in the 1981 bombing of a nuclear reactor in Iraq. So once again, uh, payload specialist on this mission, uh, 48 years old father of four and obviously a uh, devoted husband. I want to go ahead and go now to another reporter that we have standing by at the Kennedy Space Center, Grayson Calm of Central Florida News, uh, standing by to tell us more about the situation there. Grayson? We Hi, we were expecting a press conference with the media representatives here at the Kennedy Space Center. We've actually been moved from the shuttle landing facility to the Kennedy, to the center, central part of the Kennedy Space Center at the media site. We were expecting a press conference at 11.30. That has come and gone. We are told now that NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe is on his way here. As soon as the head of NASA gets here, they say that's when they will hold a press conference and give us any more information than they have been giving us. Even though we are right here uh, with all of the press people who are coordinating all this, we know a little more than you guys have, have heard there in Atlanta and everywhere else. It has just been uh, 
just been a, a day of trying to piece together information ever since we, we waited for the, the shuttle to land and it never came. Uh, so right now, uh, the, the, you know, you go into the media center and you've got people on two different cell phones and a regular phone trying to coordinate this, trying to bring it all together to give us some idea of the latest information of what they have. But right now, uh, it's, been, it's been very sketchy. All right, Grayson Calm, thanks so very much from the, for the update from Kennedy Space Center. Too. We want to uh, make sure that we remind you about something that uh, Miles O'Brien has been talking about all morning long. Very, very important for the people uh, in the debris field, which, as we've mentioned, is absolutely huge across central and east Texas. There are two chemicals, two main propellants that may cause a serious danger if you get anywhere near them. Let me just tell you what they are. Nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. These are very, very dangerous materials to the touch even. So if you are curious, if you are seeing a piece of debris on your, on your land or on your property, uh, do your very, very best to stay absolutely as far away from it as possible. Report it to authorities and make sure that you do err on the side of caution from this. We're going to send it back over to Miles O'Brien now who's standing by to tell us All right. what he knows. Miles. Thanks very much, Heidi. Appreciate that. Probably can't uh, underscore that point enough for you. It would be, it just compound a terrible tragedy if somebody were to be burned or uh, disfigured in some way by uh, hydrazine, which is uh, in particular a very, very volatile, ultimately cancer-causing uh, substance. Um, and both that and the nitrogen tetroxide can burn you just to touch it. So don't, don't do it. Just uh, stay away from it and uh, help the authorities in all this by letting them know where it is. Um, we have with us on the, uh, the phone line Michael Vaughn, and, and Michael was um, in charge of this, uh, he's actually um, uh, with us live. He was in charge of the Situation Room back 17 years ago this past week, when uh, on the day of what should have been the State of the Union, the Challenger exploded uh, a little more than a minute after liftoff. Uh, is anybody who was around then remembers that harrowing day, the decision to uh, actually cancel the State of the Union address that night by Ronald Reagan. Uh, Michael Vaughn was there. Tell us if you could give us a sense, uh, sort of paint the scene for us in the Situation Room at times like this. Well, it comes as a shock to the duty officers just as it, uh, as it is a shock to people at home. Um, when I was there sitting at my desk watching the Challenger lift off and saw it explode, uh, it was an extraordinary shock and the first thing I did was ran upstairs and tell people about it and that's probably what they did today as they heard about it. In 1986 CNN wasn't quite so nimble as it is now and we actually had to make phone calls to find out what was going on. And uh, we called the Johnson Spacecraft Center and the Kennedy Spacecraft Center and the emphasis at and that I'm, time... You know, was, I, I've was, got to interrupt you any? just briefly, sure. Michael, because we're not making clear what we're seeing right at the screen. That is file tape from 17 years ago. Yes. That's Challenger. That has nothing to do right. with today's events. Okay, go ahead. Um, today's events, quite similar to then, the first thing the Situation Room does, and it, its primary duty is, is the President's Alert Center, is to find out what happened and tell people about it. Uh, with us, it was quite quite easy because they were upstairs. With them, they had to make telephone calls to presidents at Camp David. But since it's a domestic issue, they call both the White House staff as well as their boss, the National Security Advisor, and let them know that something has happened. After that, the emphasis is what happened and are there any survivors? Uh, in both cases, it's hard to believe that there were any survivors. But that's what first comes to people's minds. And give us a sense, um, I guess what might be different this time around, 17 years after Challenger, what might be different is the specter of terrorism. Um, certainly terrorism existed back then, but it wasn't uh, on the, the forefront of our minds as it is today. Absolutely. In fact, they probably have that right on top of their checklist. Uh, Any time anything happens, is there a connection to terrorism? Uh, and if so, how can I find out about it? Because people will start asking those questions. Absolutely. And that's what make, makes everything different today than it was then. D uh, take us through those hours, though. I I'm sure it's all a bit of a blur to you. Uh, well, and, and the response and, and the confusion which inevitably follows something like this. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened in 1986 and then shift it over to today. And, and because there's quite a few parallels. Um, at that time, shuttle liftoffs were routine. The networks didn't cover them. You didn't see Walter Cronkite anymore at the beach. But CNN was there, and we were in the sit room watching the liftoff and saw the explosion. And 
the Situation Room is really geared towards international events, but clearly certain domestic things require their attention. So I ran upstairs from my office in the sit room and broke the basic protocol of White House behavior. I opened doors without being asked to enter or opened doors without an appointment. And I started with John Poindexter, the National Security Advisor, and I just stuck my head in and said, the, cha the challengers exploded. Um, we don't know what happened. I went then next uh, to... Michael uh, Vaughn, Michael Vaughn, stand by one second. We got a, a dispatch from uh, James Hartsfield in Houston. Sure. Central Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, that uh, statement will be broadcast on NASA Television Live, again beginning at noon Central Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. A media statement by NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe. A spatial contingency has been declared in mission control. Flight controllers continue to secure information and data and all notes pertinent to Columbia's descent from orbit this morning. Communications with Columbia were lost at approximately 8 a.m. Central Time as Columbia flew above north central Texas at an altitude of approximately 200,000 feet and a speed of 12,500 miles per hour. Mission Control had no further communications or tracking with Columbia following that time. Search and rescue teams in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and in portions of East Texas and along Columbia's planned route toward the Kennedy Space Center have been alerted to the space shuttle contingency and are actively at work. The location of any possible debris should be immediately reported to local authorities who will be in contact with NASA and Air Force search and rescue personnel. Any debris that is located may be hazardous and should be avoided due to the toxic propellants used on board the space shuttle. Again, a press statement and a availability by NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe. All right, we, is scheduled. <clears throat> we've been listening to John, uh, my, excuse me, uh, James Hartsfield, public affairs officer in Houston. He's sitting in one of those consoles there. I don't know if you noticed during that shot, there were a lot of boxes, look like moving boxes. One of the things that is part of the protocol here is to gather your notes, gather all your documents, all your data. All of that is sealed up, put in boxes, and ultimately will be the focus of a, a, uh, a commission that will look into exactly what's going on here. But you see the various positions. They're picking up notebooks and documents. Preserving data is the key here. Capturing what's on the screens, printing out notes uh, in order to capture exactly what happened in those final min minutes of the space shuttle Columbia. 1 p.m. Eastern, Sean O'Keefe, the administrator of NASA, a little more than a year into his job, will address the nation from the Kennedy Space Center. We, of course, will bring that to you uh, live. Uh, okay. The, um, I, I guess, given what we've been reporting to you and showing you all day, what I'm about to tell you is uh, perhaps obvious, but what senior officials are telling us is confirming what we've seen, uh, which is that the shuttle is, quote, gone. Let's leave that at that. Michael Vaughn, um, we were talking about the confusion and, and the, um, and, and the, you know, what happens in the hours subsequent to these kinds of things and how the government pulls itself together. Take us inside that once again. As I was mentioning to you, I simply ran upstairs when the Challenger exploded and threw open the doors and told people, went from Poindexter to Vice President Bush to Don Regan, the Chief of Staff, and then we all ended up in the Oval Office. Watching CNN run those pictures of the Challenger explosion over and over again, just as you've done today with this shuttle, then it was a question of finding out what happened, and uh, the, it's a matter of getting on the telephone and finding out from NASA what, what they thought had happened, did they know anything about survivors, what caused it, all that sort of thing. And there was just an incessant stream of questions from upstairs about all of this, and what we tried to do was gather that information as fast as we could. The same thing happened today. Um, the duty officers probably saw it first on, on the news, heard about it from NASA and immediately notified people right up the chain and immediately started making telephone calls to find out what had happened. In the case with any crisis, a bolt from the blue, the government's main, the first action you have to take is get everybody up to speed on what happened. So everyone has the same level of information. 
what happened, where did it occur, that sort of thing, and then go from there. With respect to NASA, it's just a question of getting on the phone with other kinds of crises. You, you have to call upon many, many sources of information to get that information. Uh, Michael, um, if you could tell us then, uh, you know, just recounting, when it became, I think we probably, as you put it, CNN's a bit more nimble now. We, I think we have a clear indication earlier on. It was many, many hours, as I recall, after the Challenger explosion before we really had a sense of what happened. It, it was. Time is more compressed now. Uh, what I did was I invited the administrator of NASA to come over to my office and use it as his command center because the rest of the government didn't have those facilities as they do now. And he came over and we helped him draft some statements and make telephone calls. And we got Johnson and Kennedy Spacecraft Centers on a speaker box on the telephone. And they relayed real-time information to us as they uh, acquired it. And right. then we would pass it upstairs. Michael Vaughn, formerly in the Situation Room, and who happened to be there on January 28th, uh, 1986, the day the space shuttle Challenger exploded some 70 seconds after leaving the launch pad there, killing all seven crew members in that case. 17 years ago this past week. Um, let's get Cliff Johnson on the line. Cliff Johnson is an assistant to the governor of Texas, Rick Perry. Cliff, what can you tell us about the effort to uh, preserve the debris field and, and perhaps more importantly, keep people away from any debris? Well, we're, we're watching the debris field. We just went from Navarro County, Corsicana, through Anderson County, Palestine, over to Cherokee County through uh, Nacogdoches County over to San Augustine County. We've had about 20, 25 uh, pieces of debris field. The biggest that I've been reported is anywhere from three to four foot square. Uh, we've had a few calls in on some uh, some small fires, nothing that couldn't be controlled. We have some folks re reporting the uh, smell of some kind of uh, propellant. And so we're, we're telling everybody to be very, very careful. We're securing all those uh, those sites. And we have the fire, local fire department, local DPS, state troopers, the sheriff's office, the police department, where everybody is uh, securing these sites. And we're building a list of those sites in the uh, Palestine, the county seat of Anderson County, and the Anderson County Sheriff's Office as we speak. Um, how big a debris field, how big a debris field, Cliff, have you been able to sort of pinpoint? Well, from what we can tell, it, it runs all the way from the northwest to the, to the uh, southeast through uh, starting in... Uh, primarily I-45 at Corsicana, Navarra County, all the way through Anderson County, all the way over to the Louisiana border. We're getting reports that maybe Nacogdoches County and San Augustine County took the brunt of it. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not familiar enough with uh, Texas geography to, t to get a sense of how many miles it is. From I-45 to the border is what? Well, I would guess as a crow flies, probably anywhere from 120 to 150 miles. We're 60 miles from Nacogdoches, from Palestine, and we're about 60 miles to Corsicana going back to the west. So you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 150 miles from Corsicana, probably to the Louisiana border. But okay, huge area. And do we have any reports of injuries on the ground, either from impact or from people who pick something up that is toxic? None. We have no, we have no reports of injuries whatsoever. All right. Cliff Johnson, let's hope it stays just that way. Cliff Johnson is an assistant to the governor, Rick Perry in the great state of Texas where they have a huge, huge debris field. We're talking about an area that spans uh, 120 miles. Uh, let's bring people up to date at the noon hour Eastern time. We should have been uh, at this point showing you about a 20 or 30 second uh, clip of the space shuttle Columbia landing about 9.15 a.m. Eastern time. That's when it should have touched down gently at the uh, Kennedy Space Center, the three mile long runway there. Instead, we've been showing you this, which is the final moments of the space shuttle Columbia. The old gray lady of the shuttle fleet, as some call it, perhaps not indicative of its condition, however, as it broke up over north central Texas, altitude of 200,000 uh, 200, feet at uh, some 12,500 miles an hour faster than a speeding bullet, quite literally. Um, Mission Control lost uh, contact with the orbiter about 15 or 16 minutes prior to its anticipated landing. Now, the landing scenario begins literally over the Indian Ocean with a deorbit burn. It's an incredible glider ride, braking glider ride, all the way halfway around the planet to the Kennedy Space Center. Tremendous stresses induced on the orbiter as it bleeds off speed and trades uh, speed for heat, quite frankly. Uh, 20,000 tiles are on the outside of a space shuttle in order to protect its aluminum frame from that heat. 
in excess of 2,000 degrees, well beyond the melting point of aluminum. Seven-person crew was on board, commanded by uh, Rick Husband, a colonel in the United States Air Force, on his second flight, his first as commander. There's the remainder of the crew. If you put in the telestrator, I'll help people see who's who. And um, there's Rick Husband there. His um, pilot uh, was on his first flight and uh, he was a commander of the United States Navy, Willie McCool, William Willie McCool. Elon Ramon, the first Israeli ever to fly in space. And I'm listening to NASA for just a moment. He's repeating that we're going to get a news conference at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Michael Anderson, mission specialist who um, was on his second flight. He flew to the space station Mir in 1998. Kept one up. Chawla, who was born in uh, India and is a naturalized American and for fun flew gliders and flew also before in 1997 operating the robot arm of the shuttle uh, for a uh, experimental scientific mission. Laurel Clark, she was on her first flight selected by NASA in 1996, PhD, uh, hailing from Racine, Wisconsin. And finally, David Brown, who uh, was selected by NASA in the same astronaut class, also on his first flight, captain of the United States Navy. They conducted a successful 16-day science mission and uh, did everything they set out to do, uh, by all accounts. And everything, um, they had a few problems, but every mission has a few problems. Humidifier kind of acted up. Some of the experiments gave them fits, but essentially had a very successful 16-day science run covering all manner of life sciences and physical properties and protein crystal growth and everything from that to looking at how dust storms impact global warming was a part of this mission. Let's go back to uh, the White House. Suzanne Malveaux is there. The president is uh, due to arrive uh, any minute now, might be there now. Suzanne, what do you have for us? We are expecting the president to arrive momentarily at the southwest gate by motorcade. As you know, the president returning from his weekend uh, planned at Camp David. He heard the news, we are told, uh, shortly after NASA had lost contact with the shuttle. He was immediately notified by his chief of staff, Andy Card. We are also told that the vice president, as well as Secretary of State Colin Powell, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, and uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Richard Myers, was also notified at that time. We are told the president made a call that he has talked to the director of NASA, Sean O'Keefe, at 10.30 this morning and that U.S. officials have been in contact with Israeli officials about this uh, tragedy. We expect sources tell us that the president will be contacting, calling Prime Minister Ariel Sharon later in the day. Uh, right now what is happening is that the aides are uh, behind closed doors. They're debating on just how the president will address the country. We have been told that he will not formally address the nation until after NASA uh, formally uh, gives its presentation and uh, then the president will speak we are told um, but as you can imagine miles really quite a tragic situation we saw early this morning uh, people who uh, immediately after they found out back here at the white house uh, dr rice as well as other staffers uh, getting the news uh, firsthand of course monitoring the situation uh, this uh, a big tragedy for the country as well as for this administration already uh, dealing with the situation in iraq as well as 9 11 uh, quite a shock to many people here at the white house miles sure. All right, Suzanne Malveaux, thank you very much. We will be checking uh, in at the White House frequently all throughout the rest of this uh, afternoon. We're told we're going to hear from NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe first, and then the President uh, will make some sort of address to the nation. Uh, we've got we to remind you about the debris, and um, I apologize to those of you who have been watching for some length of time if this is very repetitive and irrelevant if you don't live in this part of the world, but it's worth um, mentioning repeatedly. If you see what you're seeing right here, Right here at this parking lot, that's a shot from one of our viewers. That's a piece of Columbia's debris. Don't touch it. It's, uh, the shuttle is just a witch's brew of toxic chemicals. After it lands, the folks who first approach the orbiter are wearing full uh, respirator devices because there's so many gases which come off of it which might cause you immediate and long-term health effects. We're talking about monomethylhydrazine, nitrogen tetroxide primarily, two very volatile chemicals. They are, after all, designed to create explosions spontaneously, spontaneous combustion, uh, when the two meet. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, allows the shuttle to maneuver 
when it's in orbit and when it's uh, in the higher altitudes. All right, we're going to uh, show you something that's kind of uh, raw video coming in. This appears. This is um, our um, video which comes to us. It's amateur video of what we've been showing you through the good graces of WFAA all day. There you see it. Uh, well, we'll try to get that together for you. And uh, as soon as we get it queued up, we'll... Um, but I just want to underscore the point. If you see it, please don't touch it. Notify the authorities and uh, let them know where it is. It's important that they get a hold of all this debris because that'll ultimately be a part of the investigation. But really more important, it's, your, it's in your own best interest uh, not to touch it because it can really, really cause you some harm. Uh, as we try to get that tape together, I want to tell you a little bit about Ilan Ramon. Uh, Ilan Ramon, who um, you see in the far right of this picture here, you see the, the flag of Israel behind him. Uh, first Israeli to fly in space, an absolute hero of the Jewish state, uh, and a uh, decorated fighter pilot who actually took out, helped take out Saddam Hussein's nuclear facility in the mid-80s in, in Iraq, among other things. Uh, flew in space, the, the son of a Holocaust survivor who really saw his mission as a, uh, a manifestation of, uh, of things to come, of, of a better day for the Middle East. Um, that might sound a little bit Pollyanna, but that's, he, he saw this as a way of bringing some hope to his nation and perhaps to his whole region. One of the experiments which he was um, charged with uh, was to look at the very uh, building blocks of the, the, the universe and how micrometeors might have carried the seeds of life from planet to planet, uh, perhaps seeding the solar system with life, if you will. But what's perhaps most interesting about that experiment is the two principal scientists on it were an Israeli and a Palestinian. And uh, it proved that at least in this case, the high frontier was one place where people who don't get along can find a way to get along. Let's listen to what Elon Ramon had to say to us before he left. You're flying some special things with you to space. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Yes, I fly with me, first of all, I fly with me uh, the Israeli emblem, uh, which I uh, asked for from the President of Israel. And he sent me uh, uh, an Israeli flag, uh, actually it's an Israeli uh, emblem. Uh, I also uh, fly a very special uh, drawing uh, of uh, Peter Gintz, who was uh, a boy, uh, 13, 14 years uh, year old uh, boy in Theresienstadt, uh, one of the camps, uh, and he and a group of uh, other uh, kids there were writing their own uh, paper in the camp, uh, and they. Uh, they uh, were uh, transferring this uh, paper from one to another uh, to read it. And uh, Peter was a very, very talented uh, guy, a boy actually. He was interested in science and in, in writing and in, in painting, painting. And he drew at that time, uh, as he visioned, uh, Earth would, uh, would look like uh, from uh, the moon. And I'm taking uh, his his drawing uh, made made it uh, after the war, and they are now in the uh, museum of Yad Vashem in in Jerusalem, and uh, they were kind of kind uh, and and gave me this picture, uh, this drawing, and I will take it with me. Ilan Ramon, a member of the crew of the space shuttle Columbia, lost above Texas today. Right about uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Let's um, continue our discussion of Alain Ramon, who is a bona fide hero of the state of Israel. For that, we turn to Kelly Wallace, who joins us from Jerusalem. Kelly? Miles, as we've been saying throughout the day, tremendous sadness throughout this country, throughout the government, also every day Israelis reacting. Also, Colonel Ramon's family speaking out, his sister-in-law doing an interview with Israeli television a short time ago. She said, quote, I know that he would want to be remembered as the first Israeli astronaut. He was elated with joy. Also, Colonel Ramon's brother did an interview. He said that he had spoken to Colonel Ramon's wife. They talked about how this was a big tragedy. 
He also said how everyone was so euphoric, how this was really a dream come true, and obviously now the entire family dealing with the unthinkable. The Prime Minister himself, Ariel Sharon, his office, has issued a statement. The Prime Minister has been watching events, we are told, on television from his farm in southern Israel. In that statement, the Prime Minister's office saying, quote, the government of Israel and the people of Israel pray together with the whole world for the safety of the astronauts aboard the space shuttle Columbia. The statement going on to say the state of Israel and its citizens stand at this difficult hour with the families of the astronauts, Colonel Ramon's family, the American people, and the U.S. government with a joint prayer to God the Creator that the astronauts will return safely to their homes. Now we do know that the U.S. Embassy in Washington, or rather the Israeli Embassy in Washington, has dispatched a team to Florida to be with Colonel Ramon's wife and his four children who were there to watch the return of the space shuttle. We also know that the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Danny Ayalon, spoke earlier in the day with the director of NASA, Sean O'Keefe, and a spokesman in Washington for the Israeli embassy saying this is a tragedy both for the Israeli people and the American people. Throughout the day, our colleagues have been talking to people on the streets of Israel. You can imagine tremendous sadness. One woman telling my colleague, quote, he was the first astronaut to observe Shabbat in space. It was a beautiful experience for Jewish people, something the Jewish people could be very proud of. We've been talking throughout the day about the context, this coming really as the Israeli people have been dealing with more than two years of violence in this second Palestinian intifada against Israel. And Miles, I can tell you I was here when Colonel Ramon took off on the space shuttle and we watched the coverage, front page news in every newspaper, live coverage on every Israeli television station, a sense of joy, a sense of happiness, and many reporters. Miles, let me toss back to you now for the latest. Kelly Waz, thank you very much. And really, uh, the kind of attention and excitement that um, about the mission um, which uh, I guess we've lost Kelly. Can we continue the discussion with her, with Kelly? All right, uh, we'll check in with yeah. Kelly in just a moment. But what I was, the point I was going to try to make is that uh, for many of us here in the United States, uh, for many people who don't follow the space program closely, the whole event of a space shuttle mission, this after all was the 113th mission, become in, on the order of routine or seemingly routine. Uh, we can tell you it wasn't. It, it wasn't, and anybody who knows anything or took the time to learn about it would tell you that this was an experimental vehicle right on the edge of human capability. Uh, let's now, we have another view of this, and we've been showing you that view from our affiliate WFAA, which clearly shows an in-flight breakup. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the cause is another matter entirely. This is amateur video, which was shot out of Lafayette, Louisiana, from Rob Perillo. Rob is on the line with us. Rob, what did you see in here? Well, Miles, uh, I'm a meteorologist. I work for the CBS affiliate in Lafayette, Louisiana. I always tell our viewers to go out, take a look at the shuttle when it comes in, uh, when it doesn't fly uh, space station missions. And normally we can see uh, the, uh, the shuttle coming across southern Louisiana. And there what you see is uh, a little bit of a different angle of the video that you saw out of WFAA a little bit earlier uh, this morning. I went out to uh, view this shuttle and uh, took off a telescopic lens and, and went straight out of the, uh, the video recorder. And you can see, uh, again, uh, looks like some of the debris there taking a little bit of a right-hand turn, some of it continuing on. Uh, basically, uh, and after that, we normally would hear the uh, sonic boom. And instead of one singular sonic boom, I heard probably on the order of five or six smaller sonic booms that were stretched out over about a a 10 second time frame. Well, Rob, that uh, clearly if you're a shuttle watcher and you look at that, which uh, once again I've been, I've been hearkening back to the mere re-entry, uh, which we um, brought you a year and a half or so ago. Um, the, uh, the fact that you saw five pieces and heard five sonic booms, d did you realize immediately there was trouble? Yeah, I knew immediately and, it, and it's a good thing that uh, you guys uh, probably didn't take the audio part of that tape. Um, I had uh, the NASA website on uh, my uh, broadband uh, computer here, and I ran into the house and heard nothing but silence for the next 10 minutes, and I knew uh, right then and there uh, something was wrong. This is for him, like shooting it down. Um, Rob Perillo, um, can, you're, can you just give me a sense uh, of, uh, of your, uh, your thoughts as you witness this? Well, but 
the, I had the same feeling. I, I remember the Challenger accident. I, I was working at an aviation company at the time, and, and uh, the, the utter shock of, and, and unbelievability of the initial motion, uh, moment. Uh, I had gotten my wife up and, and my daughter, uh, my nine-year-old, to go outside and take a look at this, and uh, uh, the astonishment that you feel right offhand is, is, is indescribable, and uh, it, 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 you know immediately that uh, when you see multiple pieces of debris flying that uh, uh, it's not a good situation. We knew what we were looking at as the system was coming in. It looked good. We normally see it when it's between Dallas and San Antonio. That's where I picked it up. And then where you see that debris was more than likely very close to the Texas-Louisiana border. Mr. Prilla, thank you for sharing our tape, that tape with us. We do appreciate wow. it because what that shows us is the, the, the time immediately after the WFAA tape, the shuttle moving from west to east, Mach 16 or so, obviously there very quickly thereafter. But it definitely shows that distinct pattern, multiple targets is the technical term, big pieces, multiple sonic booms, quite clear. We're talking about an in-flight uh, breakup. Um, where are we headed now? All right, here we go. This is a live picture from our affiliate KDFW out of Dallas-Fort Worth. You're looking at a piece of debris, Space Shuttle Columbia. We're, we're told the debris field extends 120 miles or so. When you're traveling that fast, that high, uh, that's to be expected. Of course, uh, some pieces lighter than others. Some pieces have aerodynamic qualities. They'll flutter down. Others will... Uh, travel down very quickly. Um, it's very, you know, it's impossible to make out what that is, except to tell you it's because it is dark. It is probably something to do with the the underbelly, the uh, the portions of the shuttle that has those dark tiles. There are 20,000 tiles in all on a space shuttle. I've actually scaled back the number a little bit, but tens of thousands anyhow. The black ones on the bottom are um, designed to handle more significant heat loads. The whiter tiles. Uh, which are more on the top and sides where the heat uh, is not as much of an issue uh, are designed to handle uh, less, to shed less heat, put it that way. Live pictures, KDFW, and I don't know exactly where that is, but I'll just tell you that it's obviously in that swath of Texas from uh, I-45 all the way to the Louisiana border. Let's send it over to Heidi Collins. Heidi? Thanks, Miles. We are going to be seeing uh, many more pictures like that because that debris field is so very large. We want to take a minute now, though, to talk more about the astronauts. Of course, we are all mourning the loss of each and every one of those seven astronauts today. Six Americans on board, one non-American. That non-American is Israeli Air Force Colonel Ilan Ramon. He was a payload specialist, 48 years old married and father of four. We've been talking about him a lot today because of the special attention that went to him for being the very first Israeli astronaut. And as Kelly Wallace has been reporting, certainly during a time of unrest and tragedy in that country already, he was a symbol of hope and had hoped very much to bring that to his family and his countrymen in Israel. Let's go ahead to Judy Woodruff now. She's standing by in Washington, D.C. to tell us even more about Colonel Ramon. Judy? Thank you, Heidi. Uh, we are in Washington, am in Washington, as you said, and with me now is the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Daniel Ayalon. Mr. Ambassador, how did you find out about this this morning? Well, first of all, I heard it from the news, and then Sean O'Keefe, the Mr. Sean O'Keefe, the administrator of NASA was, kind, NASA, was kind enough to call and give me an update. And this is a big tragedy for the United States, for Israel, and, and mainly for the families. And this is where we are headed now, to be with the family and to help in any way we can. You're flying uh, in a few minutes, or a little, a little bit, uh, a few minutes from now, to where? Where will you go? We're going to go to uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral in Florida. This is where the family is being flown to. They were waiting for the landing in they Houston. They were in Houston waiting. They were in Houston waiting. So right now they're being flown by NASA. We will go there, we will meet with them, and we will try to give them as much comfort as, as possible. You told me a moment ago that you had just met uh, the uh, Mr. Ramon, uh, what, two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, before the shuttle flight took off. Yes, this was on the day of the launch. This was a very special day for Israel, for Israeli-U.S. relations. And I think from a very uh, human perspective, the special story of Ilan Ramon, who is the son of a survivor, who took with him to space, as he mentioned here before, a drawing of Peter Gintz, a 14-year-old 
Jewish boy who perished in the Holocaust. And before his death, you know, just he was drawing the earth as he imagined from space. This picture, this drawing, went with Ilan on board and uh, stayed with him to the end. What did it mean for the people of Israel, of your country, to have an astronaut uh, uh, going into space on a shuttle for the first time from Israel? Well, there was very special significance. First of all, uh, we are very uh, proud of our uh, technological uh, advance and prowess, so this was also an testament to Israel's uh, position in, in high-tech and uh, excellence and progress. And of course, every endeavor that we do with the United States, we're very much proud of. So it was also a testament to the strength of the relationship between the U.S. and America, you, uh, and, and uh, Israel. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, and we have a special bond. And we took it into a different, another dimension up in space. And of course, the special story of, of Ilan Ramon. And uh, just think that in two generations, you know, when we were at the lowest ebb, uh, on verge of demise in the Holocaust, and in two generations, we were soaring up to excellence and to really to the state of the art. So this was very, very significant. Tell us a little bit more about Colonel Ramon. As you said, both his, as well, I understand both his parents were survivors of the his concentration. Mother was. His mother was a survivor of the concentration camp. He had fought uh, in two wars for Israel. Yes, he was a, a Israel, fighter pilot. Right. And went on uh, some, what, seven or eight years ago to say, I want to may have a career as, a, as an astronaut. Yes, he did. That was his, uh, his uh, I guess, calling. And of course, uh, in our context with the United States, with the administration, and we thought of new areas of cooperation. The natural one was to look up into space. We have been cooperating in so many areas here on Earth. So there was only to look up to uh, extend the cooperation and the friendship between our two countries. That was a natural thing to do. And Ilan Ramon was the natural Israeli astronaut to send. He was the prepared mentally and, uh, of course, professionally. He was the best we could offer. What, what about his, uh, his family? We, he had four children, yes. a wife. Uh, they've been living with him in the United States. They obviously have extended family in Israel. Uh, this has to be uh, unimaginable. Yes, it is. Um, his father came specially. Uh, the training was uh, Judy for more than two years. So he came here with the family. And um, they were very well integrated into the Houston community. They went, his kids, he has four kids, as you mentioned, they went to school there in Houston. And his wife was uh, very much a... Uh, um, a member of the, of the community there, they really enjoyed, I talked to, to his wife, they really enjoyed life in, in, in Houston and um, being with the astronauts, being with the Americans, uh, it was a very special experience for them. And now, uh, Ambassador Ayalon, you're headed to Cape Canaveral for uh, uh, what is going to be a very difficult, uh, very, very difficult uh, time with them. We do so appreciate your coming in. Ambassador Daniel Ayalon from Israel to the United States uh, about to fly, as he said, to Cape Canaveral to join the family of astronaut Ilan Ramon, the Israeli astronaut on board the shuttle Columbia. Uh, once again, we're waiting for a press conference, uh, at NASA press conference. That's at 1 o'clock Eastern as we leave you the flag at the White House at half staff. Miles, back Name. to you. I need a name. A name? I think that picture tells us a lot right there. Looking at the White House flag at half staff uh, as the nation begins a period of mourning and uh, assessment and discussion um, in the wake of a, a terrible tragedy uh, as uh, good people uh, lose their lives doing what they love and pushing the boundaries of space exploration. Let's bring in uh, the Israeli ambassador of the United Nations, Dan Gilman. Um, Ambassador Gilman, um, on behalf of the people of America, we offer our condolences to the people of Israel on this moment. I can't hear him. Apparently he cannot hear us, so we'll, um, can you hear us now, Mr. Ambassador? No. Nope. He's, he's unable to hear us. 
Let me show you something that is uh, rather dramatic. Um, one of our engineers here, who is uh, a pilot as well as I am, we talk about these kinds of things a lot, pulled up the weather radar uh, for the Shreveport, Louisiana area. And um, that is the wreckage of the shuttle, Columbia, coming through, uh, reacting to the radar, which uh, detects heat and motion. And uh, that green area is just kind of the ground clutter from Shreveport. But what you're seeing, that red scar there, is the, the final remnants of the uh, space shuttle Columbia before it fell to Earth. There's Alexandria, Monroe, Shreveport, Tyler, Texas, right in the border. Uh, we've been told the debris field extends right to the border of Louisiana. I suspect there's some places in Louisiana right now where there are pieces of debris. We haven't heard from as many people from there, but uh, the word to them is the same as the word to the people of Texas, which is stay away from it. Call the authorities, but stay away from it. Let's go now back to the um, Israeli ambassador of the United Nations, Dan Gilliman. Mr. Ambassador, good to have you with us. And, and uh, what I said before was on behalf of the people of America, we'd like to extend our condolences to the people of Israel. And uh, just wanted to get your thoughts right now of Ilan Ramon and what he signified to your country. Well, thank you. And I would like to express also the condolences of the Israeli people. Although I'm still clinging to some sliver of hope that maybe, maybe, maybe our prayers will come true. Our prayers and thoughts and hearts are with the American people and with Ilan Ramon's family on this very, very difficult day. We, this is a very special day for us. This was meant to be a very special day for us because this cooperation really demonstrated the true bond between Israel and the United States, two brave and free countries two great democracies sharing together in this quest to explore and to excel. And Ilan Ramon to us was not just a pilot or an astronaut, he was a symbol. He was a symbol of excellence and freedom at a time when Israel is undergoing one of the most difficult periods in his life. And I can tell you that he became a national hero just by going into space with his American colleagues. I spoke to the Prime Minister last night and he was really anxiously awaiting Ilan Ramon's return. I spoke to many friends in Israel today and the devastation and the horror and the grief are just unimaginable because it was a ray of hope and it was a ray of something good happening in the midst of two very, very difficult years in which Israel is facing terrorism and some of the most ugly and vicious and brutal manifestations of human behavior ever before witnessed. And the fact that Ilan Ramon, the son of Holocaust survivors, actually went up there with his American colleagues, forging this bond and really saying to everybody that at the end of the day, good prevails over evil and that we shall all prevail over the evil surrounding us, brought us a lot of hope and a lot of elation. And because of that, the feelings today are of such devastation and such real sadness. It's, uh, it's hard to imagine the, uh, the, how profound uh, the sadness must be, given especially. Can you still hear me, Mr. Ambassador? I'm afraid we've lost communication with him once again. We'll leave it at that. All right. We have, um, we've been hearing all morning from uh, a lot of people across a wide swath of uh, central, uh, northern, eastern part of Texas uh, who have seen things and uh, have actually found some wreckage, which we invite you to stay away from. Uh, Linda Steen or Steed? Linda Steed is on the line with us now. Linda, what did you see and hear this morning? Well, we got up to watch the shuttle come over. And uh, about two minutes after eight, we saw it uh, on the western horizon. And uh, when it got nearer, we could see flecks or pieces of something coming off of it because we thought it was just the afterburners or something. But when it got directly overhead, um, you could see more things coming off the back of it. But we still didn't realize what was happening. And then we heard the racket, the sound, after it passed by us. Uh, just reverberated and reverberated for uh, several minutes like an earthquake or something. But that's basically it. We, I, I guess we saw it as it was breaking up, though we didn't realize it at the time. Linda, uh, describe that racket a little better for us, if you could. How, well, what did it sound like? Well, like a, it started out like a heavy thunder, 
and a rolling thunder sound. And then it, the dog started barking and the chicken started crowing and everything. Uh, just a real uh, weird sound. Um, and then got shook, like shook the earth. That was kind of, kind of it, kind of like a really heavy thunder. Hmm. Uh, did you see anything out your window then, or did you just hear it? I mean, uh, you, you were watching it. I'm sorry. I was standing I'm, outside. I want to make it clear. Yes, I apologize. I was standing I'm talking outside. to a lot of, We saw the. We saw uh, it. Describe it then. Describe exactly what it looked like. Well, coming toward us, we could see the sun glinting off of it, uh, and we could see uh, like shiny pieces in behind it uh, that we thought was, like I said, afterburner. But uh, all the time it came directly overhead, we could still see these pieces. Uh, from behind, but there was a main part of it that seemed to be intact uh, as it came overhead. Yeah. Linda Steed, have you um, heard about reports or have you seen any of the debris? Not personally, but five miles west of where I live right here, uh, there are some pieces down in a church parking lot and behind the church in the woods. Uh, and there's some down in town. My son called me a while ago and he saw a piece that was down right downtown Nacogdoches, right behind one of the banks. You're looking at live pictures from KDFW from their helicopter. This is a piece of the Space Shuttle Columbia, which lies in a median of a highway there. In, uh, that Anderson, would be Anderson Highway County. 7 out near the airport, kind okay. of west of town. I see. So that's not far from where you are, Linda? It's not too terribly far from where I am. No, I'm, I'm west of town, and it's west of town, just further south than I am. Hard to pick up what that is, but... Um, they said it was about a 10-foot piece is what I heard. It's a big piece, that is for sure. Yes. And um, difficult to figure out what part of the shuttle that is. Um, in any case... Uh, Sir, it's, it's, are you there? Yes, I am. Something cut in on my phone, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, i, I got to ask your thoughts, just not just as a person who happened to have this happen on their back door, what are your thoughts as an American at this moment? Oh, um, I'm devastated. Devastated. It's, it's unbelievable. It just makes you so sad. Yeah. Linda Steed, joining us from Nacogdoches County, Texas, where uh, significant pieces of debris, the Space Shuttle Columbia, have fallen as it disintegrated at an altitude of 200,000 feet, uh, some 12,500 miles an hour. Uh, much faster than a speeding bullet, and uh, I'll call your attention, well, they've got a wider shot now, but there was a triangle of crime scene tape there, that yellow tape that you see. That's, that is, uh, that's what we're uh, encouraging you all to do if you find a piece like that. Get the authorities out there, coordinate off, don't go near it. It could, um, could be very problematic and could cause you some harm because of all of the, the witch's brew of rocket fuel which is on board any space shuttle. CNN's Alec Fraser is a um, veteran of the U.S. Navy, Navy captain, uh, has a lot of experience in defense matters, intelligence matters, through his tour of duty. Uh, he joins us now uh, with some insights on uh, a couple of aspects of this which we have to at least touch the base on, and that is terrorism. Alec? I think there are a couple of uh, things that people ought to know because anytime an incident like this happens, there's a concern that there was a terrorist threat and that somebody actually shot it down by a missile. There are two reasons that this could not happen by a missile intercept. Number one is the altitude. Most missiles cannot fly above 100,000 feet, mainly because there's not enough air for the tail fins to be able to guide the missile. And number two is the shuttle was running at a Mach 6 rate and Mach 3 is as fast as most intercepts can be done. Alex, uh, we, we probably should do our mathematics. 12,500 miles an hour, I believe, equates to faster than even Mach 6, but th the point is moot because it's way too fast. Right of your screen, by the way, I want to point out is the President's motorcade uh, on its way from Camp David. And I believe uh, they're driving in because of the bad weather there in Washington. I'm not positive of that, but that would probably explain why he's not in the helicopter. Alec, continue on your point there. Well, for those two reasons, this type of intercept could never happen. And there, are, there are reports that people saw commercial aircraft in the area of the, of the space shuttle, but you've got to remember there's an altitude difference there of 170,000 feet, and any type of intercept or any type of problem of a mid-air collision is just simply not possible. Yeah. So uh, 
we, we sort of have to touch the base. We have to bring it up just to knock it down, if nothing else, in this day and age, don't we? But that's right. And anything that's going that fast and that high is, is, is impossible to be considered as a, as a terrorist missile attack. And remember those concerns that we've had of, of airplanes, commercial airliners being shot down by shoulder-fired, infrared, heat-seeking missiles. Those only go to two or three miles high. And we're, we're talking about 200,000 feet here, so those are not a threat. So you'll be working with a radar-guided missile, a very complex, highly technical system that could intercept something that high or that fast. And again, 100,000 feet or Mach 3 is about as, as much as anybody can do. Okay, faster than anything out there. And I, I, we should underscore that point, but as we say, given the, the environment in which we live, we've got to at least uh, express that to, to make people realize that it isn't possible and is not a likely scenario. And, and that might be something that is going through people's minds, right, Alec? Right, and it's just not possible. All right. Uh, we would like to underscore a couple of points for you. First of all, we are expecting uh, about 23 minutes from now uh, a briefing from the NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe, who a um, little more than a year into his job um, has quite a job ahead of him. Uh, he will be addressing reporters at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and we will, of course, bring that to you live. Um, it's very likely that there's not a lot uh, that they can offer, he can offer all of us in the way of technical information to give us a sense of what happened, except to tell you what you can clearly see um, on your screen right there, uh, that the shuttle disintegrated, Columbia, the oldest uh, shuttle in the um, orbiter fleet of four, uh, disintegrated over Texas, as we just told you, 12,500 miles an hour. Uh, I don't know what that equates to Mach, but it's uh, real fast. And uh, 200,000 feet above the ground, uh, disintegrated into those uh, multiple fireballs, five, six, maybe more of them, big ones, and rained down debris over an area extending beyond 120 miles from Interstate 45 in Texas all the way to the border. We suspect uh, as well as uh, parts of Louisiana, although we haven't heard from people in Louisiana. There's a piece of debris there, uh, Alexandria, uh, excuse me, um, Anderson County, Texas. Stay away from it because uh, of the, 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 the uh, toxic brew which is on board a shuttle could cause you great harm. It's also would be a violation of federal law to touch it. I've been hoping to get some more interviews with the crew. We talked to the crew before they left, and I'm wondering if we have another one of those ready to, in the gate, ready to go. All right, we're, we're going to try to get that together. We're hoping to. Um, Mike Brooks, our law enforcement uh, expert, ha has been on the phone with the FBI, and in this situation, even though we just talked about how remote the chance of terrorism is, the FBI is involved, isn't it, Mike? Yes, they are, Miles. I just got off the phone with the uh, Dallas office of the FBI with their spokesperson, Special Agent Laurie Bailey, and Special Agent Bailey told me that, uh, that they are, have set up a command post, and they are treating this right now as a, as a military aircraft down. And, uh, and their main responsibility right now, the FBI is assisting in containing any debris fields at all. Uh, they have uh, mobilized right now over 30 agents and support staff, uh, and the, along with their evidence response team, which is, a, which is a team of highly trained professionals that will go out and contain the evidence and, and process it and uh, work together with the military uh, to try to, again, piece everything back together again. But there have been uh, different reports around the state, around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, that, uh, that there have been a num number of debris fields, uh, debris that has been raining down over that particular area. Um, they right now also are fielding calls from local law enforcement and from citizens. And, and I want to, again, stress and, and the FBI wants to again stress that if you do find something call your local law enforcement call your local fire department but don't get and go near it don't touch it as Miles was saying the you know the, the toxic witches brew if you will that's contained in a shuttle and, uh, and, and just leave it where it lies and call local uh, the local authorities Miles Mike Brooks uh, and let's just underscore the point one more time the FBI is involved but we need to state this as clearly as we can for viewers Terrorism is not really on the, the radar screen here. Not at all. They're, they're, right now, they're not even talking about anything at all about terrorism when I was talking with the FBI. They don't think that the, the, the terrorism plays any role in this whatsoever. All right. The best we can hope right now is that the FBI and all the local authorities there are able to marshal their resources. And it's got to be extensive given the debris field 
keep people away from this, these pieces. Very much so. And uh, in the Dallas office of the FBI, they have uh, smaller offices outside in Texarkana and other small towns in and around Texas uh, they call resident agencies. And uh, they're also getting those people uh, in their office to uh, work and coordinate with the local law enforcement on trying to locate any debris that all that's found in some of the even remote locations in and around the state of Texas. Miles? All right, Mr. Brooks, Mike Brooks, uh, please stay in close contact, stay in touch with your sources for us, and keep us posted on what they know there, if you would. This past week um, was a difficult week for NASA before this happened. Uh, January 27th, the anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire. You recall that fire on the launch pad in 1967. Killed three uh, astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, um, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm forgetting the third astronaut right now. You'll, you'll forgive me. In any case, uh, it was also the anniversary of the Space Shuttle Challenger's explosion um, on January 28th. And it was on that occasion that Rick Husban, the commander of the Space Shuttle Columbia, radioed down some words to Mission Control uh, marking that moment. Well, things are going really great, Miles. We're having a great time up here. We had a great ride to orbit, and uh, all the activation of the experiments in the space lab went extremely well. And uh, we're really, uh, we've got our space legs and uh, up and running. Okay, that, that was not at all what I told you it was. That was a little piece of an interview I did with the crew on the Saturday after they launched. Rick has been talking about um, their time in space, and it might be worth at some point replaying a, a healthier chunk of that. Um, we have um, isolated the moment where Mission Control first became aware that there was a problem. That's sort of the, the last message. Well, all right. We're going to try to get all this stuff together, and we will go to Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy? Thanks, Miles. Uh, let me just say uh, very quickly at the outset here how glad we are as your colleague that you're on the job this morning with your extensive uh, experience and background in this uh, in this area on this terribly tragic day. With me, Miles, uh, in the studio here in Washington is Patty Davis, who covers aviation, has uh, been talking to people at the Federal Aviation Administration, National Transportation Safety Board. Patty, what are they saying at this well, point? Judy, the FAA this? says that it has been in contact with NASA on this shuttle accident. The FAA and the NTSB say that investigators are on standby, ready to go to the crash site if there is, it can be a, a, a crash site, looks like it's a very widely spread out site, if they're requested to go by NASA. Now, the National Transportation Safety Board, which is the agency that investigates air crashes, played a broad role, a spokesperson said, in the shuttle Challenger explosion. In the 1980s, the NTSB reconstructed parts of the shuttle for NASA and did a lot of the metallurgical work, looking at the composition of the metal debris from that accident. Now, aviation safety experts say what will be of critical importance in this accident, all the telemetry from the shuttle transmitted to mission control. The debris field expected, as I said, to be very, very wide since it broke up at some 200,000 feet in the air. The FAA says that it did not have any contact with the shuttle at all. It was still very high in the air. Air traffic control would have made contact with the shuttle when it reached about 60,000 feet. A spokeswoman telling me that at that point, uh, air traffic control would have brought it into the airfield, airfield just like any other aircraft, moving aircraft out of the way. No reports from American pilots, Southwest or Northwest pilots, that they saw any of this unfold or anything unusual usual, normally they would report such activity uh, to their bases and also to the Federal Aviation Administration, but certainly a, an unfolding situation and we may hear more. And Patty, I just want to, you know, while you're here, clarify, I know Miles has been talking about this all morning. There have been witnesses who saw commercial, what appeared to be commercial jetliners in the area. Just to be very clear, commercial aircraft in this, in, you know, all over the world fly at a much lower altitude than where the shuttle was Right, was we're talking a commercial aircraft happened. being like 30, 35,000 feet in the air. Right. The shuttle at 200,000 feet. There's no way they could have come in contact with each other. The FAA is saying what, what their, the, their value... at the very last... At the uh, very last very stage closest as it's landing. Entry point. Right, right. 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 Uh, the FAA is saying uh, the value of perhaps an aircraft being in the area would be that perhaps a pilot may have seen something. Uh, but we haven't had any reports at this point of a pilot saying, yes, I saw it and here's what I saw.
How much uh, at this point, n normally there wouldn't be much uh, contact, would there be between NASA and the Federal Aviation Administration? I mean, clearly they have to coordinate to some extent because when the shuttle's coming down, they don't want aircraft in the area. Exactly. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration puts TFRs or temporary flight restrictions in into place around the airfield, around the path where the shuttle would be coming in. And as I said, FAA is taking over air traffic control wise when that plane is coming in, when that shuttle is coming in to land because it's coming into an airfield and that's the FAA's job is to get the shuttle down. But it just did not get to the point where our traffic had stepped in. So just to summarize again, Patty, what is it that officials uh, both at the FAA and uh, I guess in particular now the National Transportation Safety Board will be doing? What is their job right now? Well, they're waiting to get a request from NASA. They don't know. They all have crash investigators. They all have experts in crashes. Uh, they would be providing a support role, it looks like at this point, since this is a not a commercial uh, space uh, vehicle. This is a, a U.S. Uh, government one. So NASA would most likely take the lead role in this. These, all these agencies would be supporting, bringing their experts in, safety experts saying that it's important that the NTSB with its experts get involved because they have expertise in this area. That's right. All right, Patty Davis, thanks very much. And Miles, as I come back to you, uh, I've been looking at the news wires, as, uh, as I know you have, uh, seeing, reading reports of people who live in Arkansas and Louisiana uh, saying that they saw an explosion in the air. If you can help, uh, you know, help everyone understand a little bit better about the trajectory and where people in the United States might have first seen this happen and where it might have happened, it might not have been over Texas. Hard to say, uh, Judy, except we do know the point at, at which they lost communication. Obviously, uh, mission control in Houston is in constant communication with that space shuttle from the moment of launch really all the way down to landing. It's not like the old days where you had those blackout periods in the Gemini and Apollo missions when they didn't hear from them for some time and then they come back through the after the chutes open and everybody would breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief. It's constant communication, so they can pinpoint the exact moment, and we're told it was right about 9 a.m. Eastern time, and we can pinpoint that location as being there right over kind of north central Texas, right around Dallas. As a matter of fact, that WFAA affiliate tape that we've been showing you, you actually see uh, what starts out as appear the appearance of a normal space shuttle uh, the comet-like streak, as you see it there, one fireball with one tail, and you almost w witness the whole thing happening. You see the kind of the, 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 the uh, tail sort of it acts in a strange way, and then boom, all of a sudden you see, you see those small pieces right behind there. If you can put it in the telestrator, I could help out a little bit. But, um, and then, uh, then wait and watch. Okay, now uh, additional pieces come off there. So you're almost seeing it right that moment over uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, and that is really uh, as good a piece of evidence as we have right now. Juxtapose that with the time frame, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. So so, My Miles, yeah. I just, uh, just want to say what, what the Associated Press, anyway, is reporting is the police uh, in near Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, people, uh, police in uh, Arkansas, the only town I see quoted is Stamps, Arkansas. I'm not sure where that is geographically, saying many people calling authorities, saying they saw explosions in the sky, one man saying, I think we're being attacked. Uh, it's pretty clear there's some connection here. Yes, clearly. I mean, traveling west to east, that all fits uh, with what we're seeing. And at that altitude, on a clear morning, uh, a big wide swath of the, the ground would have uh, the opportunity to see this, even if debris didn't actually rain down in that particular area. You'd be able to see it for many, many miles uh, at that altitude. Um, I recall uh, after the uh, Challenger incident, I was in Tampa, Florida, now the Challenger blew up right about in the same altitude, 150, 200,000 feet. Uh, we could see the cloud, the remnants of the Challenger from Tampa, 150 miles away. So that gives you a sense of uh, the clear view uh, vision that people might have and that would drive with all those reports uh, uh, that we're seeing. Uh, we have uh, with us from Dallas, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, uh, Senator from Texas. Uh, Senator Hutchinson, good to have you with us. Thank you, Miles, thank you. Tell us. Uh, what you have you had any direct contact with the search and rescue effort at all? Tell us what you what you know about efforts to preserve the debris and keep people away from it. Well, I've talked to the uh, deputy administrator at NASA just to first of all offer my office if they needed to get here quickly because I'm sure they are going to have search and rescue teams all over North and East Texas. They're they know that they have 
debris found in Nacogdoches and uh, certainly near Dallas. Uh, so I've talked to them, and they are just devastated by this, of course, and uh, we want to be helpful in every way that we can to try to get to the mod- bottom of this. Um, I am on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee in the Senate. I'm sure that we will have hearings to talk about what went wrong and just try to learn from this tragic accident uh, so that we will know what to expect in the future and try to make safety a first priority. Senator, um, inevitably, uh, in the wake of all this, there will be discussion about the merits of putting people in, in harm's way in this manner, of taking the risk. Is it worth it? Well, I, I think clearly Anytime we are pushing the envelope in research and technology, uh, there are going to be tragedies. We have had uh, the terrible Challenger tragedy before this. Uh, I would never want America to walk away from being in the forefront of uh, the the research. It, It has been wonderful for our country. But I do think we have to appreciate the test pilots who are willing to become astronauts because they are taking a huge risk, and and they know they are, and they're willing to do it uh, to keep America in the forefront of the space research, which has been so valuable to our country. So I guess then, you know, this could be one of those um, forks in the road when it comes to um, your role and Congress's role. One fork uh, says, let's let's end manned spaceflight. The other fork would be, maybe it's time to start thinking about a a new generation of vehicles which can carry humans to the final frontier? Well, I think the new generation, the new mission uh, of NASA is the way to go. I would never step back from America's preeminence in space. Uh, I think the next missions are going to be medically related, and uh, certainly uh, we want to know what is out there. Just look at what the satellite technology has brought to our country in security. It's making all the difference in, in our war, the predators, and the ability to communicate through uh, satellites. All of this happened because we have been willing to push that envelope and, and be first in space and, and make sure that we learn the technology that, that keeps us in the forefront. So walking away from space research would never be Uh, an option. What we have to do is make sure that we have a clear mission, that we fully fund NASA so that we have safety as a priority, and we need to appreciate these wonderful test pilots who are doing so much for our country. Their mission is every bit as important as our national security and national defense. Well, that's that's an amen moment. We'll we'll leave it at that. Senator K. Well, thank you. Bailey Hutchinson of Texas. Uh, we wish you well uh, in the near term, helping out with this search and rescue operation, and also in the long term as you deal with the investigation and the discussion, which will follow in the months to come. Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson from Dallas. Um, we have been getting some emails all morning from people who saw various things. Some of them uh, with uh, still photographs. Um, Let's bring in uh, one of those witnesses. Um, Waylon, Waylon Wagner from Henderson, Texas is with us now. Uh, Mr. Wagner, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, I can. All right, if we could uh, bring up your still image, which is on the um, computer in the control room there. Uh, we can take a look at the still image you captured. Tell me uh, what you saw, heard, how you came to be outside with a camera. Well, uh, it was about 8 o'clock this morning, and uh, I went outside on my patio just to have my coffee like I normally do, and our house faces basically the south. And I was looking out toward kind of the northwest, and it was coming over our tree line, and it was just a very thin vapor line at that time. And I thought, wow, you know, what a beautiful meteor, uh, you know. And we so, did wait, not... Mr. H- you did not know that it was a shuttle necessarily? You just no, to... sir. Okay. We had gone out to eat last night, and we didn't know anything about the shuttle reentering today. I see. Okay, go ahead. So I, I was standing there, you know, and it just got bigger, and you could see more smoke coming off of it. And, and about that time, I hollered at my wife, and I said, come out here and look at this meteor, you know. And uh, she ran out there, and she said, let me go get my camera. So she ran back in and got her camera and took these pictures. Now, these pictures here are, you know, it might have been a minute or so after that, 
and these were more in the south east when these pictures were taken and then she's actually got some pictures of them of the vapor trail as they went in behind the tree do you um, did you hear anything or was it so far away that you couldn't do what did you hear anything unusual or was it so far away you couldn't hear anything unusual no uh, at this time after we had taken the pictures and everything we hurried back into the house and we had the weather channel on and we thought well if it's a meteor maybe they'll show something and then the newscaster that was on uh, had come on and read us the deal about the shuttle. Well, then we went immediately to your station, and then we saw it. And then, just maybe a minute or a minute and a half, the house started rumbling. Really? And we're going, oh, no. Wow. You wow. know. And uh, So the, the rumble sort of occurred sometime thereafter. Yes, sir. We had already come back in the house and was watching the TV, and then we realized what it was was... The shuttle had re-entered and everything, and uh, we stepped outside again and just listened to it. It was kind of like a, oh, a big thundering noise, like a thundercloud would cause in the distance, and it just kept on and on and on. And we just kind of sat back down here at the TV and looked at each other, you know, and just all oh, that. It, so it, it, it might have just taken that much time for the sound to reach you, in other words. Well, yeah, it was probably at least a minute, you yeah. know, a minute yeah. to a minute and a half, and then we started hearing the sound of it. All right, uh, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, Waylon Wagner, Henderson, Texas, thank you for sending that image, which shows, uh, to my way of counting, uh, one, two, three, four, f at least five distinct big pieces of the Space Shuttle Columbia at that moment in time over Henderson, Texas. CNN's Robert Novak uh, sat down with uh, the new NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe. Uh, just last week had a lengthy interview with him, talked a lot about um, where he was headed, and uh, one of the things that was um, uppermost on Sean O'Keefe's mind has been the announcement just now, a little more than a week old, of a new Educator Mission Specialist program. Uh, really sort of the fulfillment of the Teacher in Space mission uh, of Krista McAuliffe, Space Shuttle Challenger, 17 years ago. NASA finally getting to the stage where it was ready to begin uh, thinking about flying teachers once again. Barbara Morgan, Krista McAuliffe's understudy, due to fly, was due to fly at the end of this year, November. And uh, additional teachers were encouraged to apply uh, to fly in subsequent missions about one a year for the foreseeable future. Um, it was a time when um, at least last week when Bob Novak sat down with Sean O'Keefe, there was a lot of talk about bringing civilians into space. Um, what, else did, what else did he have to say, Bob? Miles, uh, I had mentioned to uh, uh, Administrator O'Keefe that uh, uh, the astronauts used to be household words and uh, people really didn't know the, the astronauts now and uh, uh, I wondered if the lack of public interest and support in the, in the space program uh, was a problem of not knowing the astronauts and whether they should get to uh, know them better. He mentioned then Barbara Morgan and he also went on to say this and this has a, this is a, uh, has a poignant uh, sound now as we listen to it. Let's listen to what the uh, administrator will keep said. We also need to get to know a lot more about, again, guys like Ken Bowersox or Rick Husband, the guy who is the commander of the current expedition that's uh, underway right now. Uh, those, are the, those are the kinds of folks that, that we, I think, ought to admire, look up to, and realize the extraordinary capabilities they have and the sacrifice that they make each and every day on our behalf as explorers. It really is an extraordinary group of people. Of course, we uh, now get to know these people much better with this uh, tragedy, Miles. And uh, the administ administrator O'Keefe, who was not a space expert at all, he was brought in there because he's a great numbers cruncher. He's a good management man, former secretary of the Navy. He was deputy man at the Office of Management and Budget, trying to make do with kind of short rations for NASA, trying to increase public support. Now he's got even a bigger task, and that is to explain to Congress and indeed to the nation uh, what happened today. And uh, there will undoubtedly be people who, naysayers will say, uh, manned space is too uh, risky. But as Senator Hutchison said, and I'm sure I know that that uh, as Sean O'Keefe will say that it is essential that we continue the manned space program. CNN's Bob Novak, who um, had the last uh, lengthy interview with uh, Sean O'Keefe before um, we hear from him today. 
Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, that's right about now, is when we expect to hear from him. We will bring it to you the moment it begins, but uh, let's take an opportunity to recap. As we take a look at uh, pictures uh, captured by our affiliate WFAA, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Local Time, what you're seeing are the final moments of the Space Shuttle Columbia as it broke up into several pieces, at least five big ones that we are able to count, disintegrated at an altitude of 200,000 feet, traveling 12,500 12, miles an hour, some 15 or 16 minutes prior to its anticipated landing at the Kennedy Space Center. Crew of seven aboard had conducted a 16-day science mission, traveled six and a half million miles in the course of that, and had, by most accounts, a, a relatively flawless mission. Uh, the crew, led by Commander uh, Rick Husband, uh, featured uh, Mark Brown, Laurel Clark, Kaplana Chala, Willie McCool, the pilot, uh, Mike Anderson, and Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli to fly in space, uh, featured a 16-day science mission where they conducted um, in excess of 80 separate experiments on themselves, on rodents, uh, on all kinds of things, physical sciences, trying to learn more about how microgravity affects uh, human beings as well as other phenomena. Uh, by all accounts, it was a successful scientific run. And then, inexplicably, at 9 a.m. Eastern, just about that time that tape was shot, we lost a communication. Now, let me just tell you how a shuttle... Oh, this is a little different than I... I'm sorry, this anticipated something else. It was coming in this way uh, across uh, Texas, right about this point is where the breakup occurred. Uh, should have continued down right along the rim of the um, Gulf Coast there through the Panhandle of Florida and down into um, the Orlando area and um, make a steep right turn to runway 33 at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Um, that was the altitude and speed at the time of the breakup. Tremendous forces on a shuttle. The whole process of a deorbit burn begins in the Indian Ocean when they fire rockets which slow the shuttle down just enough for it to begin falling out of orbit. The shuttle essentially is in a constant free fall around the planet at 17,500 miles an hour, sort of the perfect balance between its speed and the forces of gravity. It slows it down just enough to begin that precipitous drop. It begins a series of broad S turns to dissipate heat or to trade, um, I should say, speed for heat. It's covered with thermal insulating tiles which are designed to protect the aluminum frame of the shuttle from that tremendous heat which can exceed 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Those tiles can, are a very fragile thing which uh, have caused a lot of maintenance headaches over the years for NASA as it tries to keep the space shuttle fleet uh, flying now uh, into its uh, 22nd year. Uh, all right, we have seen as Gary Tuckman uh, on the scene at the Kennedy Space Center, right near where that press conference with the NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe is set to begin. Uh, Gary, um, I, I know you're just kind of hitting the, hitting the ground running there, but if you can give me a sense of what the scene is like. I'm mild, as you might expect. It's a very difficult, sad, and confusing time for the employees and visitors here at the Kennedy Space Center. I just spent some time about 30 minutes ago at the Visitor Center where tourists come, and Saturday's a very busy tourist day here at the Space Center. And there's a huge flagpole with the American flag flying at half-staff at the Visitor Center. And I saw a family, a husband, wife, and their two children stepping out of their car to go on the tour of the Kennedy Space Center. And there were a lot of people running around in the flag and half-staff. And the woman looked at me and saw I was with CNN and said, what's going on here? She had no idea what had happened. I quietly informed her what had happened, and she burst into tears. And that gives you an idea of what people are going through here. There are flags at half-staff throughout the complex. There's a sign, and you've probably seen this, Miles, when you've been at the Cape, when you drive in and it tells you how many days it is until the next launch, how many days it is until the next landing. And it says zero days until the next space shuttle landing. And it is a very eerie case of deja vu for a lot of us. I was here in 1986 at that point. I know you, Miles, worked in Tampa for a local station. I worked in West Palm Beach, and I was here that day after the Challenger exploded. And it's the very same terrifying, terrible feeling here of deja vu almost two decades later, exact same week of the year, first day of February today, January 28th. 17 years ago, but it's a very sad day here at the Kennedy Space Center. Miles. Gary Tuckman, thank you very much. As we look at this picture, um, which I believe came down a little while ago, uh, the flag at half-staff there beside the countdown clock at the Kennedy Space Center. In the distance, you see launch pad 39A, which is exactly the point at which Columbia left the planet 16 days ago. 
Um, about um, three miles from where that flag lies, um, sort of to the back of the camera, is the shuttle landing facility where it should have arrived uh, at 9.16 a.m. this morning. But as we have been telling you, uh, that did not happen. It disintegrated uh, shortly after losing communication with mission control over the state of Texas, somewhat ironically. Uh, disintegrated into several pieces at high altitude and high speed, raining down debris over a huge, huge swath of Texas and into Louisiana. And there you see half staff at the White House, live pictures there. Uh, this one from the North Lawn as we see uh, the nation in the earliest stages of beginning to mourn uh, a brave crew of people who understood these risks and yet willingly, gladly embraced them. Let's uh, send it over to Heidi Collins. We'll get another update for you. We want to let you know that the minute that Sean O'Keefe begins talking, we'll bring it to you. Yes, we will, Miles. We want to let uh, everybody know we're going to recap the details now of the tragic ending of the Space Shuttle Columbia mission and what a tragedy it is. Here's what we know. NASA lost communication with Columbia just moments before it was scheduled to touch down in Florida at 9.16 Eastern this morning. Officials say they were given no indication of trouble. Meanwhile, television images captured the craft separating into pieces as it streaked across the Texas sky. An investigation began almost immediately to find out what happened. An official in Washington says an act of terrorism was considered highly unlikely. Spectators who went to Kennedy Space Center to see the shuttle landing were left waiting. We're shocked. We're we, at a loss for words. We don't know what to think. We feel so sad and sorry for the families of people that have been lost. Just hope uh, they're with God. Search and rescue teams fanned out across South Central Texas looking for debris from the spacecraft. Officials warned people to stay away from anything that might look like a piece of potentially hazardous wreckage. Among the seven Columbia crew members, Commander Rick Husband was at the helm along with pilot William McCool. Colonel Ilan Ramon, Israel's first man in space. Also, payload commander Michael Anderson, mission specialists David Brown, Kalpana Chawla, and Dr. Laurel Clark. Miles, we're going to send it back over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Heidi Collins, for um, offering a, a good recap for those of you who might just be joining us about uh, what has turned out to be a tragic day, February 1st, 2003, the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Um, we are expecting a news conference from the NASA Administrator, Sean O'Keefe, to talk about the picture you see on your screen right now, which is that s uh, stream of multiple fireballs, a couple explosions there. You see the puffs of smoke coming out of it as Columbia streaked across Texas about 9 a.m. Eastern this morning, uh, losing communication with Mission Control right about the same time doing exactly what you're seeing here, which is breaking up, in-flight breakup. And that is all we can tell you about what happened because uh, we don't have a lot of uh, information in the early stages of things like this, of course. And uh, of most current concern right now to officials is to secure the debris which has rained down on a huge, huge swath of the United States from Texas into Louisiana, um, hundreds of miles uh, of debris and that debris with its toxic brew associated with it is to be avoided at all costs. Please let authorities know if you know of some, but please by all means don't touch it. You could hurt yourself badly and we don't want that to happen on top of everything else that has happened today. Let's uh, bring in Barbara Starr, uh, our Pentagon correspondent, to see uh, what, if anything, the Pentagon is aware of on this story. Barbara? Miles, we can tell you now that U.S. military forces from Fort Hood, Texas, are moving into position. Fort Hood, Texas, just announcing that it has launched helicopters, four helicopters now in the air, participating in what they are calling a search and rescue mission. But of course, it is really search and recovery of the debris and the crew of Columbia. They tell us that this task force will be comprised of helicopters from sev several military elements at Fort Hood, Texas. 
as we said, four helicopters now in the air. They will also be accompanied by military police from the 89th Military Police Brigade at Fort Hood. We are told as they locate debris, military police will now move in and secure those debris sites. Fort Hood is also telling us this will be a 24-7 operation that they will use their Black Hawk helicopters during the daylight hours to search for debris. And when, once darkness falls, they will move in with what are called Kiowa Warrior helicopters. These are helicopters, of course, with night vision capability and night vision sensors. Again, the military police will move in to secure the debris sites until the debris can be removed in a safe manner. We are also told that coincidentally this was a drill weekend for the Texas National Guard that they have additional helicopters and personnel that are on standby even a C-130 aircraft and that they will move in once the order comes down but so far it is the elements from Fort Hood, Texas and of course Quite coincidentally, Fort Hood this very weekend was getting organized to begin its deployment to the Persian Gulf for possible military operations against Iraq. Miles? So, Barbara, uh, the, key, the key point here is to try to preserve all this debris. And uh, do you get the sense that there will be enough forces marshaled to this effort? Yes, there, you know, Fort Hood, Texas, to be uh, quite clear, is a huge military installation in Texas, 42,000 personnel. And of course, the Texas National Guard has a lot of assets at its disposal, troops, vehicles, uh, airborne assets. So between the governor of Texas activating any National Guard elements down there on a state level and any requests that NASA may make to the Pentagon here today, there should be plenty of capability to move into these various sites very quickly, secure them, and recover that debris. All right, Miles. Barbara Starr, uh, thank you very much, and stay close, please. Um, I told you a little while ago that this was a tough week for NASA already. January 27th, 1967, the Apollo 1 fire. Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee, my apologies, I couldn't remember Chaffee's name a little while ago, it's been a long morning, uh, died in that fire. January 28th, 1986, the Challenger disaster, uh, it exploding 70 some odd seconds after uh, liftoff. On that uh, anniversary of the 28th, the commander of the Columbia mission, Rick Husband, radioed down some words of remembrance. Okay, well then we've got uh, an announcement that we'd like to make on behalf of the SS 107 crew. And it goes like this. It is today that we remember and honor the crews of Apollo 1 and Challenger. They made the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives and service to their country and for all mankind. Their dedication and devotion to the exploration of space was an inspiration to each of us and still motivates people around the world to achieve great things in service to others. As we orbit the Earth, we will join the entire NASA family for a moment of silence in their memory. Our thoughts and prayers go to their families as well. Rick Husband, the commander of the Space Shuttle Columbia, on January 28, 2003, commemorating the loss of Apollo 1 and Challenger, the ultimate sacrifice, as he put it. Jerry Lininger, a uh, shuttle veteran, a uh, man who spent a good deal of time aboard Mir, joining us now. It's hard to listen to those words, isn't it, Jerry? Yeah, very hard. Uh, I think every astronaut feels the same way, though. You know, there's a lot of people that have gone before us, uh, and the people have the courage to do the things that they did. Uh, they know the danger, and uh, we're all proud of them. What, um, you know, the, the risks are so well known to the astronauts and their families, and yet um, many Americans really don't have a sense of it, do they? You, I know you talk to people all the time. Uh, do you get the sense uh, that people had this feeling that it was almost a routine type of operation? I think they do, Miles, and, and especially the re-entry. I think the, the liftoff people realize, wow, look at the power. They know it's a dangerous operation, but the re-entry very dynamic, you're right on the edge of the envelope, you're bouncing hard, fireball around you. Uh, any astronaut, any person that's ever been through that experience knows that you are very close to disaster. And it's just the nature of what we do out in space. Well, what you're unleashing is this tremendous potential energy 
Uh, and that clearly is the focus, it gets a lot of people's attention, including even the layman would understand that that is a difficult thing. Let's talk about reentry, though, for a moment. A time, as you say, when perhaps uh, our guard is let down a little bit. It nevertheless, uh, when you're going from 17,500 miles an hour over the Indian Ocean to uh, zero at the end of the runway, uh, there's a lot of things happening in between, aren't there? A lot of things happening. Shuttle is at the point of the problem today, uh, is under computer control and very fine computer control and you sort of rock the shuttle back and forth as you come down um, during re-entry and that sort of dissipates some of the heat, lets some of the stress off. Um, but it's a very dynamic process, all starting with the shuttle actually going upside down and backwards, firing the engines as you mentioned halfway around the world then getting wings level and then starting to hit some of the atmosphere and as you get lower and lower you hit more and more atmosphere and even though the speed is decreasing uh, you're hitting you know a wall essentially and you're diving down into it and it really heats up. It's um, it, Give us a sense of what that ride is like as you, you could do these big broad S turns. It's a very severe maneuver isn't it? Uh, the maneuver is not so severe it's just the whole shuttle uh, I remember my first flight, the commander who very experienced, Dick Richards, uh, he, he, as we're coming down, bouncing around, his, he turns around and looks at me and his eyes are this big and just <laughs> says, wow, Jerry, isn't this, you know, wild ride. And here's an experienced uh, naval aviator off aircraft carriers all his life. So I think anyone, again, that experiences that, it is just one very dynamic ride. I said it sounded like a locomotive train going to run me down, you know, right behind me. And again, my first flight, I sort of looked over my shoulder to make sure it wasn't a train. And that's the normal reentry. So, um, you know, if anything goes a little bit wrong, uh, it can be tragic. And, you know, that's what happened today. Well, and, and give us a sense, because while you're inside that uh, flight deck and you're looking outside, you're seeing very c conclusive evidence of the amount of heat which envelops a space shuttle. It is all around you. Uh, you look out, actually the back window you could see it too, and it's, it's sort of a collapsing, um, kind of a northern lights look. Everything very fluid, plasma moving around, and it is just, you know, orange, red, big fireball all around you. Um, so, you know, obviously when things did not go well and once one piece comes off uh, and you lose control, there's a lot of dynamic pressure, a lot of heat. And that's what you saw in all the films that you're looking at with the different segments coming off, heating up, and uh, multiple explosions, if you will. That's just debris going through uh, a heat tunnel. Now, and the way that uh, the, the orbiter's um, airframe is protected, it is, after all, made of aluminum, which would certainly melt in, the, in that, if it encountered that level of heat. The way it is done is with um, lots of blankets, thermal blankets, but uh, more importantly, especially on the bottom side, those black tiles which are designed, um, they're ceramic, uh, they're designed to absorb and shed the heat and protect the shuttle. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a fragile system in a sense, isn't it? It is, Miles. If you ever felt one of those tiles, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. It kind of feels like a piece of uh, styrofoam. It is that light. Uh, but you put a blowtorch on one end and you put your hand on the other side and you don't feel the heat. So. You know, the engineers came up with an incredible product there. Uh, and again, we don't know exactly what happened. All I can tell you, though, is the, the belly of the shuttle is well protected. But if you get in the wrong orientation at any moment during that reentry, uh, you are not protected on all sides. And so, um, you know, once you start coming apart, there's, there's nothing you can do. So what's your, a possibility then to look at would be if somehow the, the shuttle was not in the uh, perfect ideal orientation for some reason. That obviously would be high in the list of things that uh, investigators would probe. I'm sure they'll, they'll look very closely at that. They'll also look at some uh, better film. Uh, hopefully we had some telescopes pointing that way. Usually you follow the shuttle in. You might be able to see that initial moment where things uh, you know, came apart. I think software, some of the control systems, guidance and control systems may have failed and get you in slightly the wrong orientation. 
The other thing you mentioned during liftoff, a piece of debris possibly hitting the shuttle, if you have a spot that's exposed to that extreme heat and it melts through the shell and then hits a control surface, uh, you can get in trouble very quickly. Um, all those things will be looked at very hard, I'm sure. Try to put the debris field together, try to look for clues and evidence to, to make sure it never happens again. And I, you know, I guarantee uh, the astronauts on board want us to keep pressing this thing and to keep going back to space and to, uh, to make the improvements and not make their sacrifice uh, something that's in vain. So I'm sure they want us to put the pieces together, figure out what went wrong and press on. Let's, uh, I, we should remind our viewers that we're uh, 20 minutes past the time uh, appointed for Sean O'Keefe to speak. Uh, we do expect a statement from the NASA Administrator from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida where he was to be to welcome back the crew uh, any minute now. We will bring it to you the moment it begins. Looking over my shoulder, still not there yet. Jerry, um, <coughs> as we uh, get into um, this uh, scenario of something um, falling off during ascent, we want to be careful because it is so early and um, it, it, I, I hate to get too far down the road of speculation, but it, it is common knowledge that there was a piece that fell off that external tank, struck some portion of the um, Let's go, I'll tell you what, we're going to go to the press conference right now. Let's go to the Kennedy Space Center live now via NASA TV. about STS-107. We will have no questions today, just a few brief remarks. Uh, as indicated uh, earlier, we'll make a statement uh, today and then at this point and a little later this afternoon at about 3 o'clock um, Eastern Time, there'll be a full technical briefing conducted from the Johnson Space Center. Uh, so at this point, we're just going to give you the, the, the circumstances we understand them leading up to this particular tragedy today. This is indeed a tragic day for the NASA family, for the families of the astronauts who flew on STS-107, and likewise tragic for the nation. Immediately upon indication of a loss of communications on STS-107, uh, at a little after 9 a.m. this morning, we began our contingency plan to preserve all the information relative to the flight activities. I immediately advised the President uh, and the Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Tom Ridge, uh, at the point after landing was due to have occurred at 9.16, spoke to them very briefly thereafter. Uh, to advise that we had lost contact with the Shuttle Orbiter Columbia and STS-107 crew. They offered, the President specifically offered, full and immediate support uh, to determine what the appropriate steps were thereafter to be taken. Uh, we then spent the next hour and a half working through the detail and information of what we have received uh, and uh, uh, Bill Reedy will walk you through the specifics of those operational and technical issues here in just a moment. Thereafter, we have met with the family members of the astronauts who uh, were here at Kennedy Space Center and are soon to be departing to back to Johnston, to Houston. Uh, the President has called and spoken to them to express uh, our deepest national regrets. We have assured them that we will begin the process immediately uh, to recover their loved ones and understand the cause of this tragedy. At this time, we have no indication that the mishap was caused by anything or anyone on the ground. We've assembled a mishap investigation team that immediately was assembled uh, upon the point of past the stage in which the orbiter was to have landed here at Kennedy Space Center uh, a little after 9.30 and that team in turn uh, is coordinating on a regular basis on all the facts that are pertaining to this from the Johnson Space Center and a rapid response team from here at the Kennedy Space Center as well as participants from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In addition to these internal efforts, we have also appointed a mishap investigation board, an external group uh, of people who are independent from NASA, who will immediately be charged with the opportunity to look at all the information that was uh, immediately uh, locked down right after uh, our f uh, absence of communications. Each of these individuals 
are safety and mission assurance related officials in other federal departments of the federal government, uh, from the Air Force, from the Navy, from the Department of Transportation, and across the federal expanse. The investigation team will also be chaired by an individual contacted uh, to serve who is external to the federal uh, agencies. Uh, and we'll have the opportunity to coordinate all the information again from an external view. So we'll be conducting both the internal activity uh, as well as a external review immediately to ascertain the causes and uh, circumstances under which this tragedy occurred. We pulled together all the federal agencies and local governments as well. Uh, in discussion several times this morning with Secretary Tom Ridge, uh, the effort is heavily underway to coordinate uh, an understanding of uh, exactly where uh, the orbiter uh, path had taken it from West Texas uh, towards uh, the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. Uh, and to make sure that the material on the ground is secured uh, so that the investigation can begin uh, promptly. We would urge anyone who believes they have discovered or found any material to stay away from it and to please contact local officials, the local first responder groups for emergency services and so forth uh, have been authorized and directed by Secretary Tom Ridge to assist in all manner. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is coordinating that effort on part of the Department of Homeland Security. It's here this morning with the families of the astronauts and their friends. It started out as a pretty happy morning awaiting the landing of STS-107. And we had highly anticipated their return because we couldn't wait to congratulate them for their extraordinary performance and their excellent efforts on the science mission on this very important flight. They dedicated their lives to pushing the scientific challenges for all of us here on Earth. And they dedicated themselves to that objective and did it with a happy heart, willingly, and with great enthusiasm. The loss of this Valiant crew is something we will never be able to get over, and certainly the families of all of them, we have assured we will do everything, everything we can possibly do to guarantee that they work their way through this horrific tragedy. We ask the members of the media to honor that too. Please respect their privacy and please understand the tragedy that they are going through at this time. We will help the media assure that be the case as well. We trust that the prayers of the nation will be with them and with their families. And again, a more courageous group of people you could not have hoped to know than the families of these crew members. And an extraordinary, extraordinary group of astronauts who gave their lives and did it in a way that they knew exactly the risk but never in a, ever do we ever want to see a circumstance where something like this could ever happen and we diligently dedicate ourselves every single day to assuring these things don't occur and when they do we have to act responsibly accountably and that's exactly what we will do to give you more of the operational detail of what has occurred here uh, uh, since 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, the Associate Administrator for Space Flight, a former astronaut, retired Captain of the United States Navy, former test, pilot, uh, test of flight pilot, uh, Bill Reedy, uh, who has commanded uh, two separate missions uh, previously and uh, as an astronaut and is now uh, again, our Associate Administrator for Space Flight has worked with me all morning along with all of us here at Kennedy Space Center uh, to work through the details of, uh, of the events as we know them and to present to you the facts that we understand them. Again, the technical details that are being worked very diligently now will be covered again at 3 p.m. this afternoon out of the Johnson Space Center. With that, let me turn it over to Captain Bill Reedy.
it's a truly difficult day for all of us. Uh, many of us were standing alongside the runway waiting to celebrate their triumphant return after a 16-day science mission. I think you could tell from the downlink that they loved what they were doing and they thought what they were doing was extremely important, pushing back those boundaries in uh, science. At 9 o'clock, we heard that they had lost data from the spacecraft and it appears that that was at about 200,000 feet, about Mach 18. The loss of data was somewhere over north central Texas. And at the planned landing time of 916, we initiated our contingency action plan called the Rescue Coordination Center and initiated a search and rescue effort. Sadly, I think from the video that's available, does not appear that there were any survivors. We have currently impounded all the data, including all the pre-flight certification of flight readiness for STS-107. And at this point, I'd have to say it's too early to speculate about the exact cause. Obviously, we're looking at all the data that we have available. Those people that have videos, those people that have still pictures, uh, we'll urge you to contact NASA so that we can coordinate those things that might be available. And to reiterate what the administrator said, those people that may find debris, do not touch it, do not move it. Contact your local authorities, have them impound it and secure the area so that our technical specialists will be able to piece together uh, the puzzle so that we can resolve what happened. Our immediate focus is on the crew families and we spent some time with them. The president called. I'd have to say the families are bearing up with uh, an incredible amount of dignity considering their loss. We all grieve for them. We all pray with them for the crew. But one thing came across loud and clear when visiting with them is they knew that the crew was absolutely dedicated to the mission that they were performing. And I think you could see that in the video downlink. They believed in what they were doing. And in the conversations with the crew and their families, they said that we must find what happened and fix it and move on. And we can't let their sacrifice be in vain. Today was a very stark reminder that this is a very risky endeavor, pushing back the frontiers in outer space and after 113 flights, unfortunately, people have a tendency to look at it as something that is more or less routine. Well, I can assure you it is not. Each and every time I flew, each and every time my colleagues flew, we treated that with the respect that it deserved from a professional standpoint. And I have to say that as the one responsible for shuttle and station within the NASA, that I know that the people of NASA did everything possible preparing for this flight to make it as perfect as possible. My promise to the crew and to the crew families is that the investigation that we have just launched will find the cause, will fix it, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Yeah, we know you all have questions, and we will have a news briefing at 3 o'clock, and we'll give you that opportunity at that time. Thank you. We just heard uh, finally there from Lisa Malone, public affairs officer with the uh, Kennedy Space Center in, uh, at NASA. Uh, she was preceded uh, by Bill Reedy the Associated Administrator for Human Space Flight, uh, who was himself preceded by the Administrator of NASA, Sean O'Keefe, uh, telling us uh, where the investigation is headed and um, offering some reminders of the risks uh, involved in all of this. Um, an independent um, investigative team is already being assembled, which will look at this entire thing outside um, the federal government with some uh, impartiality 
and come to some conclusions as to what might have caused uh, Columbia to break up in flight over Texas, hurtling along at Mach 18, we now know, 200,000 feet. Um, Bill Reedy saying, I, I can assure you we will find the cause, fix it, and we will move on. Um, it was almost three years from the Challenger explosion to the return to flight, Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, just to put that in perspective for you, two years and, and a healthy dose of a third uh, before NASA flew again. And uh, these kinds of things, depending on uh, what it is determined it is, uh, do take that long before NASA uh, and the country, for that matter, can feel comfortable uh, with moving ahead with uh, piloted space flight. The 113th mission of the space shuttle fleet and the second now to end in catastrophe, this time at the end of the mission, not uh, immediately after launch. We are going to hear uh, additional technical information, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, and I don't know who exactly is going to be participating in that news conference, but we will, of course, bring you that. That's coming up an hour and a half from now. We've had an opportunity to um, isolate for you uh, the precise moment when Mission Control first had a sense that there was a problem. The communication loss, the loss of data, so-called telemetry on those computer screens. Uh, if we have that ready to go, uh, let's, let's listen in at the, to that moment and you can see um, how the conversation played out. Columbia continuing uh, toward Florida, now approaching the New Mexico-Texas border. Altitude. 40 miles, speed 13,200 miles per hour, range to touchdown 1,400 miles, the shuttle in the left bank with wings angled about uh, 57 degrees to horizontal. You're listening, by the way, to James Hartsfield, public affairs officer. And Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages, and we did not copy your last. Roger. Uh, That's it. Roger, and then uh, mid-communication, nothing. Let's wait a mo another moment here. Tire pressure, tire pressure will obviously be something we'll be looking at. Um, space shuttle um, tires are under tremendous high pressure. Uh, they're uh, filled with uh, nitrogen and inert gas. Um, that might be one area where people they will be exploring. As we've been telling you, one of the keys for those people in mission control and all of this is preservation of the data. Uh, the moment something like this happens, they, they're supposed to capture what exists on their screens, uh, gather any notes, any notes, uh, anything on paper, put it all together, box it up, and, and put it in a place where it can be ultimately viewed by those who will be leading this investigation. That, that process still continues at Mission Control in Houston. Matter of fact, we have a live picture there of Mission Control. You can see that they're still at their consoles there. Uh, long now after uh, the loss of the space shuttle Columbia. Jerry Leninger, uh, I hope you had an opportunity to hear Sean O'Keefe and Bill Reedy. Did you not? Uh, yes, I did. And, uh, you know, Bill's a good guy, and yeah, I'm sure everyone's doing everything they can. Yeah, uh, th th that point about uh, finding it, uh, fixing it, and moving on. I, can you, in, in this dark, dark moment, can you offer us some, ass uh, some insurance that that is, in fact, going to happen? Well, I, I think based on the people that I worked with at NASA and the whole organization, the professionalism that they show, um, you know, we got other people who are going to follow in their footsteps and, and you don't want to repeat uh, a day like today. And so I, I have 100% assurance in my heart that uh, people are going to look at it as hard as they can and really try to get to the root of what caused this tragedy today. 
tire pressure indications. What what are we if I just should we make it, should we do anything? Uh, should we make anything of that? Do you think? You know, I think any abnormality that was, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the tile or uh, an object hitting possibly the orbiter during launch, they're going to look through every part of that mission, any uh, indication that there was some kind of problem. Uh, tire pressure sounds like a, a minor thing, but uh, perhaps not. I mean, the tires are protected, obviously, during re-entry. Uh, and if the tire pressure is increasing, you know, uh, heat expands things. And so if that was the case, uh, possibly there was a, a problem in that critical area. Um, you know, well, you look that, at all the data, you look at anything slightly off, and you try to make sense of it. If those tires were heated up, they exploded, certainly that would uh, take the doors off and uh, expose the um, underbody of the shuttle, which, of course, it would be extremely vulnerable at that point. Hydraulic lines going through there, that sort of thing. That's correct, Miles. So again, if uh, when you're trying to piece this thing together, you'll look at any abnormality, uh, try to put the whole picture together, look at the debris. Um, unfortunately, the debris, of course, is going to have re-entered itself, so you're going to have a lot of molten metal, and it's going to be very hard uh, to put those pieces back together. But you try to piece it together, and then you try to come up with what caused the problem. And as Bill Reedy just said, you fix it and you press on. Let's uh, talk for a moment, uh, go back to the beginning of the mission, and um, this piece that uh, apparently fell off, uh, the external tank, whether it was a piece of ice or a piece of foam, maybe a little bit of both. I don't know if we still have that tape in the, in the gate ready for air, but uh, we can talk about it nonetheless. What happened was there was a piece that fell and struck the left wing. Um, what, um, without getting uh, too far down the road here as well, uh, that obviously is an area that will be looked at. The, the, they knew about it shortly after launch, looked at that and determined uh, after some excruciating uh, analysis that there wasn't a great deal of concern as best I could discern. I, I know you weren't plugged into the engineering analysis of that, but uh, this is in general a big area of concern at NASA. Sure. Uh, you know, if you ever, you've been to the pad, I know, Miles, but a lot of people don't appreciate the fact just the sound wave bouncing off the ground and back up can, can shake the shuttle and damage things. And so there's a flush of water, literally a, a flood of water that goes on underneath the launch pad, not to dissipate the heat, but to absorb some of the sound because all that sound waves come back could shake the shuttle. Uh, ice forming on the external tank has been a problem in the past. That breaks loose during the flight. Uh, during liftoff. So all those things are looked at very carefully. Um, the good news on that, I guess, is that they have some cameras positioned down there, very good cameras that are looking very closely. And again, the analysis 16 days ago was that it looks like it didn't do anything that's of concern. Um, bottom of the shuttle, you can't afford to lose a tile or two. Um, it depends on the, the area. Uh, but you can get back in even with some tiles off if it's not in a critical area. So. You know, you look at it, but I'm sure they're going to re-examine that and look even harder now at that whole situation. All right. Jerry, uh, I would appreciate it if you could sit still for us for just a little bit, stay close. Uh, we're joined here in Atlanta by Randy Avera, who uh, was uh, an engineer with the shuttle program uh, in the dark days of the Challenger era. Um, Mr. Avera, good to have you with us. Good to be here, Miles. Uh, take us back to those days, the investigation, the, um, the way the investigation was conducted, and try to relate that to what's happening right now. Well, we were always working very hard to provide the most perfect orbiter and space shuttle vehicle for launch. Uh, a tremendous amount of test and checkout is involved, and of course training and crew readiness. And uh, on the day of the crash, as today, everyone was very disappointed, very shocked and grieved and you have to pick up your spirits and do the work. As uh, John Young, one of the astronauts, the commander of the first mission has always said, just do your job. And it's time now for NASA and the American people and people around the world that support space exploration to do our jobs. There's gonna be a lot of forensic science that's gonna be required to do a thorough investigation of this particular accident. And the, the Space Shuttle Orbiter is a very complex design of electrical, software, mechanical systems and structures and flight dynamics that are similar to the X-15 
uh, experimental aircraft that flew during the 1960s. Of course, so, one, one key difference with the X-15 is the X-15's body itself was designed to sort of shed its heat. Uh, this, uh, the shuttle has those tiles, and that's a di little different system, isn't it? It's a, a quite complex and integrated system. There are about five different types of insulators, uh, high temperature, m medium temperature, and low temperature uh, capabilities of insulation. Uh, a breach of any of those insulators can cause immediate damage to the substrate or structure below that, and that would directly affect the margins of safety of the structure and the flight loads that are applied and what the stresses on the vehicle are, but it's important to realize that NASA has already executed a plan to look at the evidence, document the facts, bring in the laboratories and scientific equipment to do a thorough analysis to know exactly what the facts are. Speculation is the first step in being inaccurate. And we learned back in the very first days of the Challenger crash investigation that what we thought had happened with the main engines of the shuttle, the cryogenic hydrogen oxygen engines in the rear of the orbiter, in fact were not the problem. And we also had wrong uh, impressions about the fate of the crew as far as the crew module flight dynamics in a ballistic trajectory and whether or not the crew was alive or had an opportunity if they had the proper equipment to do an ejection or a bailout. What do you think, um, it, we've, we've said this earlier and it should be pointed out, there, there are no, there's no ejection system on the space shuttle. Uh, that was uh, ruled impractical and too expensive early on in the program. Uh, there, there is a bailout technique which the crew performs and practices frequently in the course of their training, but in this case that was not an option, was it? You're correct, Miles. Uh, in the first early flights, five or six flights of Columbia, there were two ejection seats and the flight crews were limited to two astronaut pilots. Those were seats that are similar to the SR-71 Blackbird ejection seats. Those were decommissioned when the shuttle was deemed operational. And currently what we have is a system that as a NASA engineer I had worked on at Kennedy Space Center, the barber pole bailout system, but that system is really only good for orbiter flight modes where the wings are level and the airspeed is under 200 knots, uh, under 250 knots. And that's for uh, blowing the side hatch off of the orbiter crew module, uh, deploying the telescoping barber pole and then doing a one at a time sequential bailout with parachutes on their backs of the crew. But at these very high altitudes and very high Mach numbers of Mach 18 at 12,000 feet, that's not practical or even reasonable. And the pole is there to keep them simply, the person bailing out from striking the leading edge of the wing, we should point out to our viewers, that's why they slide down a pole. But this, as we say, not an option. Uh, Randy, if you could just walk us through quickly uh, sort of in areas of, in your mind, a priority, if you were conducting this investigation, where you'd start looking first down, down the list of priorities? Well, the first step is to secure the data in the centers of uh, NASA centers around the country. That data is very important. Uh, paperwork, uh, digital data that could be recorded. Uh, also to secure the crash site and to have no contamination whatsoever of that crash site. Uh, weather could play a factor. We had the Atlantic Ocean, the salt water of the ocean and the currents uh, dealing with debris on the surface of the Gulf Stream headed northbound and other debris that was down on the bottom of the ocean floor. So all of this apparently being on the landmass in Texas is important to have weather conditions that are tolerable but to do a, an immediate preservation of this evidence and to collect it in a professional and accurate way documentation is everything and tracking of the of the samples that will go to many labs for chemical and uh, mechanical and structural analysis is extremely important. Randy Avera, former NASA engineer, we'd like you to stay close if you could as well. Uh, we would appreciate that. We appreciate having your expertise here. Let's, um, let's get a recap for folks who maybe just be dipping into the story. Let's take it over to uh, Darren Kagan. Darren? Yeah, Miles, we're going to handle this in two ways. Of course, this is a developing story. We're going to keep moving it forward, but we do realize that there are people who are tuning in as we go, and so we do want to recap so that you know the exact amount of information we know up to this point involving the Space Shuttle Columbia. We begin with NASA's oldest shuttle. It broke up this morning as it descended over Central Texas. The shuttle was on its way toward a planned landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have video to show you. It's from our affiliate WFAA in Dallas.
it will show you multiple vapor trails as the shuttle was breaking up. Now, as you're watching this, the altitude was just over 200,000 feet. Seven astronauts on board, they included six Americans and the first Israeli ever in space, payload specialist Ilan Ramon. Debris fell over a very wide area from near the Dallas area to the Texas-Louisiana border. People as far east as Shreveport, Louisiana reported seeing and feeling an explosion as the shuttle broke apart. NASA is setting up an independent board trying to determine exactly what happened. This is indeed a tragic day for the NASA family, for the families of the astronauts who flew on STS-107, and likewise tragic for the nation. That from a news conference you uh, saw live if you were with us in the last hour here on CNN, the first one that NASA has put out. They are saying another one about 3 p.m. Eastern where they will take questions. Of course, you're going to see that live right here on CNN. As we mentioned, Columbia, the oldest in the shuttle fleet, first launched back in 1981. It was on its 28th mission. We are covering this story all across the world from Israel here to the States and across the States. And Judy Woodruff is in Washington, D.C. with more. Judy. Thanks, Darren. Uh, we are keeping uh, an eye on the story here very much here in Washington. With me uh, in the studio is uh, uh, CNN's Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us. And Patty, you've got a little more information about what the Federal Aviation Administration is doing to collect and preserve the debris. Uh, that is scattered over several states. Well, what the Federal Aviation Administration has done is it's uh, put in effect a temporary flight restriction over Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, what it has done is a, anything within a 60 mile radius of Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, and below 3,000 feet, no planes allowed in that area. FAA trying to keep planes out of the way of, of anybody who may be involved in a recovery effort there for debris, trying to protect that uh, debris. And, and let those, uh, re those, those teams do their work and not have anybody get in the way. Also, uh, we're told that Homeland Security Chief Tom Ridge has designated the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as the lead agency to coordinate response and recovery of debris. Now, Ridge has called officials uh, in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, warning them about possible debris and uh, uh, trying to make sure that they preserve that debris uh, so that this investigation uh, can take place and they can piece together just what happened here. Patty, it's our understanding that uh, Tom Ridge has been contacting uh, uh, the governors. Uh, you mentioned Arizona, New Mexico. He's obviously also been in contact in Texas where it's assumed the flight broke up. Uh, Oklahoma, as well as Louisiana, where you mentioned the, uh, uh, there's an effort now to, to restrict the airspace. We've also seen news reports of people in Arkansas who saw an explosion and presumably may see debris. So we, we are talking potentially uh, four or five states involved here. We're talking here. Yeah, a huge debris field. This uh, shuttle appears to have broken up at about 200,000 feet in the air. Now, if you consider uh, how, fl how far up a, a, a normal commercial aircraft normally flies, 35 to 40,000 feet, uh, would have a wide debris field. Imagine how wide at 200,000 feet in the air uh, these pieces would be flying. So it definitely will be a multi-state effort. No question about it. Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us, and Patty mentioned Tom Ridge, the new director, uh, new secretary of the new department, first secretary of the new department of Homeland Security. Of course, so much of his attention has been focused on keeping the country safe in the aftermath of 9-11. Now, of course, he's dealing with a very different uh, kind of tragedy, but one that will require all of his attention as well. You can imagine uh, this happening on a Saturday morning here in Washington. This is a city tourists always flock to. One of the most, if not the most popular museum in Washington is the Air and Space Museum, part of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, there with us uh, on the scene is our own Bob Frank. And Bob, and I assume you've been talking to tourists and others who uh, uh, have to be as deeply affected by this as we are. If not more, uh, these were people who uh, were coming to the Air and Space Museum. This is one of the most popular exhibits, of course. It is the Columbia Shuttle Exhibit. You can see in back of me the NASA feed. You can see the replica of the shuttle in back of me, and you can see pockets of people. As the briefing was going on, there was this somber, very sad look, and of course we still have other people here who have been um, uh, coming here to visit, almost like they're coming to a shrine. And among them have been people from Israel Israel. Your name, sir? Ziv. Z-I-V. Ziv. And, and, tell me, and tell me how you must feel. 
That's a great loss. It's a tragedy. Um, as an Israeli, I mourn and grieve with the families and the friends of the crew that was lost, of course, with the Israeli and American people. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad day, but I hope in the future it'll, it'll have a more successful ending than this one. Your country was celebrating because of the inclusion of this aspect. That is true. Uh, everybody was very excited back at home, and this was a very bad ending for uh, what could have been a great day. And among those who are here are uh, many young people. Uh, one of the ambitions always has been to be an astronaut. Uh, well, how do you feel? I think that it's a terrible loss, and I just pray for the astronauts' families that that, it's, that they should just, it's just a loss. And I just pray that they just be happy for them. <laughs> just be happy. And here's your, here's your mom. How did you tell him this morning? Well, actually, we heard about it. Um, we were at Arlington Cemetery here, and we watched it on the news, and then we were headed over here anyway. So, um, like you said, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, um, so many few people take for granted. We just all of a sudden think, oh, another shuttle's gone up in the air. It's something that we just take for granted anymore, and it's not, it's not something to take for granted at all. Had your son ever expressed the desire to be an astronaut? It's almost every child's dream. Well, they all say that at some time, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, unfortunately, uh, we had a great loss today, but uh, we need to learn from this and move forward. Thank you very much. What you're hearing, of course, is a very typical of the reaction you will get here. A reaction that you will get around the country, reaction around the world. Uh, here in Washington, of course, Judy, people have a place to come to, to express that reaction. What amounts to, as I said, a bit of a shrine to the tragedy that occurred earlier this morning. Judy? All right, Bob Franken at the Air and Space Museum here in Washington. And, Bob, we have just learned that President Bush will address the nation uh, from the White House, from the Cabinet Room, uh, in just a few minutes. It's about three minutes before 2 Eastern time, we're told. The President will speak to the nation at 2 o'clock. Let's bring in our White House correspondent, Suzanne Malveaux, who's been at her post all morning. Suzanne, I know they've been... Uh, planning, making plans, but just now they've made the big announcement. Well, absolutely. We saw a couple of hours ago President Bush, who arrived back here at the White House, returning from Camp David, cutting that trip short. Uh, we saw him enter the residence and then onto the Oval Office with his Chief of Staff, Andy Card. We were told that he was notified of this tragedy. Uh, shortly after it happened in that 1030, he spoke with the director of NASA about the details of all of this. He uh, came back to the White House to better monitor the situation. Uh, Judy, as you know, the White House, um, the, the flag here lowered at half-staff just a few hours ago, uh, very uh, symbolic of the, the tragedy here, recognizing that tragedy. Uh, as you may recall, this is really a time for, for comfort, to comfort the nation as well as to inform, uh, to mourn the lost uh, when, uh, when it was uh, January 28th, uh, 1986, when uh, President Ronald Reagan had this uh, very sad duty. He went just hours after the Challenger had exploded, and he said, I want to read this line to you. This is the last line that he delivered in his speech to the nation saying, we will never forget them nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Uh, clearly this is a very important moment for the president, uh, a need to confront, to comfort the nation and also to talk about the sense of bravery, um, the, the sense of dedication that these people had aboard the shuttle. We have also learned that the president has spoken with Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon. Uh, as you know, one of those aboard the shuttle was an Israeli citizen, uh, giving his condolences, passing that along to Israel as well. Judy? Suzanne, you're, you are absolutely right. This is one of the most important uh, uh, jobs uh, functions that a president can perform. Uh, not only is the president the leader of the country, the one who is the uh, making uh, decisions uh, day in and day out, but the president must be the uh, consoler in chief at a time like this, a time of great loss, of great tragedy, and you do remind us of uh, the role that President Reagan played. In 1986, the nation shocked because at that time it was the first space accident in uh, something like 20 years. America was was uh, completely uh, rocked back on its heels by the by the idea uh, that there would be astronauts lost in space. And I remember because I was covering uh, covering the Challenger explosion. Then I was working for the public broadcasting system for PBS, 
And uh, President Reagan's remarks played an enormous role in holding the country and bringing the country together. And uh, the line that you, uh, that you quoted, uh, slipping the surly bonds of earth, is one that I think all of us remember. I have every reason to believe that uh, President Bush uh, and the people around him remember that and are acutely aware of the important role that the president plays at a time like this. Again, it is just after 2 o'clock Eastern Time. We are expecting any moment to hear from President Bush. He will be addressing the nation from the cabinet room there in the White House. Suzanne, when this happened, the president was at Camp David uh, planning to spend the weekend there after a very difficult week dealing with uh, Iraq. Absolutely, Judy. This is really a pivotal weekend for the president, as you know, Secretary of State Colin Powell, to go before the United Nations Security Council on Wednesday to present the case against Saddam Hussein, additional evidence. This administration, under a great deal of pressure from some U.S. allies who want to see more information, more evidence uh, to, that would justify the possibility of using military action against Saddam Hussein, already the president really having quite a full plate this weekend. I should also mention as well, Judy, just kind of a sign of the times, uh, one of the assumptions that so many people made when they first saw that this uh, shuttle was missing, that they had lost contact, was uh, terrorism. That was something that people were thinking about. In 1986, that was not necessarily the first thought on everyone's mind. Uh, clearly, this White House, as well as many people, aware of the possibilities of the danger, but senior administration officials telling us there is no indication that that was the cause of this tragedy today. Judy. All right, Suzanne, as we said, we are waiting for President Bush to speak to the nation from the White House, from the Cabinet Room. And uh, again, as we wait uh, for his remarks, uh, my colleague Miles O'Brien, who's been with us all morning. Miles, I, even at this moment, I have a sense that, uh, you know, there was an enormous reluctance in 1986 when the Challenger exploded. Uh, for people, nobody even wanted to think about going back into space again at that point. But you do have the sense now that Americans have somehow, as horrible as this is, we have come, somehow come to, uh, to the realization that spaceflight is dangerous. We will lose people from time to time. No one is saying we won't go into space again. Well, let's remember who was aboard Challenger. Krista McAuliffe, civilian, teacher. That, that launch, that tragedy was witnessed by school children all across this country. It was devastating for so many people and particularly for children. And there was a certain poignance to that uh, which made it a little more difficult, I think, for people to, to uh, handle. Uh, the sense of a, of a civilian on board that shuttle not fully appreciating the risks, in this case, a crew completely made up of test pilot types, engineers, career astronauts who fully understand the risk. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Perhaps the fact that school children the world over were not necessarily witnessing what we just saw this morning. Perhaps that changes things. Um, as we look at Mission Control Houston, this is a remarkable scene here. You're seeing the good people of NASA whose job it is to watch a space shuttle while it is in orbit from those consoles. Every last little technical item on a shuttle has a readout on a screen down here so that they know precisely what is going on at any given moment. Someone asked me earlier, is there a black box on the shuttle? That room is the black box. There is a constant stream of data to that room giving them a full sense of what's happening to every last piece, every last system of a space shuttle. Right now that team, which has spent the better part of the morning collecting its data, gathering up its data in order to prepare for an investigation, is now ready for what we are ready for, which is the President of the United States, who has returned to the White House, will be addressing those good folks at NASA who work so hard to make space travel, uh, while risky, a reasonable thing to do, and the rest of the nation. Let's listen to the President. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. At 9 o'clock this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. On board was a crew of seven. 
Colonel Rick Husband, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Anderson, Commander Laurel Clark, Captain David Brown, Commander William McCool, Dr. Kulpna Shavla, and Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. These men and women assumed great risk in the service to all humanity. In an age when space flight has come to seem almost routine, it is easy to overlook the dangers of travel by rocket and the difficulties of navigating the fierce outer atmosphere of the Earth. These astronauts knew the dangers, and they faced them willingly, knowing they had a high and noble purpose in life. Because of their courage and daring and idealism, we will miss them all the more. All Americans today are thinking as well of the families of these men and women who have been given this sudden shock and grief. You're not alone. Our entire nation grieves with you. And those you loved will always have the respect and gratitude of this country. The cause in which they died will continue. Mankind is led into the darkness beyond our world by the inspiration of discovery and the longing to understand. Our journey into space will go on. In the skies today, we saw destruction and tragedy. Yet farther than we can see, there is comfort and hope. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The same creator who names the stars also knows the names of the seven souls we mourn today. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, yet we can pray that all are safely home. May God bless the grieving families, and may God, may God continue to bless America. President Bush, uh, after returning from Camp David uh, to the White House, up oh, he's coming back. Let's listen in. All right, we've obviously lost the signal uh, from the president, and um, we'll try to figure out what that's all about in just a bit. But um, we know they uh, didn't return safety, safely to Earth, he said, but we know they are home. Uh, president Bush uh, touching a chord today of sympathy for uh, the family members who lost their loved ones. Um, in mission control, they, they stood at rapt attention for the president as he address the nation and address them. They too feeling the loss there as we look at the scene there at Mission Control. Judy Woodruff, um, it's a difficult thing for a president to address a nation at this moment, isn't it? It certainly is. And Miles, you know, right now coming uh, in the midst of the crisis uh, the United States uh, faces, the decision the president faces uh, with regard to whether to go to, to war with Iraq. Um, this was the last thing, I think, on the minds of, uh, in all fairness, of the people uh, who work with the president uh, closely day in and day out. It was, of course, it was the last thing on all of our minds. Everyone has come to assume once again over the last 17 years that space flight uh, is, is as safe as it possibly can be. Uh, we are reminded again today that it is um, uh, subject to error uh, of what kind we don't know. Uh, but uh, it is, this is a day when the presidents, I, I think it's fair to say, earn their pay because he had to make that, those calls to the families of the seven astronauts, uh, which has to be the hardest thing that any president ever has to do. You know, if you read, if you read anything of history, you know uh, uh, the presidents who speak to the, to the widows of those lost in combat. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it is a job that none of us uh, would, would covet. Indeed, indeed. Finding the right words and, and hearkening back to those uh, words of, of Ronald Reagan, 
um, which are, are as poignant today as they were in 1986, uh, we will never forget them, nor uh, the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for the journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Uh, uh, George W. Bush um, using the same sorts of parallels and symbolism and analogy and reference to faith at this terrible moment of tragedy and mourning here in the United States as the, uh, it becomes evident that the space shuttle Columbia and her crew of seven is now lost. Let's um, listen in one more time to that moment in mission control, that last transmission. Everything seemed to be going routine. You'll hear the voice of James Hartsfield, public affairs officer for NASA in Houston, as well as some um, air to ground communication at the other end in the shuttle is uh, Rick Husband, the commander of the space shuttle. Let's, oh, let's, and let's um, listen in on that. Uh, toward Florida, now approaching the New Mexico, Texas border. Altitude 40 miles. Speed 13,200 miles per hour. Range to touch down 1,400 miles. The shuttle in the left bank with wings angled about uh, 57 degrees to horizontal. Houston, we see your tire pressure messages, and we did not copy your last. Roger. Uh, staff at the White House. A nation begins a period of mourning for the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Seven brave astronauts uh, pushing the envelope, uh, exploring the high frontier, and then inexplicably it all ends in an instant, 200,000 feet above the state of Texas. Before they left, I spoke with the first Israeli astronaut ever to travel to space, Ilan Ramon. To tell you the truth, it was uh, pretty fast was actually today, and uh, it went too fast. It was, it was uh, partly or mostly cloudy, so I couldn't see much of his, uh, just uh, the north of his uh, land. Of course, I was excited. Yulan Ramon, that was obviously while he was in flight. I apologize for that. That was the Saturday after launch. He was telling me what it was like to try to look down on his home country of Israel. Said he had a little difficulty finding it. Ultimately, he did get a good chance to see it and conducted a series of experiments among other things to test the links between uh, dust particles in the air and global warming. Rick Husband was on his second flight, his first as a commander, and uh, he talked a little bit about flying with Ilan Ramon. Personally, the thing that I have really enjoyed the most about Ilan and, and his uh, family is just their warmness and uh, the the openness that they have in, in sharing their home and, and from my standpoint also just learning more about Israel, learning more about uh, I'd say the, the Jewish culture and with myself I, being a Christian I take a, a specific interest in, in kind of the, the, the biblical or uh, spiritual aspect as well, which has been a very interesting thing for me. Rick, Rick Husband, as he referred to there, a devout Christian, uh, learning a little bit about Judaism through the eyes of Alain Ramon. Alain Ramon and his crewmate on this mission, which was off delayed, a um, series of problems with uh, the shuttle and scheduling issues. Other missions took priority to the International Space Station. Uh, this mission finally taking off some 16 days ago and going up until that point at 9 a.m. Eastern Time this morning, uh, up until that point, 
nearly flawlessly for the seven-person crew as they conducted a series of experiments, some 80 experiments in all, over the course of this 16-day mission. Uh, NASA has, uh, is in the early stages of its investigation already. As you look at this tape from WFAA, shot from Dallas, you can see what happens. What seems like a single streaky meteor quickly becomes three, four, five meteors as the Space Shuttle Columbia breaks up in midair, traveling 18 times the speed of sound uh, at an altitude uh, of some 40 miles above us. And um, that picture tells you what happened, but offers up many, many questions uh, to us at this hour as to what could have happened, what might have caused it. Uh, all, a whole series of things will be uh, discussed and looked at. And uh, as one of the uh, people we talked to earlier mentioned, uh, an engineer who was involved in the uh, Challenger investigation, no one in the early stages of Challenger could have anticipated that it came down to a rubber O-ring that was too brittle and thus allowed hot gases to spill from those solid rocket boosters on the side of the space shuttle, spill into the external tank and cause an explosion in there. That, that's ultimately what happened. At the initial stages after Challenger, they were looking at the main engines and something there. So it took some time for them to come up with that uh, whole scenario. Eventually it was found, eventually it was fixed, and eventually they flew. It took the better part, two, two years, almost really three years, before uh, the uh, return to flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, and that uh, is probably the kind of time frame that we're going to be talking about here as the uh, NASA and the country uh, endeavors to find out precisely what happened to the Space Shuttle Columbia before any other shuttle leaves the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. Let's get a recap now from Darren in the newsroom. Darren? All right, Miles, we're going to do a couple things here. We're going to do that recap, and we're also going to talk to some of the people who saw the shuttle or some of the debris coming down. First, a recap of today's tragic events, beginning with Space Shuttle Columbia making its descent to Earth. It broke up over Texas this morning. It was planned to land at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. When you look at the video, you can see fiery pieces falling from the shuttle. This is very much like the video that Miles was just showing you. As we're also watching from NASA, NASA lost contact with the shuttle around 9 a.m. Eastern. The shuttle, as you're watching it, was about 200,000 feet and traveling at speeds of 12,000 miles per hour when contact was lost. Government officials say terrorism is not suspected. The shuttle was simply too far away from Earth for that to take place. Debris from the shuttle rained down over East Central Texas and it goes all the way into Louisiana. Officials are warning that the debris could be hazardous and should be avoided and they are certainly urging residents who find debris to immediately contact authorities to not go near it, do not touch it. Of course, we cannot forget the astronauts who lost their lives. Seven crew members aboard the shuttle were killed. NASA says their families at this point in time are definitely getting support. I'd have to say the families are bearing up with an incredible amount of dignity considering their loss. We all grieve for them. We all pray with them for the crew. But one thing came across loud and clear when visiting with them is they knew that the crew was absolutely dedicated to the mission that they were performing. And I think you could see that in the video downlink. They believed in what they were doing. And in the conversations with the crew and their families, they said that we must find what happened and fix it and move on. And we can't let their sacrifice be in vain. Seven incredible astronauts on board the shuttle. Let's go ahead and put a face on the, cr on the crew. Rick Husband was a 45-year-old commander of the Columbia crew. He also was an Air Force colonel. He comes from Amarillo, Texas. He says he made up his mind as a child that he would be an astronaut. It was his lifelong dream. Husband was selected as an astronaut back in 1994. Talk about perseverance. It took four tries until he was accepted into the astronaut program. William McCool was the pilot of Columbia and a Navy commander. He also comes from Texas, Lubbock, Texas. He was born in San Diego and was the father of three sons. McCool became an astronaut in 1996. He was making his first space flight. The payload commander, Michael Anderson, was 43 years old. He also was an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who was born in Plattsburgh, New York. NASA selected Anderson back in 1994. He was one of only a handful of African-American astronauts. 
Kalpana Chawla was 41 years old. She is a very interesting story. She was born in Karnal, India. She emigrated to the U.S. in the 1980s. She became an astronaut in 1994. This was her second space flight. She is a national hero, heroine, back in her home country of India. David Brown was a 46-year-old Navy pilot and doctor. He was also a Navy captain. He was born in Arlington, Virginia. He joined the Navy after medical internship. He became an astronaut in 1996, and Columbia was his first mission. Dr. Laurel Blair Salton Clark, she was the other woman on board. She also 41 years old, a Navy commander and a flight surgeon. Yeah. She became an astronaut in 1996. She lived in Racine, Wisconsin. She has an eight-year-old son. And then Ilan Ramon, Israel's first astronaut, a hero in his country. Ramon was a colonel in Israel's Air Force. His ancestors survived the Nazi death camp in Auschwitz. His wife and his four children live in Tel Aviv. And now we go back to exactly what took place early this morning. A lot of people saw what took place in the Texas area and then saw the debris rain down from Texas all the way to the Louisiana border, as we mentioned. Mark Davis is a talk radio host. He's in Dallas, Texas, and he's joining us on the phone right now. Mark is uh, WPBN. Mark, thank you for joining us on this day. Hi, no problem. WBAB in Dallas, Fort Worth, and it was in this area over North Texas, obviously, in the video imagery that people are seeing right now, this is what it looked like. There's not a whole lot of zoom that's on this particular video image, so I and some of my neighbors were out in our respective front yards engaging in a, a pretty normal space geek activity, watching a shuttle come in on the rare occasions that it appears over the North American skies. And uh, just juxtaposing it with the last time we had this experience, it was a nighttime event, about 10 o'clock in the evening, and far less of the sky was involved. It went from about 30 degrees up in the horizon, pretty well straight down to the southern horizon. This was a full 90 degrees of sky. The first bright sparkle of the shuttle re-entering came just exactly 8 o'clock our time, central time, and right above our heads. And then moving very slowly, taking every bit of a minute to go all the way down low in the southeastern sky on its way, uh, of course, to Florida. The first difference, if anybody had seen any of these before, lucky enough to be out when a shuttle uh, re-entry was in the sky before, is that it's usually a fairly clearly drawn single line of fire. This is, of course, a fireball in the sky any time a spacecraft re-enters the atmosphere. But to have sparkly things come off it was not immediately an item of panic, because anybody who's seen Apollo 13, where the special effects were, were quite uh, competent, knows that things are going to fly off uh, of a spacecraft that's re-entering the atmosphere. But would those things be so big that you could see them from 38 miles below? Would these things be so big that they would create their own separate contrail? Well, obviously the answers to, to that uh, would be no, and that resulted in the wreckage that you guys are, are showing right, right. now. So Mark, let me just jump here in a second and ask you, as you said, you're, you're a self-professed space, space geek, a number in your neighborhood, so you'd gone out to watch this re-entry, and you described what you thought it should have looked like um, from previous re-entries that you, look, you had watched, but at what point did you and your neighbors, as you were watching this, get a sense that something definitely was not right? Well, it's kind of funny. To our uh, interested but still relatively untrained eyes, the moment at which it was pretty clear that something bad was happening is after we all finished up a little conversation, said, wow, wasn't that neat, put our cameras and binoculars away, came back in, grabbed a refill of the pot of coffee, fired up CNN, and it wasn't landing. I mean, uh, this is how fast this thing goes at 12,000 miles an hour. It's directly over our heads in the Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, Texas area at 8, due on the ground in Florida at 8.16. I was probably back in my house at about 8.10. I figured this is great. Uh, shuttle uh, landings have become so routine, as you well know. I'm sure your coverage plans this morning called for joining it a couple of minutes out from landing, where it's a little white speck, then it lands, everybody says that's great, and then you're back to, you know, last night's basketball scores. Well, obviously it was not a normal landing, and there was no landing to cover, so that was when uh, my phone starts ringing off the I start calling everybody, and it's time to head in here to WBAP to do some, some coverage of our own. Interesting. Just to, just to watch it by itself, you didn't really realize at the particular moment that something had gone so terribly wrong. Well, well no, and that's what's so different between now and, and almost exactly 17 years ago with the, the shuttle Challenger. Uh, I was up early to watch that, too, which probably... Uh, it's funny. The Challenger launch had a little bit of layperson interest because you had Krista McAuliffe, first teacher in space. So the ratings for that, for you guys and everybody else, were probably a smidgen higher than for the ordinary routine shuttle launch for the shuttle 
Challenger, the shuttle program, had existed for about five years. Now it's existed for two decades. These flights are as, as normal as a jetliner taken off from your local airport. But yeah, uh, we were there, and we were going to watch whatever coverage you guys provided. And when it became clear there was no landing to cover, all those feelings from 1986 are back. And Darren, I know covering it, and, and for us covering it here in, in Texas on radio, every, everything old is new again. Reagan's speech in 86, his uh, biblical or godly references juxtaposed with President right. Bush's Mark, Mark, I'm just sorry, a few moments I'm just gonna, ago. I'm going to kind of jump in here. Of course, you understand covering there from Texas. We do have a lot of other news to get in as we try to, to move the story forward. Thank you for joining us so much from Texas. Mark Davis, talk show radio host. Thank you so much. Now we want to move it up to Washington, D.C. and Judy Woodruff. Judy? Thanks, Darren. Uh, getting a sense from Mr. Davis, uh, the perspective of uh, so many different perspectives this morning. Somebody who uh, lives in the state of Texas and works in the news media. Darren, with us now, or will, who will, somebody who will be with us in just a moment, uh, was literally, I think you have to say, the face and the voice of space flight in the United States during the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, the really the beginning of the space program in our country when we were all excited, school children would gather around uh, to watch on television for every space flight that took off. Uh, he is none other than Walter Cronkite, a, a former uh, CBS news anchor who's been retired now for some years but has always maintained an interest uh, in uh, sp space flight, uh, has, has uh, over the years, as, as I said, his name literally became synonymous with, uh, with NASA, with following uh, so many of the earliest space flights. Uh, you know, if, if, if we saw it, we watched CBS, we watched Walter Cronkite. So CNN wanted to, uh, to, to talk with Walter Cronkite, and he will be joining us now in just a moment. We're just pulling, pulling all the we're pulling all the technical pieces together to get uh, Mr. Cronkite on the air with us. And while we wait for that, uh, he's going to be joining us from Manhattan. We want to go to Jerusalem, to Israel, the home country of one of the astronauts on this, uh, this space shuttle Columbia mission. Uh, joining us is Renan Gieson. He is a spokesman for the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Mr. Gieson, we know President Bush uh, called your Prime Minister just a short time ago. Can you tell us uh, anything about their conversation? Well, first of all, you know, I'm, let me just say this is a very tragic and mournful day for the people of the United States, for the people of Israel, for the families of the astronauts, and, uh, but also a very sad day for all of humanity. And I think that was reflected in the conversation uh, between uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Sharon, which just took place uh, a short while ago. The President uh, said that it's a tragic day for science, it's a tragic day to the astronauts, uh, and mentioned that uh, on that space shuttle there was one brave Israeli citizen, uh, Colonel Ilan Ramon, who has also uh, died in this uh, endeavor on behalf of all humanity. And he offered his personal condolences as well as the condolences of the American people to the family of Ramon and to the Israeli people. The Prime Minister reiterated and offered his sincere condolences to the families of the astronauts and uh, also said uh, in, uh, in his final words, he said that it's on these difficult and hard moments that the hearts of the American people and the hearts of the Israeli people are bound together. And at these difficult moments, we're holding hands together, and together we pray. No question about it. Uh, Mr. Giesen, this question has been asked to some of your countrymen uh, already today, but I want to ask you, what does it mean, what has it meant to Israel to have, uh, for the first time, one of the astronauts aboard an American shuttle? Well, you know, it's not just a question of uh, personal uh, ambitions and uh, personal pride, or I would say national pride that we have an astronaut there. But I think it's a reflection of the shared values that we share with the people of the United States. This is the quest for the stars, is to try and make a better world here on this earth. And, you know, we've been living through conflicts for the past 100 years here and bloodshed. But this uh, uh, endeavor, this journey to space, you know, reflected or encapsulated all the hopes of the Israeli people to see a better future, a better world here on this planet in the little corner of the world where we live here in the Middle East. How much personal interest had the Prime Minister taken uh, in Mr. Ramon and this whole mission? Well, you know uh, that uh, he conducted a conversation just about 10 days ago with uh, uh, Colonel Ramon to the space shuttle 
uh, and there was a, a exchange, you know, which was broadcast here in Israel and uh, and captivated the, the audience. And uh, you know, uh, I can recall uh, Colonel Ramon saying that from above, uh, from 280 kilometers, you know, Israel uh, and Jerusalem, they look like a, a tiny, it's a tiny state, <laughs> and uh, but a beautiful one. And the Prime Minister said, you know, uh, we will continue. Uh, to support your dream. We will continue to support your vision and try to make Israel really the kind of beautiful state that you see it from above. Those words from Renan Gieson, who speaks for the Prime Minister, newly re-elected, uh, we should say, or newly rechosen Prime Minister, uh, Ariel Sharon. As I was saying just a moment ago, the man who was the face and the voice of American space flight during the, much of the 1960s, 1970s, and uh, is Walter Cronkite, a former uh, anchor for CBS News. He joins us now on the telephone. Uh, Walter Cronkite, um, you know, there have been some terrible tragedies. You've covered some of them, but here we have another uh, tragedy in space, uh, and it must bring back memories for you. Well, indeed, of course, it does to all of us. Uh, uh, it brings back the memory of the other great disaster we had out there with the Challenger. Uh, but it reminds us of other things, too. It, 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 it seems that we somehow are destined to be reminded from time to time of the dangers that we face in this exploration of space. You know, uh, with our successes of flight after flight, we seem to fall into the mistaken belief that travel in that great void of space can be routine. And then we get these terrible reminders of how wrong we are, that uh, we get reminded of, the, of the, the, the daring and the courage that marks those who understand the hazards and then so bravely undertake the missions for science and for their country. It, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's a reminder that it's too bad we can't keep in our noggins somehow, even in the days when things are going so well. But uh, we're talking to Walter Cronkite, but you know, early on, uh, we were all very acutely aware, early in the early days of the space program, of just how much risk was involved. How did that dissipate? How did that begin it, to slip it away? It dissipated uh, uh, but, uh, norm uh, normally uh, because of the success of our flights. Uh, I said at the time when we were seeing these flights go for the first time, when we went through the one-man Mercury programs, the two-man Gemini programs, and then and then uh, into the uh, flights eventually to the moon, uh, I said that with all the drama of that moment, there was going to the day that we knew we were going to be a success with our space exploration was the day that we didn't pay any attention to the flights, that they went uh, with the routine, practically, of airline schedules. And that's what's been happening, of course. Our shuttles have been rising and, uh, and uh, succeeding in their difficult task out there in space, even building this space city that we're now uh, occupying uh, with the Russians. Uh, the, uh, the, they, the, the flights have become routine. It takes something like this to wake us up to the fact that this is not a routine business at all. And we should continue to remind people, of course, that there are three astronauts in space now on uh, the Russian space station. We're talking on the telephone with Walter Cronkite, who uh, covered for the CBS News for so many years space travel. How are astronauts, how are these people who take this enormous risk, how are they different from you and me, from the rest of us? Well, a great number of them, the professional flyers, of course, uh, uh, have chosen that, uh, that uh, career of risk in the first place. Uh, by becoming not only ace pilots uh, in the military services, but test pilots as well, uh, in which uh, they, they, uh, every flight is, uh, is, is loaded with danger uh, of the unknown. They're, they're, they're trying out equipment that has never been flown uh, in, in uh, the air before. Uh, they, they, that is their career. To them, it is only uh, the, uh, another step to move into the, that, uh, the uniform of an astronaut. Uh, the, for the others, the doctors, we had a couple aboard this flight. Uh, the uh, 
uh, the specialists in one science or another who go uh, in the pursuit of their uh, science, uh, they, they are extraordinary individuals who have chosen to get out of the laboratory and the, and the hospitals and, and, uh, and, and learn the, the, the secrets of uh, survival in space, and then they make these flights. Uh, I, I think we should, uh, we should applaud all of them. Walter Cronkite uh, talking uh, with us uh, on the telephone. Uh, Miles O'Brien, please join us. Walter, uh, I'd like to uh, tap uh, your deep reservoir of knowledge and memory. Um, we remember Challenger so well and how long it took for um, NASA to get back in the skies. It was almost three years. Uh, of course, the Apollo 1 fire, which happened um, 1967, January 27th, uh, interesting, coincidentally, like the day before, there, there was less of a period of time because uh, it was in the midst of the moon race. Those were very different days, weren't they? Uh, yeah, I didn't quite understand you. Is this... Uh, the, the period of time... Is this, is this Miles? Yes, it is. Yeah, right, Miles. I didn't quite understand. You're doing a great job this morning, by the way, Miles, as, as uh, CNN and the rest of us now expect. Well, thank but, you. But uh, I didn't quite understand your last question. I was trying to remember how long it was from the Apollo 1 fire to the return to the Apollo missions. It was much quicker. It wasn't the full three years that we recall from the Challenger well, that, days. That, that was a long one, of course. That was the longest delay. That was longer than the one, I think, that, uh, that uh, succeeded the, uh, uh, the, the Challenger disaster. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but it seems to me it was two and a half years or more, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, well, I can't remember the numbers right on the top, off the top of my head, but I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that there will be a fairly long period of time here for all of this to uh, play it out. As, as Bill Reedy of the manned space flight had said, we've got to you know, find it, fix it, and, and, and resume. Uh, there is tremendous resilience to the space program, um, which you can attest to from its earlier days. I'm curious, do you, do you, can you, feel, do you feel confident that there will be a return to flight one day? for the United States? A return to what? A return to space for people oh, in, in the course. United States. A return to space? Well, I don't, I don't think this will seriously interrupt our program. Uh, uh, of course, it's going to depend entirely on how early they're able to determine the cause of, of this tragedy uh, and what it requires to, to fix it. Uh, that, that's that's the timetable that we face now, but uh, but uh, we're we're committed to space. We're not going to desert uh, um, the exploration of space uh, because of a setback as, as tragic uh, as it is. Uh, we're committed and we're going to continue. Uh, the the only debate, as you know now, uh, in the space program, and I think this is the only debate that will continue, uh, is. Uh, is the proportion that we do devote to robotic space, uh, the space, uh, to the, the early experiments in landing on Mars uh, uh, with unmanned flight, and the uh, and the devotion of time and expenditures of manned flight in space. And that uh, debate will continue regardless of uh, the outcome of all of this. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. The, 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 this, may, this may bolster to a degree the argument of those who claim we, we can do as much with robotic flight as we can with uh, manned vehicles. Uh, but uh, the argument for manned vehicles is still very strong, that the curiosity of the individual who's landing and walking on those distant or orbs out there in space uh, is uh, uh, of a value that cannot be replaced by, by machines who are simply communicating with men on Earth. Do you think, uh, Walter, that uh, the American people, up until something like this happens, take this for granted, what we see routinely there? Well, yes, I do. I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you know, Miles, as well as any of us, that uh, that these these shuttle flights don't even get in the newspapers and the back pages, not even by the by the funny by the comic pages. There, there's no mention of of the flights at all, unless indeed there is a daring deed out there and in, uh, uh, in, in repairing the, the, the Hubble 
telescope or something of that kind. Uh, they're helping to build uh, additions on the, the uh, Sky City out there, the, the international orbit. Uh, the uh, uh, we we don't pay any attention at all. It's just routine. It's as routine as the uh, as the commuter trains are running out of New York City. Hmm. It's and maybe, maybe more so. Yeah, yeah, maybe more so. Uh, let's take a look at that crew for just a moment. And I wonder, you know, um, they go into it with not a blasé attitude. I, I know all these people, and I talk to them all the time. And and what they tell you to a person is this: this is a real dicey proposition it is risky business and uh, but a calculated risk that's the term they use and they um, uh, go to space fully aware of those risks and I was talking to Judy a little while ago about how different it is when you're talking about a group like this compared to the Challenger days uh, when we had uh, a civilian member of the crew Christian McAuliffe is that do you think that's different in the mind of the American people well, the, 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 uh, we know that, that uh, those involved in the space program are fully aware of the dangers, uh, the, the skill with which they put together the spacecraft, uh, the, the uh, precision with which the, the machinery is built uh, to avoid things like what happened today. Uh, the, and it's interesting, as you know well from uh, your, your time around the space program, that our astronauts don't uh, swagger uh, through their day's work uh, uh, aground, uh, but they are looked upon at the same time by their fellow workers who are not astronauts, but uh, in the ground crews, they are looked upon uh, as, uh, as heroes to be. Walter Cronkite, yeah, much is made of the white scarf. We use that term, but the, the white scarf is perhaps a pejorative that doesn't fit for these people who uh, fully understand the risks and, and are not out there, as you say, with that swagger. Walter Cronkite, thank you so much for being with us. You bet, Miles. Hang in there. All right. We are um, now going to turn our attention to um, a special guest who is joining on the line who is uh, enduring a particularly tough uh, morning. Uh, June Scobie Rogers the widow of the commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger, Dick Scobie, joining us on the line now from her home in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, and June, I just, uh, it's got to be a terribly difficult thing to see this, particularly for someone who's been through what you've been through. Just uh, tell us what, what you thought and, and what it's brought back for you. Uh, thank you, Miles. It's a tragic day for our nation for the NASA family, and especially for the dear families of the Columbia crew. Um, our heartfelt um, prayers are for them. I know that they're flying back to Johnson Space Center now and um, had calls wanting to talk to the commander's wife, and we're going to talk eventually. But uh, it's, uh, it's something so difficult because a private loss is so public and it's shared with the nation. Uh, tell, tell me, um, w without violating the privacy of your conversation, what can be said t between June Scobie Rogers and Evelyn Husband today? What can you tell her uh, to ease her pain in any way? Well, we, we could talk about the day, just getting through the day with your loved ones and friends and prayers and to know that they're in the hands of God, that their loved ones have surely slipped those surly bonds of earth. God's put out his hand and holds them. And I would want God to hold them close. There's, there's so much to be concerned about with their families, and um, I would hope that they're taking care of themselves and that the NASA doctors are taking good care of them. Um, to feel the prayers that the nation, when they say they're sending prayers, they are. And to feel the love of all of those people and to know that we care so much for them and know their loss. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's so difficult and it's such a tragedy and it's so unfair that it happened. But the world... The world knows how 
they died. And if they can just remember and hold on to the dream of what they were living for and what their mission was all about, then that dream will see them through. Um, boy, that's, those are tough words. And I know you've told me many times that in the wake of, of Challenger, 17 years ago this past week, you uh, really not even long after the incident, we're talking to then Vice President Bush, and you uh, expressed at that time your firm belief that your husband, uh, Dick Scobie, would have wanted to see NASA press on. Do you, do you feel, I, I, I know you don't know Rick Husband necessarily, but do you feel that that is the spirit of this crew? What, what dear people, yes, I, 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 I can, anyone who believes so much in the space mission of, of the discovery of the opening new vistas and to learning about the space frontier, you know, they're living, they're living for that, um, discovery of space exploration and they so many of them signed up to NASA to fly in space with vision and hope and knowing that it would bring so much more information to our planet to help us with those dreams and uh, fulfilling those dreams they I can't speak for the current Columbia crew but if they signed up to fly with NASA, that must have been their dream that they would want fulfilled as well. June Scobie Rogers, our, our best to you on this day, which uh, must be particularly poignant and painful for you as well. And we appreciate you taking a few moments with us. God bless you all. God bless you. As she spoke, we were watching um, yet again that shot. Um, you can see it right there on your screen. Uh, somewhere um, south of Dallas, Texas, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia, about 9 a.m. Eastern Time, was streaking across Mach 18, 200,000 feet, and just went from a single fireball to multiple fireballs in an instant. Uh, communication abruptly ended in the middle of a conversation from the commander, Rick Husband, and um, immediately prior to that, there's some indication of some problems with tire pressure. What that means, we don't know. It may be quite some time before we ever have any sense of what really happened and what caused the Space Shuttle Columbia to break up. But we've already seen the, the first steps toward uh, that conclusion. First thing that flight controllers uh, did in Houston was tell their people on those various consoles to put together their notes, capture their data, put notes in boxes, seal it up, get it ready for the investigation. Not long thereafter, we saw Sean O'Keefe the NASA administrator saying that the wheels were in motion already for an independent commission to get to the bottom of this particular incident, an independent commission that will ultimately report back to the nation and give NASA and the rest of the nation a sense of what went wrong. And then Bill Reedy, the head of the Human Spaceflight, uh, Associate Administrator of Human Spaceflight, talking about finding it, fixing it, and moving on. Moving on might, will be a real challenge for NASA, depending on what comes out of this. Could take quite some time before we see another shuttle fly. It was almost three years from Challenger's accident until Discovery flew and the return to flight. Uh, we're now in the early stages. It's a time for mourning. It's a time for questions. The answers will come much later. Judy? What ways do you have? Let's say you've reached orbit, you're in the shuttle for a mission of uh, a specific duration, and, and you have reason to believe that something on the exterior is amiss. Uh, what ways do you have uh, to check it out? Are there sensors or is it only a, a spacewalk? Well, you do also have the uh, robot arm, the, what's called the RMS, uh, which could be maneuvered around. It has a camera on the end of it, uh, but it cannot look at every part of the space shuttle. Uh, it could not, for example, look at the tiles down around the, the wheel well or other areas down there. So a spacewalk or if, in fact, there were some other uh, photography capable from long distance, uh, whether it was from a space asset or from um, the Earth, that's, that's the only other way.
Uh, and we want to also remember we have Alan Bean with us on the phone. A Alan, I want to go back to the last thing you said. Uh, we were talking about whether something fortunate could come out of this. Uh, what, in your estimation, would it take uh, from square one all the way through the pipeline if someone at NASA, perhaps the administrator, did say, you know what, we're going to use this as a jumping on point to bring out a new generation of orbiter? Well, I think some people at NASA would greet that with excitement. Others would say, look, we've got the best piece of hardware we could build. Admittedly, it's 20 years old, but we've upgraded it. We think we've got the best we can make. You know, talk is cheap about getting something better next week or next year. But when you've got something that's as good as an orbiter and represents the best this country can do, uh, it's a good thing to start operating it and using it and not stop using it and go off on, you know, to try to invent the next stage. We're trying to build a space station. We need an orbiter now. We don't need some new one 10 years from now. Well, maybe we do, but we need one now that works, and we've got one. It just had an accident. We've got to find out what's wrong and then get back in the construction of the space station business and not, you know, not spend our money to all this is money as you realize so we'd have to spend money to do that instead of correct this error in a fundamentally wonderful machine as rick halk would say who flew it after the challenger accident he uh, was the first pilot there and i think he'd be the first to stand up and say that the shuttle is a great machine but machines are built by humans humans aren't perfect we're always going to have problems with machines whether it's computers uh, spaceships, airplanes, cars, because they're built by humans. They're just an extension of what we can do, and we all know human beings aren't perfect. We try, we do the best we can, but we aren't perfect. Alan, would you pull a John Glenn and go up again if you could right now? Well, I would, but I would recommend not sending me. I would recommend sending some guy like Bill Gates or somebody, an entrepreneur up there, and let him uh, fly in space and look around and see what businesses could be created from the space environment. Some guy like me, I'm an engineer test pilot. I've never started a business. I don't know. And we need businesses in space. So I would say, don't send me. Send, send this guy that, was, uh, that started Virgin Atlantic Airways. I don't know what his name, but he started 200 businesses. We need to send those kind of people up there. Somewhere, Richard Branson is probably smiling ear to ear at your suggestion, and who knows, maybe we can look into it. Uh, He's the kind of guy to go. Uh, Mr. Houck, do you concur with that? I think Alan's right on. Um, we do need to continue to operate this, this magnificent machine, and that's one of the big questions that NASA will faced with in, in dealing with uh, the administration and the Congress, and that is, do we need to start to build a replacement for this one? Because so we only had four. Uh, and now we're down to three, and that severely restricts your flexibility in operating uh, the, the uh, International Space Station. Rick Hawk and Alan Bean uh, are two gentlemen of counsel, and uh, very experienced they are. We're going to come back to this conversation. I have some questions about what may be the next shuttle mission and how they'll uh, approach that. Uh, we want to go to uh, NBC News correspondent Jim Cummins, uh, Cummins, where in Nagadocious, Texas, I understand, some people have been taken to the hospital in connection with this, Jim. That's right, Brian. One of the radio stations here in Nagadoches is now reporting that 21 people have gone to the emergency room of the local hospital here for either uh, injuries from debris or exposure to what they fear might be hazardous materials from debris. Uh, every five minutes on the radio from Dallas all the way to Louisiana, uh, the people are being warned that if you see something that looks like debris, please stay away from it and call the local authorities. Uh, the debris field itself was measuring at one point 140 miles long. Uh, the one report from here in Nagadocious says the debris field covered something like 500 square miles in this area of East Texas. Hundreds of reports of debris raining down on Nagadocious. A relative of mine even told me that in her neighborhood debris was falling in her backyard and in her neighbor's backyards here in Nagadocious, which is in East Texas, close to the Louisiana border. I heard the concussion, the explosion, or, or not the explosion, but the, what sounded like a sonic boom this morning in my home in Dallas. My wife and I heard it while we were reading the newspaper, and we looked outside to see if something had gone wrong in our neighborhood. Nothing peaceful. 19 minutes later, I heard the first reports on the NBC, of course, today's show, 
that uh, they had lost contact with the, the uh, shuttle Columbia and I started to, just to drive in this direction. This seems to be an area where most of the debris has fallen and they are checking out various reports of the kinds of debris. One piece the size of a, a car door landed at the airport here in Nagadoshes. Another piece measuring three by three feet was sitting along the roadside as I drove in here on Highway 21. The police had it surrounded. They had kept pe people away from it. It looked like a charred piece of metal. Uh, so that's the situation here. Lots of people are concerned. Lots of reports of debris. Some of them are accurate, some of them not. Uh, but of course, they're answering all those calls and again, urging people to s stay away from it just on the chance that it might be contaminated with something uh, that came from the space shuttle, uh, you know, some sort of uh, fuel or some sort of chemical that is in the, uh, the equipment on the space shuttle. And uh, as you might expect, there's lots of uh, activity in this part of the country. Yeah, Jim, the, the fuel they use uh, is uh, highly toxic, we're told, in addition to the fact that it is now a piece of evidence uh, in an investigation. Jim, while you spoke, we were watching videotape, and one of the shots was of a, uh, a, a rather large house. It looked like it had, had a house fire. Are we led to believe that a, a piece of debris hit it and started a, a blaze? Well, there was a report this morning, Brian, in Plano, Texas, which is a suburb just north of Dallas, of a fire on the roof of an apartment building, and they were investigating that to see if, in, in fact, that had been caused by burning debris. I don't know, since I was driving in this direction, what, uh, what they have eventually found out. I'm out of radio range there. That may be what you're seeing. Okay. Uh, as we're just sort of picking up pictures as we go along here, but... Uh, I assume you've seen some pictures of the debris. Okay, yeah, we're looking at it, and I don't want to run unreferenced videotape, so we'll we'll look into just what this is we're looking at and see if it is, in fact, related. Jim Cummins with the news out of Nagadocious, Texas, that people res responding to the official warnings about going near this stuff have indeed gone to a hospital emergency room. Uh, all of this, of course, surrounding such great tragedy today, the loss of seven lives. We have... Some videotape we found of uh, what this crew was like personality-wise. This, the following was taken while they were training for this mission that ended in disaster today. Uh, happy to be here, finally. It was a pleasure uh, to go the, the long way, two and a half years, because of the great team, great crew, Great trainers, great fight directors, great engineers. The route to the target is more important than the target. We are going to go for the target, but we enjoy the, the route as well. I was working great. The whole team working together, which uh, I think is probably one of the most fun parts of the whole deal. So uh, thanks a bunch, and uh, they'll be happy to know that uh, Salt is still in science mode. We hope you guys had a restful sleep, and we're looking forward to working with you today. No need to respond. Just wanted you to know that we are taking in-cabin video. Hi, Laura. Hi, Dave. Good morning. Just out of the screen uh, to the right corner, and now coming into view is the commander, Rick Husband. In the back corner in the white shirt is Mission Specialist Kopna Chala. She's working with a softball experiment, creating some uh, flame balls in space. Floating in the center of your screen is Israeli payload specialist Elon Ramon. No, I'm not worried because, um, I mean, he's not worried, so why should I be worried? Accident um, on re-entry. That last shot, uh, the father of Elon uh, Ramon, the uh, military hero in Israel, one of the seven lost today. It is all so sad. It would be easier incrementally, perhaps, if they weren't the very best uh, America and Israel had to offer. Uh, they have given their lives for the space program they loved so deeply. You saw the uh, 
broad, broad smile there of uh, Captain Dave Brown, the former uh, aerialist, the 46-year-old flight surgeon turned uh, 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 fighter pilot there on board the shuttle. Uh, 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 shown uh, at a much happier time. There they were preparing for their mission and uh, some of them those scenes from in space uh, before what we learned uh, happened today. We've been talking a lot about debris uh, as we try to confirm the, the picture we put on the air for you of the house that had uh, apparently gone up in flames, whether that was uh, directly caused by this or not. Um, local weather officials, this is the Reuters news agency out of Dallas, um, uh, estimate that lighter material in the debris cloud could indeed fall and be kind of scattered and deposited around the nation in several locations and could, because it landed on the jet stream and was carried along, could go on for another 10 hours. And I assume by lighter material we are talking about any paper, any insulation, uh, things of that nature. So uh, just an extraordinary trail, uh, a gruesome trail uh, of evidence because what we're talking about here after all is so much more than the loss of a spacecraft and a loss of 25 percent of America's orbiting ability, but the loss of seven uh, dynamic lives today. We are waiting. We have just entered the three o'clock hour here in the east. Uh, perhaps we can show you what NASA is showing us. We are waiting a uh, news conference by NASA. This will be the technical portion, uh, and a lot of this uh, will no doubt be terms uh, that will go uh, flying over the heads of uh, those of us who are lay people in the uh, business of space travel. But this should begin to shed some light. Uh, there it is. We're going to be hearing from, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, shuttle program manager here and the uh, head of flight support uh, in just a few minutes. Whenever they take that slide down, uh, that is our cue to begin bringing you the uh, uh, telecast from NASA. Again, these are very, very sad people. They work as a team very closely with those they send up in space. It is their mission in life, and this was the mission they were so happy uh, to be able to greet at the end of the runway today when it came to its uh, conclusion. Uh, it did not. Uh, Rick Houck is still with us, a uh, former uh, uh, shuttle pilot and Rick, I'm curious about the following dynamic. There will be a next shuttle pilot in this series of flights. How right. nervous were you? How much was it on your mind? I'm sure the media reminded you at every turn. Right. Um, there's no question that uh, right after the Challenger accident, the uh, unthinkable happened, of course. And, and so as my previous two missions, I, even though I was scared, uh, NASA had never uh, lost people during a space mission before, and, but on my flight uh, that was not the case, and I have to admit to being, uh, my heart was in my throat when we launched. But I also was able to tell my family that NASA had done everything they possibly could to make that flight as safe as they could, and that's not a guarantee that you're going to come home. But uh, believe me, the focus of everyone, hundreds of thousands of people involved in this program, will be on making this right. And you have that comfort uh, as you strap in to launch. Isn't it the same dynamic following a major air disaster in this country? People say it has never been safer than it is right now because it's under so much scrutiny. I believe that, uh, absolutely. Now, uh, explain, uh, given your uh, meteorological knowledge, uh, we're talking about an incident that happened at an altitude of approximately, what, 50, uh, 38 miles above the Earth. Right. Um, mm -hmm. At what level is the jet stream and, uh, and, and speed and duration, how far is it likely to carry bits of, say, insulation or paper? Well, uh, the jet stream is, uh, can dip as low as about uh, oh, 25,000 feet, but generally it's up in the 35,000 to uh, 80,000 feet. And uh, people are familiar to seeing the jet stream on the weather forecast with that snake right. that winds itself across the country. But that, the jet stream typically moves at 100 to 120 miles an hour. So if you think of some light objects, certainly heavy objects will fall through the jet stream and not be terribly affected by that. But things that are light that would otherwise be blown by wind, they can be captured in the jet stream and carried very long distances. And how does that make the job here more difficult? It's all evidence. It's all part of this yeah. mission. My guess is that the important parts are the heavier parts. 
uh, that the light parts are less likely to be involved with the, the accident, but even the heavy parts are spread over a, a large area. So uh, in itself, I don't think that will complicate the uh, investigation more. But uh, I would not be surprised if people far afield from Texas are finding uh, remnants of the, of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Again, to our viewers, we keep seeing this picture of a burned out home. We're working on getting the facts as to just what we're looking at. And if that is the home that corresponds to a report of a fire on the roof of an apartment in Texas that might have been connected with uh, uh, falling debris. A bit of housekeeping coming up on 3.05 here Eastern. We've now been told the NASA News Conference uh, start time will slide another 10 minutes to about 3.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I'm also joined uh, throughout by our chief science correspondent Robert Bazell with us here in New York. Uh, Bob, how will, in your reckoning, this, the, uh, the uh, investigation this time, perhaps in duration, uh, differ from Challenger? Do they know more these days in real time uh, than they did then? No, not really. And one, it's very important, Brian, to point out that the investigation into Challenger became a political investigation almost right. as much as uh, an investigation into the technical aspects of the failure because uh, the technical aspects were discovered very early on. It was the O-ring design, but then it became that NASA had been cutting corners with safety, that there had been pressure to launch. Now, NASA, of course, afterwards promised not to do that, but I think that we're going to have to find out all the circumstances that surround this. For, the first thing to find out is what was the cause of this and how to fix it. The next thing is to find out is why that happened, and the why could be an enormously difficult and complex question involving personalities and politics. So it's very hard to know in these first few hours after this tragedy where the investigation is going to go. I, there was a lot of uh, acrimony in 1986 that NASA was hiding uh, the details of its engineering reports from people who should know. And, though, and even when the commission was set up to study the Challenger accident, it was very difficult to find people who weren't connected to NASA in some way to serve on it because NASA is an organization that uh, tries to protect itself like many bureaucratic organizations at time. And it's very hard to know, uh, you know exactly what was the cause. We see that explosion right there of Challenger, and we've all seen those pictures a, a million times, but the cause of that explosion uh, went far deeper into the organization that was running the space program. So that's not, an, that's not an accusation about what happened today. We have no idea about what happened today. Uh, we're just at the beginning, I think, though, of a very long road into finding out. And, uh, uh, Bob, we're now learning that they believe they found a door from the shuttle on the ground, uh, and uh, there's at least one blackened field of uh, grass officials can see in the state of Texas. This is going to be a Herculean effort. They're using National Guard volunteers, Forest Service people to find this. We're talking about hundreds of square miles. Oh, you were talking about hundreds of square miles, and almost certainly they're going to try to rebuild the shuttle. Uh, in the same way that if we recall when TWA 800, TWA 800 right? went down into the ocean, they managed to get the parts off the ocean. These will be gathered over this long period and put together because each piece does have, including that tile on the ground there that we see there, each piece does have a potential clue as to what went wrong to, to cause this tragedy. So everything is going to have to be looked at in great detail and everything is going to have to be in a context about uh, what was the, the pre-flight certification or what were this, the data that were coming down from the spacecraft at the time of landing, what went on on board the spacecraft, uh, that as much as could be re, uh, reconstructed. All of this will have to be looked at in, in great detail. And I think it's going to be the NASA administrator has already announced that he's going to set up a board outside of NASA as, weather, weather as, as well as an internal board. But I think a lot of people uh, you know, on Capitol Hill and, our, and elsewhere are going to want to say, well, we want to make sure that, that that is truly an independent board to make sure that what happened here, uh, whether it was preventable and whether to make sure that it won't happen again. Bob Bazell with us from New York. Uh, we are joined now by telephone by Sheriff Thomas Kurz in Nagadocious, Texas. Uh, Sheriff, uh, what can you tell us about pieces of debris and folks who have stopped by the emergency room today? Our county uh, encompasses just under a thousand square miles, and we have literally received hundreds of reports of uh, debris that has fallen from the sky throughout our county. Uh, it's also my understanding that some surrounding counties that border us have debris as well. 
Now, can you confirm we've been looking at videotape of, of uh, uh, pieces of debris from the air on the ground, also a picture of what appears to be a fairly modern apartment house with the roof missing due to fire. Is that connected with this? Is that in your area? No, I don't believe the site that you're referring to with the, the fire is uh, anywhere near my area. Uh, literally, the debris field is probably going to encompass uh, hundreds, maybe even uh, several thousand square miles. I don't know, but... Uh, we do have numerous debris sites, uh, literally hundreds within our county. Uh, so far, we have not received any report of any casualties from falling debris within our county. Uh, we do have several sites that have sustained some property damage. Uh, with the folks in the emergency rooms, should we assume that they are taking warnings from folks like us and, and going to get checked, or do you th have any reason to believe it's because of actual inhalation or injury from this uh, toxic stuff that's on these parts? The uh, reports from the emergency rooms, again, I can't really confirm, uh, right. other than maybe people are taking a precautionary measure to, to be checked. Uh, certainly, we are encouraging through our local media here, as well as the national effort, uh, that anyone that encounters a piece of debris not come in contact with it. Uh, uh, we will send someone out if they'll notify us where it is, check it for uh, any type of radioactive material or, or toxicity, and, uh, you know, please don't pick it up or try to move it. Now, Sheriff, uh, did you think this was going to be an average Saturday there in your town? Well, certainly it started out that way this morning, but that certainly changed uh, very quickly as things in law enforcement tend to do. Sheriff, thank you very much for being with us. Sheriff Thomas Kurz from uh, Nagadocious, uh, Texas. Uh, a, a busy place for uh, all the wrong reasons today. A, a very busy place this morning until we knew what we had here was the Department of Defense. They're being used in other ways, however. NBC News Pentagon correspondent is Jim McLeshevsky. And uh, Mick, we're hearing that uh, Air National Guard, National Guard on foot, uh, Forest Service, everybody's being marshaled that can get there to look for these parts. Uh, that's right, Brian. For several hours, it appeared that the U.S. military uh, was somewhat uh, at a loss as to exactly how they could contribute or, or what their role would be in any kind of recovery effort. But uh, since then, they've uh, responded and quite robustly. Uh, there are uh, some six Air Force Reserve F-16s out of the uh, Reserve uh, Naval Air Station in Fort Worth. Uh, the Army is providing Black Hawk and Kiowa Warrior helicopters out of Fort Hood. Uh, the uh, Texas Air National Guard is supplying uh, uh, C-130s uh, to continue the search. Uh, U.S. Navy helicopters are being scrambled out of New Orleans. Uh, and even the Coast Guard is getting involved. Uh, they're dispatching a 110-foot cutter uh, to patrol the Gulf of Mexico. So that gives you some kind of idea on how vast uh, the U.S. military and NASA officials think this debris field may be. Uh, Mick, we were saying in the newsroom uh, earlier before our coverage started, people, uh, so many people are conspiratorial thinkers. Uh, uh, you and I both know that there are always going to be theories about what happened today, even though we can go blue in the face describing uh, uh, how this didn't happen. Go through again exactly why it, we are getting such a strong wave off on any possibility that this could have been uh, any kind of misbehavior. Well, given where the Columbia was at the time of the explosion, it was at about 200,000 feet. Uh, and we hear that it, it was flying well over uh, 10,000 miles per hour. Just to give you a, a comparison, uh, the uh, nation's national missile defense system uh, that they're still trying to develop, they've been working on this for years and still haven't perfected the ability uh, to shoot down an ICM, ICBM missile. Just to give you a comparison, an ICBM warhead would be traveling at about 1800 miles just a fraction of the speed uh, at which the uh, Columbia shuttle was traveling and the US military military still hasn't perfected the ability to, to shoot down that uh, so there is nothing in any military a US military or otherwise in their inventory that would be able to shoot down uh, the Columbia at that height 
Also, there was some speculation that perhaps there was some sabotage, that somebody was able to slip a bomb on board uh, the Columbia shuttle before it took off. Uh, but NASA officials say that uh, the security around this flight was especially tight, uh, primarily because of the presence of the uh, Israeli Air Force colonel uh, who was uh, on that flight. But also, uh, ever since 9-11, NASA at Cape Canaveral uh, has had extraordinary security measures in place uh, because, uh, after all, uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people gather in that region to watch these shuttles take off. And there was uh, some deep concern that at some point a terrorist uh, might try, in a symbolic move, try to shoot down uh, or somehow impede the takeoff of one of those shuttle missions. So uh, <clears throat> while you can never rule anything out, uh, the likelihood uh, appears to be about as absolute zero as you can get. Of course, we're also looking at a, a, a at what we consider just a science and uh, and a slam dunk these days. We've gotten complacent again and blasé about our coverage of these missions. Nothing has ever gone wrong on landing prior to this, and uh, we wake up this morning to this kind of news, and it has everybody make thinking about uh, January 28th of '86. Uh, that's right. I mean, I, I was here in the building uh, covering the Pentagon at that time, uh, and I can tell you that uh, uh, as as soon as it was determined that uh, it was a catastrophic event, uh, we headed off to uh, some of the offices here who would be in charge of search and rescue, and and, and the generals there were already uh, hunched over the maps and, and plotting uh, where their search and rescue assets, helicopters, planes were already in place uh, for any possible recovery. Of course, uh, we know tragically now that that wasn't possible, that the crew of the Challenger was killed uh, almost instantly. But uh, uh, in this case, there would have been no search and rescue uh, assets, planes or helicopters, in the North Texas region. Uh, those search and rescue uh, helicopters and assets are, are usually situated uh, either around the launch site at Cape Canaveral, or in this case, the recovery site, the landing zone, uh, or at alternate uh, landing sites. Uh, for example, the, uh, there are some sites in Europe that if the uh, shuttle uh, takeoff doesn't go as planned, uh, their bailout sites exact. Uh, 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 they're actually bailout sites in case something goes wrong. And, and the U.S. military would have search and rescue assets around those areas. But in this case, they had nothing in the air. Uh, and as, as we find out, it actually took them several hours to scramble the necessary aircraft to get up in the air. And, and this is an effort that will continue uh, with their various infrared and night vision devices. It will continue uh, for 24 hours a day, as, uh, probably as long as uh, it will take. We also just know we're going to get a whole lot of images from this. We already have reports that military satellites uh, show a flash of light. We're going to get so many different views from the ground as good citizens with video cameras hand over their tape, hopefully first to NASA and then perhaps a, a copy to the television networks because it'll be, it will be interesting, uh, though it continues to be crushingly sad to see what happened across the sky. And these infrared satellites uh, are apparently pretty remarkable in, in what they can do. Uh, according to experts, first of all, uh, they would see the explosion. That would be readily visible mm -hmm. uh, to this satellite. But they could also track it because the Columbia was obvious, or, or the uh, uh, the Columbia S was obviously on fire. They could track its path, perhaps even more accurately than uh, than some of the other satellites that NASA may be using. But the, it could also help determine exactly what it is that caused the explosion itself, uh, because apparently, according to experts, these infrared satellites are so sensitive uh, they can tell you exactly what kind of fire or what exactly what kind of explosion this is, whether it's an explosive device, some kind of fuel. Uh, so uh, this may be very helpful in helping NASA determine exactly what caused this accident. Jim McLeshevsky at the Pentagon, thanks. Uh, okay, there, there is this from Tallahassee, Florida on the Associated Press. A former astronaut who flew on the space shuttle Columbia says problems during landings are unusual. Winston Scott says he never would have guessed that something would go wrong during this phase of flight. But he adds it shows space flight is a volatile business, a point we've been making here, and something could go wrong at any time. 
Winston Scott flew on Columbia in 1997, also flew on the shuttle Endeavor. We are making efforts to have him join us on the air. Robert Bazell is the chief science correspondent for NBC News. He's been with us since the start of this. Uh, and uh, Bob, we were talking about this debris field. We have been talking about the investigation. First of all, NASA has to go about the very tricky business, and they'll have help here from the President of the United States on down in taking care of families who were so excited to be greeting their loved ones about 16 minutes later. Well, of course, the, the grief process here is, is terrible, and we can only imagine what it would be like uh, if, if our loved ones uh, were involved in this. I think that a lot of these people, uh, as Rick Hauck, who was a test pilot himself, pointed out before, are, have been people who have been in the military, and they are, many of them, test pilots who are used to taking extraordinarily extraordinary chances. And even the people who are civilians, who are the payload specialists who ride in the shuttle, uh, often they're scientists, or in this case, some were physicians. These are people who really are very gutsy and they know that they're taking a risk. So, and I think that their families know that they're, they're taking a risk. So in the sense that it, it's a terrible shock and a tragedy for all of us, it's, it is nobody ever thought, even if we stopped covering these things for a few minutes or a few days or months, that th this was something that anybody would, would take lightly or something that was without risk. It, it is, as many of our guests have pointed out today, something that's involved in a sense of adventure. And I think that uh, many Americans would gladly accept the risk, even knowing what we know today, you know, for the chance to go up into space. And that's one of the reasons why I think we keep a, a space program going, is it because it's not just the people who live the experience and take the risks, it's a, it's a sense of adventure for all of us, because there are serious political questions about why we do have a space program. The space station, which the shuttle services, and then as we've been hearing all day today, there's three people up there now who, whose fate uh, is going to be decided in the next few weeks and months. Uh, the space program it's not is something that we keep for a national pride but it doesn't accomplish much scientifically the space station was just cut back for budgetary reasons nasa has been under terrible budgetary pressure in fact the current director of nasa was appointed by president bush from the office of management and budget somebody who is concerned with dollars and cents i think we're going to be hearing a lot about the kind of budgetary pressures nasa has been under and whether that played a role at all in today's incident we don't know whether it did but that is a critical part of the investigation that's going to unfold don't forget it was a big part of the investigation that unfolded after the challenger exploded in 1986 and bob to go back to something you just touched on you and i have both been around these men and women and you know almost to a person they told loved ones uh, in effect to paraphrase don't grieve for me if anything happens please know that I am I will be at my happiest and I am doing what I have wanted to do for so long well absolutely and I, I spent an enormous amount of time uh, in my career around shuttle astronauts during the first phases of the space program when uh, when Columbia was first launched and then when the, the space uh, program returned with Rick Houck as the commander who's been on the show with us and I never met a group of people who I admired more. I remember there was one woman who's uh, an astronaut and she gave birth to a baby and she was back to work uh, within hours because she didn't want to miss any of her training and that's the kind of spirit that you find in both the women and the men who are, are astronauts. These are people who are enormously dedicated, enormously capable and hugely intelligent. The, the, even, even now that the astronaut corps is much bigger than it was in the early days. There's a, the, the competition is terrific to get into the program. There's no shortage of applicants. Uh, a lot of people want to do this, and, it, and NASA is able to select only the very finest and, and only the most dedicated to be able to do it. You're so right to stress their smarts, and it's so sad that we have to have an occasion like this to speak to uh, some of the great Americans of all time, Buzz Aldrin, Alan Bean. These are people that uh, uh, a lot of kids look a lot like you and me grew up uh, really uh, idolizing in the, in the original Mercury 7 and then on through Gemini and Apollo. And here we are talking to them with such great and vast experience for all the wrong reasons. Absolutely, the, but again, these are test pilots, a lot of them. And, it's the and life they've chosen. That aren't test pilots. Uh, the culture of test pilots permeates NASA, as it always has. The original astronauts were all test pilots. The commanders and pilots today remain people who are test pilots, people who can land on aircraft carriers at night, who, can, who are accustomed to taking all kinds of extraordinary risks. Uh, that doesn't uh, in any way justify anything that's happened today. These people knew 
that they were getting into a dangerous situation and it's a, a program that's full of uh, a lot of adventure and challenges but we can be absolutely certain that whatever happened today did not happen because of any lack of competency on the basis of those seven people who were on board because you could not have people who were better trained more dedicated and more able to do their jobs if, if you have ever seen uh, or been privileged to see as I have the training of shuttle astronauts uh, the, the endless repetition of every every job that they have so that everything that they do is is second nature and that they're able to handle every possible emergency short of a, a total catastrophe you can understand that these these are people who do have truly have the cliche as the right stuff but they really do have it and, and they're proud of it and, and it's always an honor to be around them and it's always a tragic loss when we lose, lose people like we've lost today Bob Bazell thanks and now that we've uh, thoroughly embarrassed a very modest man I want to go back to Rick Houck in Washington uh, specifically with the question how much are you fueled by patriotism you, you are all lovers of country that's the other thing you have in common well that's true Brian uh, I, I think that's certainly part of the fabric that uh, we weave around ourselves because uh, it gives us something to reflect back on after we've participated in one of these great adventures it gives us some sense of uh, pride I guess uh, that we've been able and privileged to participate in things that are so important to the country so so it's the adventure it's the the pride of uh, nationhood and uh, and the desire to extend the reach. Uh, Rick, thank you for that. Uh, down at uh, the Cape in Florida, our own Kerry Sanders over his shoulder in that familiar scene is the uh, launch pad of uh, the so many shuttle missions and scattered about the countryside there, our old uh, rusted uh, cement launch pads on which so much American history launched. Uh, Kerry, who have you been able to speak to down there so far today? Well, I've had an opportunity to speak to Kurt Brown, who is a retired shuttle commander. In fact, he commanded three shuttle missions, and then he piloted three missions, and he's been watching this very closely today. And I've just sort of gotten a handle from him about what type of questions he would want answered right now. Now, as you know, the shuttle was actually beginning to make its re-entry, and it may have been at around Mach 18. It was about 10 minutes into that re-entry where the temperatures were up at some points on the actual shuttle shell there up to temperatures that exceed the temperature on the surface of the sun that's how hot it is his question is what was the loss of data that data he says is going to be the very first question the link that was lost there by the folks on the ground who are trying to determine what caused this problem now there are several things that are happening at this process when the shuttle is coming in it is running two systems on board one is and these are dynamic systems as they call them one is the hydraulic pumps and those are being powered by the uh, uh, the auxiliary power units on board the shuttle. Those hydraulic systems are used um, to actually control, for instance, the, uh, the thrusters as they are, to bring them back and forth. And there is something called a re reaction control system, which also controls the thrusters. Uh, those are used as they're re-entering because the air is so thin there. They're using these thrusters to actually control the attitude and the yaw of the shuttle as it's coming in. And Kurt Brown's question is, what happened? The, the data loss there might indicate when they lost that data stream that something went wrong, either with the uh, auxiliary power unit that was running at the time, which is controlling those uh, hydraulic pumps. And those hydraulic pumps, again, are controlling the flight control systems. Or did they lose something in those thrusters? And that may actually help answer what is going to be a question that so many people are going to be scratching their heads for a long time on is what went wrong here. Kurt Brown says that, of course, much of the debris as it comes down will burn up as it comes on re-entry into, uh, into the atmosphere. But some of the larger pieces, the larger masses, the, the engines for instance, those will make it to the ground but they will be so severely scorched by the temperature of the atmosphere because you understand as it's coming in there's a tremendous amount of friction and it is that friction that creates this tremendous heat. Um, so I believe we're going to hear from NASA here in right. a short while where they're getting ready to talk to us, Brian. Um, but those are at least some of the questions that those who fly these systems are asking themselves right now, trying to 
I guess what many people are doing, trying to find out what went wrong. And Carrie, we've already uh, heard evidence of some of the larger pieces uh, having survived. Associated Press reporting one door has made it. We're looking at uh, animation now. And this is a good reminder that on the early stages of approach, uh, of course, in zero G, it doesn't really matter, but the astronauts are upside down initially uh, or inverted, and then they uh, straighten out to use the bottom of the spacecraft, which is uh, coated with those ceramic tiles, each one individually designed and placed uh, uh, to uh, absorb the heat, and the heat, uh, Kerry pointed out, can exceed the uh, surface of the sun temperature all because of friction. It's it, what happens when a spacecraft re-emerges uh, into the Earth's uh, atmosphere. If this looks like a grainy old film, I guess relatively so, it is. It is from the test series of flights that uh, early uh, shuttle mock-ups took. In the end, as shuttle pilot, uh, you become just what you were in civilian military life. You become a pilot, uh, you're on the stick, uh, you land it with the help of uh, elaborate uh, computer programs, and if all goes well, it comes uh, safely to a halt. Uh, two things to show you. Number one, what NASA is showing us right now, the uh, slide they put up prior to the briefing. Um, a few moments ago, it said uh, uh, 320. It switched to 325, then 330, and now they're putting up the word momentarily. We'll take them at their word. We'll go to this uh, instantly when they start talking. Uh, we also... Uh, have a model of this and the the attitude of the uh, shuttle as it comes down as it's now familiar to you is approximately like this and it's all heat on the nose of the spacecraft uh, so the uh, ceramic tiles which may or may not end up being a factor in all of this today uh, are of course and have always been a crucial part uh, of this spacecraft we uh, still have uh, rick hauck with us from washington and rick with the understanding that i may need to uh, interrupt you uh, at any time how much uh, stick flying uh, is it and is there any option for the pilot are there landing programs or can you take it uh, most flights the commander will take control as the the machine gets subsonic that means below the speed of sound and that's the last two minutes of the flight at that point the shuttle is aerodynamically stable and uh, the, the commander has to maneuver it to fly around as it descends very rapidly, 11,000 feet per minute, and uh, point it down and touch on the, on the runway, touch down about 200 knots. Now, the commander can take over before then at higher altitudes, but the only reason he would do that is if he's still got a flyable machine, but for some reason the computers are pointing him in the wrong direction, in other words, uh, flying in the wrong direction, then he might take over. But uh, quite frankly, the computer can do it much more efficiently than the commander. Rick, how does this fly in relation to, uh, I don't know, a Boeing uh, 777? Uh, I've flown the 747, and I'd say actually the flight controls feels very similar. It's very benign. It feels like a heavy aircraft, but it uh, responds uh, oh, very you know, nicely. Rick, I have to interrupt. We're going to NASA right, right now. Here's the press conference. Introduce the panel for this afternoon's uh, briefing. On the dais here to my left uh, is Ron Didimore. He's the Space Shuttle Program Manager. And to his uh, left is Chief Flight Director Milt Heflin. I'll have brief uh, remarks from both gentlemen, and then we'll throw it open for questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. I'm sure you understand how difficult, how difficult time this is for us right now. We're devastated because of the events that unfolded this morning. There's a certain amount of shock in our system because we have suffered the loss of seven family members. And we're learning to deal with that. There's certainly a somber mood in our teams as we continue to try to understand the events that occurred. But our thoughts and our prayers go out to the families of Rick and Willie, and David and Kalpana. Michael, Laurel, and Elan. True heroes.
and we are suffering for the events that have happened this morning. As difficult as this is for us to do, we wanted to meet with you and be as fair and open with you given the facts as we understand them today. Uh, we will certainly be learning more as we go through the coming hours, days, and weeks. We'll tell you as much as we know. We'll be as honest as we can with you. And certainly we'll try to fill in the blanks over the coming days and weeks. As difficult um, a situation as this is, we are moving forward. We have established a number of different teams. We have contingency plans for the, just these types of events, though we never expect to use them. We, had, we have implemented these contingency plans. We are preserving data. We are beginning thorough and complete investigations. We are mobilizing our forces, our engineers, our technicians, our safety and quality, our best experts to try and understand what went wrong. I do want to take the time right now and express my appreciation for the tre tremendous number of agencies that are coming to our aid from across the country, both federal, state, and local that are assisting us in our recovery operations. I also want to express my appreciation to the public for assisting in the recovery, for notifying us of different debris, where, where it is located, that we might get to it as quickly as possible. It's also appropriate that we tell the public to be careful with the debris. What we fly in space is uh, operated in many cases with toxic propellants. And some of the debris may be contaminated. So we need to be careful. And we don't wish any harm to come upon anybody that would be honestly seeking to help. At this hour, we have not positively identified any items that we have recovered. Uh, we are staging in an attempt to ensure that all recovered items are managed appropriately. But at this stage, I haven't received any real information on debris uh, or status of crew remains. I can go back to the uh, start of the day, filled with excitement and anticipation. Today was a great day to land in the Florida area. We had uh, all positive indications that it was going to be like every other day where we have landed in Florida. Good weather, anxious team to welcome a fantastic crew back. Families that were excited about welcome, welcoming their loved ones back. And no indications at all of any impending threats to the vehicle. The first indications of a potential problem occurred minutes before 8 o'clock Central Standard Time. The first indications were of the loss of sensors, temperature sensors, in the hydraulic systems on the left wing, both the left inboard and left outboard Elevon temperature sensors. They were followed seconds and minutes later by several other problems, including loss of tire pressure indications on the left main gear, and then indications of excessive structural heating. And uh, Mr. Heflin will talk in a minute about uh, some further details. I have to caution you that we cannot yet say what caused the loss of Columbia. It's still very early in our investigation and 
it's going to take us some time to work through the evidence, the analysis, and clearly understand what the cause was. But what we are doing is we are impounding hardware so that we can preserve evidence. We have stopped processing at the Kennedy Space Center. We are preserving hardware around the country in our different facilities. We are impounding data here that represented the last data that we received from the crew. And we'll, we will be pouring over that data 24 hours a day for the foreseeable future. Again, I express our sadness to the families for their loss. And we'll do our best to answer your questions. Okay. Thanks, Ron Milt. <clears throat> First of all, um, uh, just some personal uh, observations and comments to begin with. <clears throat> and then I'll review some, uh, some data with you. <clears throat> um, this is a uh, this is a bad day. Um, I'm glad that I work and and live in a country where we have when we have a bad day we go fix it. Um, Ron said we'll fix it. I can talk to you some about uh, uh, what went on in the flight control room with uh, the entry uh, flight control team under the guidance of flight director Leroy Kane. Ron said it was a good day to land. In fact, many of us, as we came in today, were marveling at the fact that Leroy Kane did the ascent as well. and. And probably the most difficult things that we deal with during launch attempts and entries is dealing with the weather, as, as you all are accustomed to. And we marveled and, and felt good about the fact that, you know, launch, we didn't have any weather issues to work. In fact, any weather issues anywhere in the world that we were concerned about. And, and today, it was a very minor thing to talk about, some fog, I believe, but nothing really hard to work. So, as Ron mentioned, this was a fantastic mission and, and just seemed to be coming to the, the right conclusion. Um, just some specifics for you, and bear with me. This is relatively recent, fresh information, and, and as you can imagine, in the next several hours and days, this will be, we'll get closer to, to, to many details, I'm sure. Um, Around 7.53 a.m. Central Time, as Ron mentioned, we saw indication of um, um, off-scale low measure temperature measurements on the left, the inboard and outboard the hydraulic systems. And, and, and this was loss of the temperature measurement. It wasn't, uh, wasn't any indication that it was high or low. We just lost it. Um, about three minutes later, around 7.56 a.m., uh, in the left main gear, tire wheel, well, uh, brake line, and, and tire temperatures, there we saw an increase. Now, I, I need to tell you that during this time, the vehicle was performing fine. We had no indications of any, of any problem. Around 7.58 a.m. Central Time, a couple of minutes later, we have what we call bond line temperatures. These are temperature sensors that are embedded in the structure of the vehicle. We have them, we have them all over the orbiter. Um, three of these temperatures on the, again, the left side of the vehicle, um, the left wing area, the off-scale low reading again. This was not high indication, low indication, but they were, we lost them, we lost their measurements. I don't have the seconds here. Clearly, seconds will play a part in our analysis, but I'm giving this to you at the nearest 
man at around 7.59 then central time, um, left inboard and outboard tire temperatures and pressures uh, off scale low. Um, about eight, eight measurements total during that time. One of these, one of these measurements uh, uh, sensed on board by the computers gave the crew um, a message, indication that they could look at on their displays. Um, and they, they, we think they were acknowledging that measurement that they saw. Again, the vehicle was flying with no problems at that time. And when things like this happen, when a crew gets an alert, it's a, you acknowledge it, they, they recognize they've seen it, and then we go, we do what we might need to do with it. And as far as I know, that was the last transmission from the crew. I can't, I've asked a couple of people, I haven't heard the tapes myself, I, I'm not sure what they, what they said at the time, but they were acknowledging, we believe, that that indication that they'd seen. Then we lost all vehicle data. Um, it looks like it was around, um, and I apologize, I've got, it looks like my little Cheat sheet here doesn't have the last central time on it, and I'm not going to try to convert it to you at this point. But it's around 8 o'clock, central standard time. Um, altitude was 207,135 feet, and traveling at uh, a Mach of about 18.3. And the flight control team um, during this time, uh, again, uh, we lost the data, and that's when we be clearly begin to know that we had a bad day. That's all I've got. Okay, thanks. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, centers uh, around the agency that are involved today, so we're going to try to limit the questions to one and uh, try to get through as many as we can. I need you guys to do me a favor and uh, when you raise your hand, wait for a microphone and please give your name and affiliation first. And we're going to start here in Houston and then uh, go around to the other NASA centers. So uh, let me see a show of hands and we'll try to get somebody to you. Let's start, just start right here on the, along the front row uh, and work this way. Hi, Melissa Jacobs with the Fox News Network. Where will the debris be taken? We haven't uh, yet identified a central location. Uh, part of the activities that, that are ongoing, even at this very moment, is to stage our teams into a location in uh, uh, northeast Texas. Uh, we are still identifying the locations for our teams to uh, to meet and gather and, and start this process of recovering deb debris. And uh, part of their first activities is to identify the staging area, the collection point of all the debris. So that's some work that's going to be done uh, later on today. The teams are, are, let's see, they're not quite in the air. They're staging right now at the different uh, airports and they're converging on northeast Texas. Uh, and so that's some work that's still uh, in front of us. Sig Christensen, uh, San Antonio Express News. Um, at this point, uh, what is the status of the shuttle program and particularly the, the upcoming missions are you going to have? Have you decided to uh, put all of those missions uh, on hold? And do you have any kind of idea how long the program will be out of service? Well, of course, this thing happened just this morning. And, and uh, we, we put in motion uh, some stop work types of activities. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we've uh, minimized our processing at, at the Kennedy Space Center so that we don't do anything that might disturb some evidence. Uh, we, we are also slowing down our manufacturing processes in, uh, in the Michou facility in Louisiana where we manufacture the external tank. We're doing that in different areas around the country for different pieces of hardware. Uh, what this 
slowdown means as far as the launch schedule is yet to be determined. Um, we also will be having an, uh, an investigative board outside the agency, as mentioned earlier by Mr. O'Keefe, that will come in and, and, and help resolve the situation to everybody's satisfaction so that we clearly understand what was the root cause of the problem. And once we, once we get on a path of understanding the root cause, then we'll be better able to say whether it affects future flights. If we can put, put it off to the side and, and get it narrowed down and say, okay, we understand the root cause, here's the things we do about it or need to do about it, and then accomplish that corrective action on, on the other vehicle flows, then we'll be able to pick up our f flight progress again. How long that's going to take, it's too early for me to tell, but uh, I do believe that uh, we'll continue to meet with you and keep you informed of just how this is progressing. Um, I've talked to uh, Mr. Bill Gerstemeyer, who is the program manager for the International Space Station program. They have scheduled, a, they had a previously scheduled progress launch tomorrow, uh, and that progress launch will proceed as scheduled. They have reviewed the contents that are going to be shipped to the space station, and those contents are appropriate given the fact that we may not be there for a while. Um, they have enough consumables, supplies for the crew to go through the latter part of June without having a shuttle visit. So there's some time for us to work through this uh, and get back on our schedule, and we're just going to have to work through that in the coming days and weeks, and we'll keep you informed on, on just the impact to the manifest. But right now, there is a, certainly there is a hold on uh, future flights until we get ourselves established and understand um, the root cause to this disaster. Okay. My name is Jenny Blankenship. I'm a reporter with the CBS station in Austin. And um, I was wondering if, if you could explain to, to people who are not from this area really how tight-knit of a community this is, not just here on the NASA JSC campus, but all around here, how much of a, an integral part of the community this is to you all. Well, it's, it's more than a job. This, this is a passion for us. Human spaceflight is a passion. It's an emotional event. Uh, and when we work together, we work together as family members. Um, and, and we treat each other much that way. And whether it's the loss of a crew member or a loss of a member of our ground team or processing teams, it's a sad loss for us. And so we are a very close community. We understand the risks that are involved in human spaceflight. And we know that these risks are manageable, but we also know that they're serious and can have deadly consequences. And so we are bound together with the threat of disaster all the time, and we know we must count on each other to do what's right. We must count on the ground teams to process correctly. We must count on our suppliers to follow the procedures just like we have identified to them. And we count on the flight crew members to fly the vehicles within the specifications. So we all rely on each other to make each space flight successful. So we have a dependency. And it's a professional dependency and it's an emotional dependency. And so when we have an event like today, where we lose seven family members, it is devastating to us. Uh, and it's more than just us in this location. There, there is an emotional attachment to human space flight. It, it uh, piques our interest, it captures our imagination. Um, I received a couple of phone calls this morning immediately following uh, immediately following the, uh, when it became apparent that Columbia was no longer going to land, one phone call was from my brother in Phoenix, Arizona, not associated with the space business. 
I haven't talked to him yet. I just received a message, certainly extending his thoughts and prayers. I received another phone call from my son in Provo, Utah, with the same emotional outpouring of sadness. And I'm sure this is true across the country. We're seeing that from the public. We're seeing that as people that really care about the space program and understand what it means to this nation reflect their thoughts, their prayers, their caring attitude to us and, and we want them to know we appreciate it very much as we struggle with our emotions in this difficult time. We appreciate the thoughts, the prayers, the care and the support. Milt, you might have some thoughts also. Well, um, yeah, it, it is, a, the, the community out here is, is extremely close-knit. Um, <clears throat> I've been through three of these. Um, and, and each time, uh, you see a coming together of, of the community here. Our landscape has changed. <clears throat> Space flight business today is not going to be, it's going to be much different than it was yesterday. It was different after the Apollo 1, it was different after Challenger. And it was different because this community, the passionate, Ron's right, the passion is here. And, and as Ron was talking, I was thinking about your question and I thought, you know, sometimes it's a shame uh, that it takes things like this for this country to pull together and, and, and care. And, and it shouldn't. Damn, we're good. This country's great. It shouldn't take these kind of things to cause a coming together. Okay. Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Milt, you mentioned about eight sensors and one of those which triggered some kind of notification inside the, inside the shuttle. Um, can you tell us which sensor that was and whether it was an abnormal reading on whatever sensor it was or whether it was just that the sensor was no longer functioning? There were, <clears throat> in the left inboard and outboard, th these, are these are tire temperatures on the left-hand side, okay. Um, um, temps and pressures, and Ron, help me out here if I, if I, if I get that mixed up. Um, and, and they they all went, they all went what we call off scale low. In other words, there's a bottom number zero, or maybe not zero, not necessarily zero, but there's a bottom number of the measurement. They all just went off scale low, indicating um, loss of the measurement itself. You know. Um, and, and I cannot tell you specifically which one of the eight. Uh, we'll, we'll find that out, but I don't have that right now. No. An, e an easy way to think about that is the measurement was no longer reading. It was not giving an indication. It's, it's as if someone just cut the wire. Okay, right over here. Chris Heinbaugh with WFAA-TV in Dallas. Uh, you indicated that at 7.53 was the first, uh, you first lost some sensor. Uh, information and you indicated towards the end there was an acknowledgement from the crew during the rest of that time period was there any dialogue any communication with the crew during that period and was if there was was there any indication from them uh, that there was a problem uh, that they could see on board uh, at yes at 7:53 a.m. Uh, we did have a, another set of um, four measurements uh, in the hydraulic system on the left-hand side that went off scale low. Now, this was reported by the um, uh, flight controller responsible for the mechanical and hydraulic systems in the orbit reported to the flight director. Um, w when this happens, then it's followed up by if there's any action to take, if there's anything that we see that needs to be done, that flight controller will tell the flight director and a crew and a call might go to the crew. Uh, these were measurements that did not <clears throat> have, um, we, have many, we have many measurements on board. Not all of them are enunciated to the crew. They don't need to be. Uh, and we see a lot more information on the ground than they do. So they did not, did not see this. So they had no indication 
we saw nothing else to indicate any difficulty at all because had we seen anything else, we would have taken some action. That's, you know, we work, we work very hard. We train very hard to react in a very short amount of time to situations. Um, but we don't, if, if, if we don't have anything that we see that we've got to do, then we don't, we don't spend the time talking about it because we focus on the next event and so forth. Right here next, next to him. I'm Brian Sasser, KPRC-TV here in Houston. We had heard some reports that <clears throat> during launch there had been some concerns that some debris hit the wing. Uh, is that true and is that any cause of concern and that could have caused today's problems? Uh, it is true that uh, right after launch, and I don't remember the time frame as far as the seconds, there was a, uh, a piece of foam that is used as insulation on the external tank in the area of what we call the uh, bipod, which is the forward attach uh, between the orbiter and the external tank. There is a piece of foam that, uh, that was shed. And in our review the following day of the launch films, we, we saw this piece of debris drop off. And uh, it, it looked to us like it impacted the orbiter uh, on the left wing. Where on the left wing, it, it's very difficult for us to tell. Uh, somewhere between the mid and outward span. Um, was it the leading edge? We don't know. Was it underneath the leading edge? We really don't know. To the best of our ability, that's what happened. We spent um, a goodly amount of time reviewing that film and then analyzing uh, what that potential impact of debris on the wing might might do and, and would there be any consequences. Uh, through analysis and through our ability uh, to, to call back on our experience with tile, uh, it, was, it was judged that uh, that event did not represent a safety concern. Um, and so uh, the technical community got together and across the country looked at it and, and judged that to be acceptable. And so as we, as we look at that now in hindsight, uh, that impact was on the left wing. Um, and certainly we have all the indications that Milt talked to you about were on the left wing. We can't discount, discount that there might be a connection. Uh, but we have to caution you and ourselves that, uh, that uh, we can't rush to, rush to judgment on it because uh, there are a lot of things in this business that look like the smoking gun but turn out not even to be close. And so uh, we really have to do some regression analysis. We've got to look at what Milt described, you, described to you and then back up in time through analysis to see if we can piece together the events and whether or not this was a tile problem or whether it was a structural issue or some other event. We don't know yet. What will help us determine that uh, is, is inspecting the debris. That will really help us. And so we're very anxious to get certain pieces back to look at. Uh, and that will determine whether or not this particular event, whether it was the debris hitting the orbiter or some other event, was the cause of this problem or this disaster today. Okay, get that gentleman right back behind him. Ryan Korsgaard from KVUE TV in Austin. You talked a little bit about the hardware. What goes forward now with the astronaut training? Does that continue? Does that stop? What happens? Well, there's going to be a, a period of uh, mourning in this community. There's going to be a period where we're just going to get together and support each other and hug each other and, and help us go on. Uh, but we're going to fix this problem. We're going to get back on the launch pad. We're going to launch shuttles again as soon as we're ready. The training is going to continue. The best therapy in this business is to get on with your job. The best therapy in the flight control world is to get in that control center and train for the next mission. The best therapy in, in the flight crew world is to continue with their training. Stay focused on the job ahead. 
stay focused on what we need to accomplish, and that's what we are all going to do. There's going to be a subset of us that will be working together to resolve this problem. And we will do that, and we will do that uh, quickly, efficiently, and we'll do it safely, and we will not fly again until we have this understood. In the meantime, life goes on, training goes on. We'll start manufacturing hardware again as soon as we know that we have preserved evidence. So in, in a few days, I suspect we will start pulling things back to what we understand and releasing certain activities to start up again. But in the next several days, it's going to be a period of quiet, of reflection, and where are we going to go from here as far as what we need to do to resolve this issue. Okay, Greg, let's work on the second row. Start right here on the end. Rashonda Tate, Fox 26 News. Did you have a device on board that is the equivalent of a black box? Uh, no, we don't. We do not have an, a, a, a hardened black box data recorder or voice recorder. We do have recorders. We do have recorders of both data and voice. Um, if they survived the, uh, the entry and the impact, we will certainly look to see if there's any information there. Uh, as Milt mentioned to you on the timeline, he, he talked to you a little bit about these sensors that just kind of quit working. We also know that during this time frame, the vehicle was operating perfectly. It had gone into a roll reversal, which is a standard maneuver where the vehicle banks left or banks right. It's a standard maneuver, and when it does so, it does so to bleed off energy, and you do a number of these roll reversals so that you land at the right speed right at the Kennedy Space Center. It had rolled itself into a roll reversal, and everything from a flight control perspective was perfect. No indications of any problems. So we have some indications that it wasn't a vehicle loss of control issue. Uh, and so we were getting some hints of where we need to go look. Um, whether or not these recorders survived and will, get, and will be useful to us, uh, I'm not really sure that's going to be the case. OK. Anybody on the <clears throat> next person with his hand up there? Jake Dyer, Fort Worth Star Telegram. I have a couple of questions. Um, regarding the, whatever it was, the foam that uh, apparently fell off the, uh, the vehicle at takeoff, was there any consideration during the flight that perhaps an EVA would be necessary that you guys need to go out and take a look? Secondarily, I, uh, I'm wondering about, you guys talked about uh, loss of sensor readings and sort of unusual sensor readings. Could you give us a sense about how unusual that is? I mean, is that, do you, is that, does that happen with any frequency, or is that, was that something that was alarming that you'd never seen before? Um, the easy answer on, is the uh, sensor reading, and yes, that happens. The fact that you have a sensor that just quits working is not an alarming factor. Uh, in fact, we understand that several sensors can quit working, and uh, they're all a result of not the sensor quit, quitting to work, they're a result of a box an avionics box, a signal conditioner, or a uh, multiplexer demultiplexer that happens to fail, and its signature to you and me is the fact that it looks like someone just cut the wire. Uh, and we've seen this on occasion, and we certainly train for it many, many times over. So it is not unusual for us when we see it to look at it and immediately start to understand whether it is a single sensor problem or it's an avionics box. The team today looked at it, as they are trained to do, and could not see any common thread between this sensor and, an, and another sensor. There's nothing common about it, and so that made it more significant. As soon as we understood it wasn't a common avionics box and that there were multiple sensors, all completely independent, um, and all this happened in a very short period of time, we knew that something was not right. Uh, now, you asked me something else on the, uh, on the phone. Uh, the idea of the spacewalk. Oh, the spacewalk. We do not have the capability to perform a spacewalk and do tile repair. 
We do not have the capability, as you know, when we go out of the spacecraft, we operate really within the confines of the payload bay. On this particular mission, there was no remote manipulator system. There was no arm. Uh, and so all we had trained to do from a spacewalk perspective were those things that might be an emergency or a, 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 a latch did not work in the payload bay door closing sequence or something like that. We can go outside and make sure the payload bay doors are closed. We have no capability to go over the side of the vehicle and go underneath the vehicle uh, and look for a, an area of distress and repair of tile. We, we know we have no capability. If for some reason we thought we had a tile problem, the, the risk you take when you launch is that you may suffer a tile issue. We have no capability to repair it. All we can do is, before we launch, design robustness into the system so that a loss of some tile capability will not result in loss of crew or vehicle. Uh, does that answer your question? We have no capability to do that today. There is no capability to inspect it. We are not able to look on the underside of the vehicle. And again, our, our rationale, our retention rationale, why we believe we can are continuing, are, are continue to fly safely is that we test our tiles on the ground they're robust, they're hard enough to withstand certain levels of impact, and then we design our environment so that we don't have these circumstances. It, we don't believe at this point that the impact of that ET debris on the tile was the cause of our problem. We convinced ourselves as, as, as we analyzed it 10 days ago that it was not going to represent a safety issue. Now. We had the events of this morning. We're going to go back and see if there is connection. Uh, is that the smoking gun? It is not. We don't know enough about it. A lot more analysis and evidence needs to come to the table. So it's not fair to represent the tile damage as the source. It's just something we need to go look at. Uh, yeah, Graham, right there next to you. No, no, right here next Yeah. Gina Treadgold with ABC News. There are reports from an astronomer at Caltech that the shuttle was, uh, debris was flying off the shuttle as early as a flyover in Owens Valley in California. How does that match up with this timeline and are you aware of those reports? It's news, isn't it? Well, I haven't heard that uh, report. And sometimes as you uh, go through entry and are in a plasma, Sometimes you see plasma. It looks like debris, but it's really not debris. It's plasma. Uh, it's just the fact that you're going really fast through the atmosphere. Um, if, if he saw something over Hawaii, uh, recognize we flew a good long while before we got to the Texas area. Uh, and, and so it's, it's doubtful that we had something uh, in Hawaii that would cause us a thermal concern. Uh, at the time that we believe we lost the vehicle, as Mild explained, it was about Mach 18, or 18 times the speed of sound. We were at our peak heating. We were at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the wing leading edge. And uh, if we did have a structural problem or a thermal problem, you would, you would expect to get it at the peak heating, not back at Hawaii when you weren't suffering any real thermal uh, environment extreme thermal environment. The, the most extreme thermal environment was right at Mach 18, and that's where we lost the vehicle. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Dinmore and Gesselman with Newsweek. You mentioned in your um, opening comments that, that there was indication of excessive structural heating. When did that happen in the timeline um, from 7.53 and on? And secondly, at any point between 7.53 and 8 a.m., were the folks in mission control worried? Let's see, you respond about the mission control. Let me talk about these bond line temps. We mentioned that, and I might have overstated it when I said excessive heating, because as I look at the notes here, the bond line temps on the left side of the vehicle were off scale low, which means it looked like the, the rest of the measurements, it looked like they had been cut. So uh, 
I, pro I probably misspoke on that by saying excessive heating. It really is that we lost those measurements too. Um, the mood uh, in my area where I observe the flight control team uh, was, uh, was very upbeat and then we started to understand a little bit about these multiple loss of sensors. We recognized there was no commonality. We lost voice with the crew. We lost tracking data. We had no TV. As we came to find out later, there were, we saw the uh, TV reports of debris. We did not have that at the time. And so we were very anxious because we knew we were in an area of good communication coverage. Uh, we were in an area where we should have tracking and we had lost both. And as we uh, started adding all these up, the, uh, we were certainly most anxious. Look at this gentleman right behind you. There you go. Ron, Thayer Evans from the uh, Daily Oklahoma in Oklahoma City. Um, can you confirm reports of debris in other states besides Texas, namely Oklahoma, and also offer your thoughts on Mike Anderson? I can't confirm any debris in Oklahoma, and I would doubt any debris in Oklahoma because our ground track was basically just north of Dallas on a path that uh, went through uh, northeast Texas, Nacogdoches, area from, from northwest to southeast. That's going to be the ground track. That's going to be the, the interest of our search. Mike Anderson, uh, I suspect you asked me because uh, we are both from the same hometown. Um, Mike and I, uh, we have common backgrounds. He uh, attended my rival high school. Um, he graduated from Cheney High School. I graduated much earlier than he did, I'm sad to say, but uh, uh, from Medical Lake High School, and we were arch rivals. And he and I had a good uh, communication going about, about that. He was a, he grew up on uh, an Air Force base, Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington. I also grew up on Spoke in Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. He went to the same grade school I did. We had a very common early beginning, but I, I told him that I, I was his pathfinder. And uh, so we had a good relationship. And we talked many times about how he had met his wife in Spokane. I also met my wife in Spokane. His parents lived there, my parents lived there, my wife's parents lived there. A lot of commonality. I'm gonna miss Mike. Yeah. I'm going to miss the closeness that we had. Okay. Let me reach this person right here. Sanjay Bhatt, Cox News Service in Palm Beach Post. We heard that earlier today that, that this crew was very passionate about the work they were doing, the scientific experiments that they were conducting, and uh, we heard that they wouldn't, that their loss would not be in vain. What I'm wondering is the, how many of the experiments aboard, in terms of the data being collected required that the astronauts and the craft return safely to Earth. And uh, because there were some new laboratory modules on this craft, is there anything to suggest that those could have uh, contributed at all to what we saw? Well, <clears throat> I, Ron, I don't have the answer to it. Maybe you do on the number of experiments that we, uh, that we have to have the return of the heart. I don't have that. I'm sure we can get that for you. Uh, and I can't imagine space have being on board back in the cargo bay had anything to do with this. Let me just uh, say something about the science. This vehicle on orbit, we kind of pinched ourselves over the past 16 days. This vehicle performed flawlessly, absolutely flawlessly. The science was, uh, was a premium. The folks on the ground were just ecstatic with the amount of science that they were reaping and they were looking forward to getting much of that information back on the ground. Certainly some of it was uh, downlinked to the ground prior to entry. Some of it was, will be their legacy. Others uh, had to come back and be analyzed in which that particular part of the science would be lost. 
but it was an amazing mission. And uh, we were ecstatic over the results and looking forward uh, to talking to the crew and telling them what a great job they had done. And so it, it is a painful experience for us to lose our friends and, and recognize that things were going so well and turned out so badly. Valor Time Magazine, could you share with us the last words that came from the crew? Well, I, a while ago, uh, the last transmission that we got was, um, it had to do, I think I, a while ago I discussed that there was a measurement that gave an indication to the crew and an alert that they acknowledged. Uh, I, I can't tell you what they said at that time. I don't know what the word was, but it, 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 was, it was the sort of thing that, that when something like that occurs, that the crew's response is fairly typical just to let the ground know we see that. Uh, that's the, how, how the routine works. And, and uh, that was the last transmission uh, from the crew that I am aware of. And I think as we go, you know, as we go through uh, and, 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 and peel this apart, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have more, more information like that that we can share with you. Okay, I've got time for two more questions here before I need to go to the other NASA centers. Grab this gentleman and then this young lady on the next row. Elizabeth Lee with KHWB Television. Um, a brief loss of communication, has that happened before during re-entry? And if so, when you did lose communication, was there still hope that perhaps it was just brief? And at what point did you realize that it was something more grave? We lose communication from time to time for uh, various reasons. We certainly lose it during the orbit phase. We've lost it sometimes for a whole revolution of 90 minutes. Um, on entry, though, we, we understand that any dropouts generally are brief. Uh, and if they do occur, they occur during the peak heating time frames when the plasma around the vehicle as it is uh, at its maximum extent. And so a brief uh, dropout at this time period is, is no reason for us to be concerned. Uh, our experience is we gain it back fairly quickly. Our concern at this time was that uh, as we made several calls to them, they did not respond. We made several more calls to them via UHF, which is usually as reliable as anything, and they did not respond. Uh, and it became apparent to us that uh, we were in difficult circumstances. Okay, last question right there. Go ahead. When you guys first got that anomalous sort of readings where you run clear of, you know, something strange is going on, at that point, was it, uh, was it a situation where you guys were committed? I mean, there was nothing you could have done about it. As soon as, when you first saw those readings that the, the uh, you know, that you, things went blank or whatever, was there any, was any corrective action whatsoever at that point that you could have done? Nothing that we could do. Just observe and see if there was any, going to be any future downstream impact to the landing. Uh, in fact, if, this, if that's all we did was lose those 12-odd sensors, no impact to this flight at all. We would have come back and repaired the sensors. They don't impact the flying qualities of the vehicle. They don't impact the insight into, uh, into how we control the vehicle. All they do is provide us information on how the systems perform so that when we turn around the vehicle for the next flight, gives us indications of where we should look. Um, did not affect and would not affect the flight given just the sensor by itself. Okay, let's go to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for questions, please. Uh, yes, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, Ron, I have a written report from earlier in this flight that there was a potential for a large damage area to the tile, and given that, I'm wondering how and why was it deemed, uh, deemed minor by NASA? And do you have any idea how much of a damage area may have been left on the left wing and how big that piece of foam was that came off? We have a pretty good idea how big the size of foam was. Uh, what we don't understand very well was what the actual impact did to the tile. And so we have to use our analysis and uh, our engineering expertise to help us understand how a piece of foam 
of certain weight and density impacting the wing at certain velocity, what it does to the tile. And our experts gathered together, and we've, we have people in this system that have worked on these tiles since the beginning of the program, and we understand how the tiles function, we understand the tile's ability to withstand damage, we understand the thermal characteristics of the tile both on the surface of the tile and at the base of the tile. And as we, as we got together and reviewed this information, we were convinced technically and analytically that the tile would not, the, the impact of the debris on the tile would not represent a safety of flight issue. In fact, we were anxious to come back and get the, the handheld film that the crew takes as soon as they get to orbit uh, of the external tank as it's moving away. We asked them to take pictures of the external tank so we can understand exactly where the foam was shed from the tank. And we were anxious to get that piece of information because we felt that we needed to analyze it so that it would not occur on future flights. We, we have a flight readiness review coming up for the next flight. Uh, it was scheduled for February the 20th, and we knew we had some technical work to do to make sure that uh, we understood why this piece of debris came off. We were not concerned with Columbia. We felt we had analyzed that, and we felt we uh, uh, understood it such that it was not a thermal concern to us, did not represent a control issue or a safety of flight issue. And I, again, I'm going to caution you that, um, that that is the case today. We have no information that would say that is not the case. We are going to go look at it again uh, to see if there is a connection between what Milt talked to you about and the fact that we had a debris impact on the tile. Uh, and there's some other things we need to go look at. The tile is just one. And, and so uh, we were satisfied that we did the proper work. Uh, and across the community, our safety, our quality, our crew members, our flight controllers, and the program management reviewed the technical analysis and agreed to a person that it was not an impact to this flight. And so we need to go back and look at that, of course. But that's the events as they unfolded. Edler from Florida today. I, uh, I'm sorry to ask another question about the external tank, but has this happened before? Has foam come off the tank? Has it impacted the shuttle? And what were the consequences that you saw? We, we had an ev event on STS-112 just uh, several flights ago where a piece of debris from the same general area was shed by the tank. And this particular debris, and I can't tell you today whether it's of the same general size, but it came from the same general area. And uh, it impacted the, uh, the aft skirt on one of the boosters. Uh, superficial damage occurred. When we got the booster back in port and looked at it, evaluated it, um, reviewed it technically, discussed it at the following flight readiness review, which was STS-13. We as an agency, as a shuttle program, uh, decided that that did not represent a technical safety risk to us. Uh, we have from time to time uh, debris. Ice can come off the tank. Um, uh, frost, pieces of debris, and they impact the bottom of the vehicle. Uh, several years ago, we had, we had a, a problem where we were, as we were, uh, during the launch phase, we were uh, popcorning pieces of this insulation on the tile. It would effectively reach a certain point in the ascent, and it would popcorn out and impact the bottom of the vehicle, and it would cause damage to the tile but not damage that was a concern from a safety standpoint, damage that when we got back we had to repair or maybe replace a tile. We have subsequently fixed that problem and as we were looking at this particular problem of uh, debris shedding in this one bipod region on STS-112, uh, we said, well, we've got an area that we need to fix and we have a turnaround discussion but not a safety of flight issue. 
We flew STS-113. We didn't shed any external tank debris. On STS-107, as we looked at the films on the following day, we saw the same type of debris being shed from the same location. In this case, it didn't impact the booster. It impacted the left wing. So again, two occurrences in the last three flights is certainly the signal to our team that something has changed. It did not represent on the first occasion uh, an alarm from a safety point of view. It represented a turnaround processing issue. As we go forward in our investigation, we're certainly going to look in this area and, and determine whether or not this was a contributor to the loss of Columbia and the loss of the crew. This is Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. Ron, could you talk a little about who all and what all was involved in the analysis of the tile issue after launch? Did you ever give any thought to using telescopes to look for signs of damage to the orbiter? And if you had detected um, extensive damage to the TPS, is there anything you could have done with the angle of attack or anything else uh, during reentry to have reduced stress on that part of the vehicle? The easy part of that question is there's nothing that we can do about tile damage once we get to orbit. <clears throat> we can't minimize the heating to the point that it, that it would somehow uh, not require a tile. And so once you get to orbit, you're there and you have your tile insulation and uh, that's, that's all you have for protection on the way home from the extreme thermal heating during reentry. Um, we have experience in the past of uh, having events that have occurred that have occurred that would that we have assessed using other assets to maybe get a close-up look at uh, the bottom of the orbiter. Recall uh, a year or two ago we lost the drag chute door uh, right at liftoff. It fell off, and uh, we actually tried to take some pictures of the back end of the vehicle to see what was really there so that we can understand our thermal heating in that case. And those pictures that we received were not very useful to us. So that was part of our background. Combine that, our feeling that we didn't believe the pictures would be very useful to us with the fact that there was not much, there was zero that we could do about it. And in this case, we elected not even to take the pictures. We believed that our technical analysis was sufficient. We couldn't do anything about it anyway. We were in the best possible position. And so we elected not to take any pictures from any other sources. And that's the way that played out. So we have heard now from the folks at NASA, obviously they are all hurting. They all worked very closely as a team. As you heard, the uh, briefer, the deputy administrator worked very closely. In fact, with one of the astronauts who was lost in today's uh, downing, the catastrophic failure of the shuttle Columbia. We know much more than we knew earlier that many detections were made on the ground of anomalies on board the spacecraft at the late stage of the flight just before breakup and then impact of the debris among them heat sensors and also the notion of a piece of foam debris having caused some sort of damage to some one or more of the heat shield tiles has now been brought up we have a piece of a, a computer animation for you to show you the path the final glide path of the shuttle Columbia. This was early this morning. This puts us around 9 a.m. again on its final descent, an altitude of 200,000 feet, 38 miles and change above the U.S. at 18 Mach. A lot of the wreckage landing over an area several towns long in the eastern part of the state of Texas. And from satellites in space, Obviously, you see a line of uh, showers there in the picture, the green circle. But this shows, we are told, not thunderstorms, the orange and red and yellow animation, the streak right there. Rather, the debris shield 
the debris shield following the explosion and breakup of the shuttle. Again, the green on the radar is just ground clutter around the Shreveport, Louisiana area, but we are told that this loop of satellite from Texas this morning shows the electronic echoes coming back from debris landing from the shuttle. Let's go to NBC News Chief Science Correspondent Robert Bazell. And Bob, we have heard from this briefing how to put this, that one is, two, is true and two is true, but they may not add up to make three in this case, correct? Well, act, act, absolutely, Brian. I think any veterans of these investigations will tell you that it, it's very important not to jump to conclusions in the first few hours. But anyone who listened to the, the briefing can tell that they spent a lot of time talking about a piece of insulation that fell off the external fuel tank, which is the big orange uh, thing that we see in the middle of the, the, uh, below the orbiter uh, during launch. We see it right there. When it was launched on January 16th, a piece of insulation fell off that fuel tank. I don't know if we'll see it in this picture or not, but a piece of, yeah, there you see a piece of insulation came off and it struck the orbiter on the left wing, underneath the left wing. Now that could be a critical part of information, point of information, because that's where the thermal protection tiles are. Those protection tiles are what preserves the orbiter as it comes in, in from space uh, on its way toward, toward ground. And it's very significant that the orbiter blew up uh, just at the time when the temperature is at the maximum, as it's, uh, it encounters this enormous amount of friction from the atmosphere as it's coming in towards the ground. Now, we heard the officials at Mission Control saying that they were aware that that piece of debris had struck the left side of the orbiter, uh, that they analyzed that data and that they decided it was not a problem. It was also significant that they said during the interview that even if they had decided there was a problem, there wasn't much they can do about it. Uh, the question was asked, well, could they have done a spacewalk to go out and look and see if the tiles were intact? And the answer was they did not have that capability, that they only had redundancy and they hoped that the other tiles would stay in place. So you can certainly unfold a scenario where that piece of debris hit the shuttle on the left side there and caused a hole to, to be there which would allow heat to come in and cause the shuttle to explode. It also could be a critical part of this scenario that the first temperature sensors that, were, that the mission controllers couldn't see were on the left side. So that's where they first lost the contact with the telemetry from the vehicle as it was entering uh, on its way back to Earth. The other thing is that the other sensors within the vehicle's wheels inside where the wheels are and other hydraulics did show an a increase in heat right afterwards. That was the second event that happened. So there is a likely scenario here that there was a defective tile that the heat of reentry caused the uh, heat to come into the orbiter, that the orbiter then flew apart because of the excessive heat. That's all, of course, a theory, and it's a theory that seems to make sense in these first few hours of the investigation. The people at Mission Control said that they are going to spend 24 hours a day for the foreseeable future pouring over all the data that, they, that came in, the telemetry that came in during the orbiter's descent. They'll also be looking again and again at those pictures we just saw, I think, of the, of the tile damage to think that whether that tile damage could have been a possibility. They said they ruled it out right after the launch, but they're certainly not going to rule it out now. Uh, and they will be looking at every other aspect of, of the descent to try to figure out what happened. Again, it's very early. This is the first clue, it's the first, but it's a, and there's a tile that we see on the ground that fell off the shuttle and landed somewhere in Texas. Uh, it's very early in the investigation. We don't know what happened, but this scenario with a piece coming off the tank, hitting the left wing, causing tile damage is the most likely scenario right now. However, we have to emphasize that the investigation is only in its first hours. Brian? Robert Bazell here with us in New York, and let's go to a man who has uh, flown uh, the spacecraft. Rick Houck is with us uh, from Washington. You've been listening intently right along with us. We, we see a temperature elevation uh, in a, uh, a, a, if I read this correctly, in a brake line and a tire temperature increase. We know from that there is heat infiltration from somewhere, but as I said to Bob, putting one to two together and getting three is another matter entirely. Right, well, the, the, uh, the coincidence is striking about the uh, piece of uh, insulation coming off the uh, external tank. I'm sure that uh, in hindsight, they wish that they had taken the photographs that uh, Ron Didabor was talking about, even though it may not have uh, 
uh, afforded them any information. I'm talking about fo photographs from ground telescopes. Uh, I can understand why they didn't do it, but now that something's happened, uh, um, they'd probably like to turn back the clock just as, in terms of a diagnostic. Uh, it's, uh, I think we've certainly learned a lot more. The, uh, the loss of signals, uh, mo most of these were loss of signal. We did have the increase in the landing gear. Uh, wheel well, brake lines, and tire temperatures, and uh, and then the loss of uh, all the data at uh, 207,000 feet. Uh, so uh, they've certainly got one path to uh, go down to try to understand what's happened. And I think, uh, by the way, uh, Ron and, and Milt uh, are uh, consummate professionals. I worked with them when I was back in the space shuttle program. Uh, they said, let's be careful. Let's not get distracted from other possibilities. And I'm sure that this is one area that they will be looking very closely at. Now, uh, let's see here where to, where to begin. Uh, they both, when the levels were elevated, they were still, the readings were still below minimums, correct? It could have, it, had it come all the way to fruition, landing and shocks under the wheels, they would have perhaps gone back and said, you know, we saw some, we saw some elevated temperature levels there on final approach, correct? Uh, yes, I'd, I'd take it that way, Brian. And so that was not in and of itself uh, at all fatal uh, uh, readings. It's just that we now know it was an indicator of something to come. Right, and that occurred at, uh, at uh, 8.56 Eastern Time, and uh, they lost all data about uh, three minutes later. So it would be interesting, was it still trending up when they lost the data? Uh, but, but that's just, uh, just a, one, of, one of the signatures. I was interested in one of the questions by uh, one of the news people. They said that an astronomer in Owens Valley, if mm -hmm. I got it correctly, had seen some debris coming off and uh, Ron Dittimore answered the question as if that was someone in Hawaii. Now I believe the Owens Valley is in California. That's right. And so uh, I certainly understand Ron's point that anything over Hawaii would not be interesting to them, but uh, over California there might be something interesting there. We want to bring in one of your uh, former colleagues. Uh, Winston Scott uh, spent 24 days in space on two missions on the Columbia and the Endeavor. Uh, he knew all of Columbia's uh, crew members. Uh, he is with us by telephone. Mr. Scott, do you uh, concur with uh, what you've been hearing us talk about, the analysis so far by uh, Rick Hauck? Ah, evidently we don't have Winston Scott. We've been uh, endeavoring to bring in his uh, phone call. We will continue to. Uh, Rick, uh, when you have readings like this, would how much of the crew uh, uh, how much would the crew have been aware of we know there was a transmission at least on the uh, tire temperature right uh, some of these uh, readings are are read on the scopes within the shuttle uh, if if it's not on the shuttle you get a heck of a lot more data down to Houston than you have on the shuttle and if in fact there's no immediate threat uh, deemed by Houston if they see some different trends in temperatures or pressures they won't call the crew uh, uh, on every uh, every single excursion and as uh, Ron or Milt said um, periodically you, ha you do have losses of signals uh, uh, like you've lost a multiplexer, demultiplexer or something and that in, in and of itself would not be a crisis situation. And how many elapsed seconds are we talking about that the astronauts would have known of some elevated level somewhere? Well, since that they didn't mention it until right towards, uh, or they, they, I guess they didn't mention it. Houston said, we see your elevated temperatures. Right. So my guess is the crew saw it and thought, well, okay, that's not a big deal yet. Uh, it's, I, I could not speculate as to how long it had been uh, from the time that they may have seen it. Okay. We want to bring in uh, NBC News correspondent Chip Reed, who has a... Uh, special example for us uh, just what it's like uh, inside uh, this spacecraft and where they would have been uh, looking in the uh, final moments here chip well brian this is a mock-up an actual scale model the real thing uh, it was actually based on the columbia itself right down to the numbers on the individual heat 
tiles. These are actually technically known as ablatement tiles, heat shield tiles. They protect the shuttle as it's entering the Earth's atmosphere. And right here, just like on the real thing, three very thick pieces of glass. This was built for movies and also as an educational tool. It's been in Armageddon. It's been in Space Cowboys. It's been in Deep Impact. Uh, this is one of the jump seats where a mission specialist would sit. In fact, Sally Ride, the first woman, American woman in space, was in this at one point uh, in the process of making an educational video, and she said that it was so realistic, it was spooky. This is the back half of the flight bridge. It's on wheels. You can give it a little bit of a tug. It's about 1,500 pounds. If we had a few more people, you could wheel it up here, put it together with the front, front half of the flight bridge, which of course is the cockpit, and these are the two gentlemen. By the way, the last two movie stars who were in here were Clint Eastwood and Tommy Lee Jones. These are not Clint Eastwood and Tommy Lee Jones, but they know vastly more about it. And Brian, less people think this is about Hollywood fun and games. It is not. These people consider NASA family. They consider the shuttle and the space program absolutely sacred. It has been part of their lives, pretty much all their lives. This is Brick Price and John Palmer. And I assume you two exchanged a phone call today shortly after this happened. Uh, uh, that was my wake-up call from John. He said that he sounded very down, and I knew something was wrong immediately. And he said that the um, Columbia had exploded on reentry, and uh, shocking to me. And you have been with this particular uh, model for how many years and you don't just use it for Hollywood this is an educational tool you believe there is great value in teaching children and others about the space program and the shuttle in particular oh absolutely the most valuable asset we have is the children because they really give us our future so uh, we use this in educational programs as edu educational films Museum, well, museum work. Well, educate us a little bit. This is the cockpit. This was a blueprint model, the actual original Columbia, but it has changed since then. They've gone to uh, what is known as the glass cockpit. Yes, that's true. Basically, from here to the Roland Bank and card uh, compasses on the other side, this is no longer three-dimensional. It's just a sheet of glass covering, I think it's six monitors that throw all of this information up on the screen so that it's it's clean and it's all digital and it's modern and Columbia had this done I think three years ago. Now how would this differ from flying say a commercial jet? I think you were saying earlier they call this what the flying brick? Is that the term they yeah, use they for a shuttle? To, Some it, do, yeah. yeah uh, it, it's well obviously it comes in it has no engines so it gets one pass at landing. Uh, it's about 45 tons when it comes down. Uh, it certainly is computer controlled but they have a manual override in case something were to happen. Uh, it's, I haven't ever, ever heard an astronaut say it's hard to fly, it's just different. I mean, you couldn't take a 747 captain and put him in here and expect him to fly. You were telling me earlier about the respect you have, both of you were telling me about the respect you have for the uh, women and men who go up in these things. Right. Tell me about that because you know them personally. A lot of them are friends. We've met them over the years as a result of what we do. And I used to be in aerospace. John came from a computer background. And um, so it, it is a very tight community. And uh, to realize that something like this happens, it touches us, you know, to be, to be in this, involved in this this way. And you said you use it as an educational tool. Give me a, an example of the kinds of things you've used this very model for. Well, we've offered it uh, to schools uh, on a, a gratis basis so that they can bring uh, students through here and show them what it is that the shuttle's all about, give them some inspiration to become astronauts, perhaps, or work in the space program. Uh, we've worked in a lot of museums. We have 25 of these around the world that we've built in the past 25 years. So that's an average of one a year. Do you fear that an event like this horrible tragedy today is something that could set back the space program and no. the mission of the shuttles? No. No more so than uh, when pioneers came across country to settle the West. And there were thousands of people that were killed during that. Uh, there is some risk, of course, but uh, it's a calculated risk. And the people who are involved know that there is that risk, and they embrace it. And um, we're very much behind the space program, obviously. It's hard to say. I was devastated this morning when it happened. Yeah. I saw it about 7 o'clock. I called Rick, got him up. Uh, we're like the cousins of, of NASA. We've produced film for NASA. We've produced museums. I didn't know any of these astronauts, but it was, you know, it's community. Uh, we know Buzz Aldrin and Sally Ride and Dave Scott, and, you know, we know a number of them. So you feel it, not just Americans, but a tremendous personal loss when a tragedy like this happens. Right. So, Brian, as you see, uh, NASA has a very big family, probably uh, the entire American uh, public and probably a lot of people around the world, but uh, 
Having spent uh, a good deal of time here this afternoon with these gentlemen and the other people here, uh, this is really hitting hard here. Brian. Chip Reed, our thanks as well to Brick and John there uh, at the uh, simulator. And uh, we, uh, again, want to just revisit this for a moment. We have uh, another guest eyewitness we're going to bring in. I, I want to go briefly back to uh, Rick Hawk. Uh, Rick, I interrupted you uh, earlier for the news conference. We were talking about flying a commercial jet, in your case a 74 versus flying the shuttle, what the stick felt like in both. What was the comparison you were about to make? Right, well, I, I did have the opportunity to fly the 747 and, uh, and the C-135, both big airplanes. And uh, very once you're subsonic, uh, once you're below the speed of sound, and that's the last uh, three or four minutes of flight. So uh, very responsive. Uh, I recall on my first uh, landing after my first flight in 1984, uh, I was as tired as I've ever been. I had concern that I wouldn't have uh, the alertness, but good old adrenaline uh, did its thing, and, and I, I think I did a pretty good landing. <laughs> By all evidence, you did. Uh, tell us more about these tiles. It's such an ephemeral notion to people who can only compare them to the tiles they know in a bathroom or a kitchen. How big are they? How much do they weigh? And how much of a science is fitting them in? Because they're going to be under such scrutiny now for this next flight. Right. Well, the tiles are, uh, for the most part, the, the black ones that, that form the black surface underneath the space shuttle uh, right here. Uh, they are about um, 8 inches by 8 inches in various thickness. Each one is serialized and is carved specifically to fit at that particular point. 20,000 of them that cover the bottom. And uh, over the years, I think they've proved their value. They are attached uh, with a, a kind of a glue. They're, uh, they're filled. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, water, uh, something to keep the water from intruding uh, during rain and so forth, or rain prior to launch. And uh, I think the history, a hundred and some flights, uh, not really having a problem uh, once with the tiles uh, gives them some sense of comfort that uh, you should expect it to be um, uh, safe in future flights, but it is personnel intensive. Uh, the individuals down at the uh, uh, facility in the Kennedy Space Center that work on the tiles are trained experts and they replace them uh, regularly when the shuttle lands on the runway. Sometimes uh, dirt, uh, maybe a rock kicks up and scrapes one. So changing those tiles and, and studying them after every flight is uh, is the normal course of business. If you're just joining us, Rick Houck was the uh, pilot of the shuttle mission that followed the loss of the Challenger. Rick, one other question I had coming out of the briefing. Uh, one of the briefers, and I forget which one, said about uh, a set of data, we don't have the seconds yet. Is he talking about redundancies that are recorded somewhere? No, I think he was giving a timeline, and he, and he gave you the central uh, standard time, uh, 853, 856. Oh, okay. what, he, what he wanted to tell you was he didn't have it down to the second. Okay, so 853.05. 50607 I get you. Right. Okay, thank uh -huh. you. We want to bring in now a uh, uh, an eyewitness to uh some of what transpired today in Texas. Dennis Corder is with us. He is uh, public utilities director in San Augustine, Texas. And uh, uh, Dennis, I'll let you tell the story from uh, what you started seeing and hearing this morning your time. Uh can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Uh this morning early about a little bit before seven o'clock, I was outside and saw a, a streamer, you know, the rooster tail, whatever they call it, the, from the jet stream from the shuttle where it came over. And uh, I'd went back inside and sat down. I was watching the news show, as a matter of fact, and early morning, and the the roaring started, and the house started shaking, and windows vibrating and I got up and went back outside my wife came running to she was still in bed woke up and came running out and wanted to know what was shaking the house and I told her I wasn't really sure I, and it you know it sounded like an airplane crashed and I understand you had some debris there how long after the roar did did something fall oh probably 10 minutes 10 something minutes like that I was walked around at that time to come in I heard it come outside look around out front and I walked around out back and I could hear it, kind of a whistling sound. Just remind you of the old noises they made for bombs in the movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came, it came out. It wasn't a. I found it. It wasn't a very big piece. Had a little cloud of 
smoke behind it, probably about eight or ten foot long. It came down and hit a tree in the woods in the back of the house. And, um, I came back in and was watching the news show, and they had mentioned that they had lost communications with it, which wasn't unusual for a short period of time, but they went on and said about 10 or 15 minutes later they couldn't get received communication on it, and I just kind of assumed that's what it was. And I called NASA, tried to tell them I'd seen debris falling out of the sky, but at that time I guess they said they were trying to monitor the situation. It wasn't, I don't guess anybody knew exactly what was going on at the moment. So this was time, long. Was this about was about ten minutes after eight our time this morning, or really about five after eight. Whenever the uh, I was first looking for it and heard the the sound. And the this noise. was long before you knew the warnings about going near this stuff. Oh yeah, oh yes. It was it was a good bit before it, but uh, I just went out there to see what it was. I was kind of curious what was, what was falling. Do you know of any other debris? Town. Did your neighbors get uh, uh, similar pieces of debris? Anybody uh, else in town? Yes, sir. We're finding. We have a. They have the fire department has a command post set up right down the road at a little church, and we're finding debris all over the county. What? Uh, all out, all in town, all out in the county roads, and there's no telling what's in the woods that hadn't been found yet. Anything identifiable to you? I'm not really. I'm not technical enough to really know what that. I'm not sure what I found. I just know it's a piece of metal with a bunch of bolts in it. What was the moment you realized what you had seen in the sky? Uh, about whenever they claimed they couldn't receive communication back with it, I assume that's what it was. I, I don't know that, you know, that was the exact time. Boy, I know it's been a, a busy day for you already this Saturday. Dennis Corder, uh, Public yeah. Utility Director in San Augustine, Texas. I uh, wish we didn't uh, have to uh, have this conversation knowing uh, what you found uh, was in relation to this terrible loss of life today. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. And uh, I'd like to go back to uh, Rick Halk. Rick, you've been watching along with us some of this videotape we've been rolling in during our conversation. It often includes new pictures that are new to us. A any of these, okay. uh, what, what was almost the size of a cash box with a, a, a handle on it, a any of these identifiable parts to you, any of the joints, the hinges? Well, I saw some, uh, uh, one box that I think you're referring to that, well, that piece right there, I'm guessing uh, might be part of a leading edge of a wing. Mm -hmm. Those pieces there look like some of the uh, thermal blanket that might have been inside the shuttle mm -hmm. or even on the top of the wings. There are thermal blankets on top of the wings, but there's a lot of that material uh, on the space shuttle. There was another piece that you might be going to Yeah, next. right here. Yeah, well, that's that box, and I don't... Uh, of course, it's, uh, I, I could only speculate, but that's yeah. an electronic box there. There was another piece that looked like a big... Uh, kind of a U-shape or C-shape that was uh, lying on the ground that almost looked like it could have been part of one of the wings. Uh, but uh, it's hard to tell from, uh, from these pictures. It's, a, it's an awful ghoulish business, isn't it? I mean, after all, we're, we're talking about what was the vessel for seven souls today. Yeah, it is, and, and uh, it, it's difficult for everybody. And, and if I could just reemphasize to all your listeners, you are doing the country a great favor if you, uh, number one, don't try to pick up any of this and let NASA know where the pieces are. Uh, there's a great urge to keep souvenirs, but please do not do that. Please make sure NASA uh, is aware of where the pieces are. And number two, if you were at a vantage point where you have home video of this and recorded from where you live what it looked like, they would very much like to see, because no two views of this are different. That's true. Every angle is different. Uh, how uh, we saw such a long delay after Challenger before you were allowed to take off. Yeah. Is there any knowing uh, as we sit and have this conversation late in the afternoon on the day of this incident, if it's going to be that long a shutdown this time or if external forces like knowing we have astronauts at the International Space Station will will force their hand? Well, my guess is uh, um, 
that we won't have that, certainly that long a downtime. That's a pure guess. But uh, after the Challenger accident, NASA really felt it was necessary to restudy all of their internal organization, the safety process, as well as the hardware. And uh, that was very fruitful. I think that NASA became a stronger organization as a result of that study. And I doubt that they've lost the organizational uh, improvements that they have there.